Chapter One of Shakespeare Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Shakespeare Life and Work by F. J. Furnival and John Munro. Chapter One Shakespeare's Parents, Boyhood, Education marriage and departure from stratford near the centre the heart of england in one of those midland shires that gave britain its standard speech was the most famous user of that speech william shakespeare the world's greatest poet born warwickshire was his county stratford upon avon his birth town warwickshire famed for its legends of sir guy and rembrandt its castles warwick and kenilworth its ancient coventry of guilds and mystery plays its battlefield of edge hill its king-maker warwick its rolling hills and vales stratford upon avon famous alone as having given birth to shakespeare the town lies on the river avon there navigable and just as the stream reaches the bridge it broadens to full treble its wonted width as if to mirror duly the elm-ringed church on its bank and show in its full beauty the swans sailing on its surface round the town are more or less distant hills and the view of it from the nearest the welcome hills whose enclosure shakespeare said he was not able to bear shows the town nestling in the broad valley a quiet cosy place now numbering some four thousand inhabitants it and henley not far off to the northward are described in a harleian manuscript of fifteen ninety nine as good market towns the house that shakespeare was born in is not certainly known in fifteen fifty two his father lived in henley street and was presented or reported with humphrey reynolds and adrian quinney for making a dunghill in the street in 1575 11 years after his son William's birth he bought the property afterwards two houses with gardens and orchards the left-hand house of which Tradition assigns as the poet's birthplace in the first floor room above the porch and below the gable and Which having been restored now looks outside as if it had been built a week ago though the inside has been left in its old state before its restoration the left-hand house was used as a butcher's shop and the right-hand one then with brick front as the swan and maidenhead inn the right-hand house is now a shakespeare museum of relics views books etc the interior of the left-hand one has been left untouched and the dingy whitewash of the bare supposed birthroom is scribbled all over with names of men known and unknown among the former being byron walter scott and alfred tennyson shakespeare's father john shakespeare not he of clifford or the farmer of ington meadow in hampton lucy was probably the son of richard shakespeare farmer of snitterfield where john was born three miles from stratford a tenant of robert arden whose daughter john shakespeare married in 1552 we find John Shakespeare in Henley Street helping to make a dunghill as noticed above and on June 17th 1556 Thomas Sitch brings an action against him John Shakespeare Glover for eight pounds Besides gloving he took up corn dealing or farming and traded in all kinds of agricultural productions and in 1556 he brought an action against Henry Field for eighteen quarters of barley which field unjustly detained on october the second fifteen fifty six he bought a copyhold house garden and croft in greenhill street and a copyhold house and garden in henley street in fifteen fifty seven on april the tenth he was marked but not sworn as one of the jury of the court leet to inquire into and reform local abuses in 1557 he was made an ale taster sworn to look at the assize and goodness of bread ale and beer and was fined eightpence for being away from three courts soon after michaelmas he became a burgess of stratford and about the end of 1557 must have married mary arden youngest daughter of the late robert arden 
husbandman and landowner under whose will she took a small property of about fifty-four acres and a house called ashby's at wilmercott six pounds thirteen shillings and fourpence and an interest in two tenements at snitterfield and other land at wilmercott one notice only of old john shakespeare's appearance has come down to us and that by the happiest chance dr andrew clark in october nineteen o four discovered a valuable reference to him and his son william in the plume manuscript at Maldon, Essex, the contents of which were written at intervals between 1657 and 1663. The manuscript reads, he, Shakespeare, was a glover's son. Sir John Menz saw once his old father in his shop, a merry-cheeked old man, that said. Will was a good, honest fellow, but he durst have cracked a jest with him at any time. This is the only record we have of John Shakespeare's opinion of his gifted son and though plume mistakenly set down sir john menz as having seen john shakespeare instead of citing him as the teller of the details about the old man there is no reason to doubt the truth of his report sir john was only two years old when shakespeare's father died the first child joan of john and mary shakespeare was baptized on september the fifteenth fifteen fifty eight and probably died soon after on September the 30th, 1558, some six weeks before Queen Elizabeth's accession, on November the 17th, John Shakespeare was one of the jury of the court leet, and was also elected constable. On October the 6th, 1559, he was again made constable, and also a fearer, or fixer, of the fines not fixed by statute, to be levied for offences against the borough by-laws. In May 1561, he was again made a fearer, and in september one of the two chamberlains which office he held for two years on december the second fifteen sixty two his daughter margaret was baptized and on april the thirtieth fifteen sixty three she was buried these years fifteen sixty two to three were bad plague years for london stowe says that in the city and neighboring parishes twenty thousand one hundred and thirty six people died of it of 1563 he writes quote, for so much as the plague of pestilence was so hot in the city of london there was no term kept at michaelmas to be short the poor citizens of london were this year plagued with a threefold plague pestilence scarcity of money and dearth of victuals the misery whereof were too long here to write no doubt the poor remember it the rich by flight into the countries made shift for themselves an earthquake was in the month of September in diverse places of this realm, especially in Lincoln and Northamptonshire. From the first day of December till the twelfth was such continual lightning and thunder, especially the same twelve days at night, that the like had not been seen nor heard by any man then living. End quote. But in 1564 came glad tidings. Quote, An honourable and joyful peace was concluded between the queen's majesty and the french king their realms dominions and subjects which peace was proclaimed with sound of trumpet before her majesty in her castle at windleshaw also the same peace was proclaimed at london on the thirteenth day of april end quote. and on the twenty sixth at stratford wednesday april the twenty sixth the same as our may the sixth new style was baptized fifteen sixty four april twenty sixth gulielmus filius johannes shakespeare william son of john shakespeare well was it for the world that the plague on its journey northward spared one house in that pleasant midland town and called on the father not for his baby son's life but only towards the relief of the poor for twelve pence on august the thirtieth six pence on each of september sixth and twenty seventh eight pence on october the thirtieth the plague was rife in stratford quote, from june the thirtieth to december thirty first two hundred and thirty eight inhabitants a ninth of the population are carried to the grave End quote. night the day of shakespeare's birth cannot be ascertained the inscription on his monument says that he died on april the twenty third our may the third sixteen sixteen in the fifty third year of his age tradition has consequently fixed on april the twenty-third as his birthday and of course he may have been rightly said 
to be in his fifty-third year if he became fifty-two on the day he died but one may well doubt the probability of his being baptized at three days old in the absence of any tradition as to his illness then and if his death day had been the anniversary of his birthday the inscription would most probably have mentioned the coincidence we leave the brown-eyed boy for a time in his mother's arms while we follow the father's fortunes in 1564 John Shakespeare and his fellow Chamberlain John Taylor having left office gave in their account as Chamberlain's and in it are the entries item paid to Shakespeare for a peck timber three shillings and on January 26 1564 to 5 the chamber is found in a rearage and is in debt unto John Shakespeare one pound five shillings and eight pence on July the fourth fifteen sixty five John Shakespeare is chosen one of the fourteen aldermen of Stratford in fifteen sixty six on February the fifteenth eighth of Elizabeth fifteen sixty five to six the Comte of William Taylor and William Smith Chamberlains made by John Shakespeare is rendered at Michaelmas, John Shakespeare is twice surety for Richard Hathaway, and on October 13th, his second son, Gilbert, is baptized. No record of the family occurs in 1567, but at Michaelmas, 1568, John Shakespeare was made High Bailiff, or Mayor, of Stratford for a year. On April 15th, 1569, his third daughter, called Joan after the dead first, was baptized, and as both the Queen's and the Earl of Worcester's players performed in the town that year, perhaps Father John took his five-and-a-half-year-old boy, Will, to see them. On September the 5th, 1571, John Shakespeare was elected for a year chief alderman, which gave him the right to be called Mr., Master, Magister, and on September 28th his fourth daughter, Anne, who was buried on April the 4th, 1579, was baptized. Did the young Will wonder, as we did, where the babies came from, and look under the gooseberry bushes for them, or did he later on consult with his brothers and sisters how the youngest baby could most conveniently be made away with? At any rate, the question of his school naturally turns up in 1571, when he became seven because boys could not be admitted to the free Stratford Grammar School unless they were seven years old, able to read, and lived in the town. Thomas Hunt, curate of Luddington, the next village down the Avon, was then master of the grammar school, and he was succeeded by Thomas Jenkins. How a schoolboy of the time was to dress and behave is told us by Francis Seeger in his School of Virtue and Book of Good Nurture for Children, A.D. 1577, reprinted in my baby's book early english tech society eighteen sixty eight pages three hundred and thirty three to three hundred and fifty five he was to rise early put on his clothes turn up his bed go downstairs salute his parents and the family wash his hands comb his head brush his cap and put it on taking it off when he spoke to any man then he was to tie his shirt collar to his neck see that his clothes were tidy fasten his girdle round his waist rub his hose or breeches see that his shoes were clean wipe his nose on a napkin pare his nails if need were clean his ears wash his teeth and get his clothes mended if torn then take his satchel books pen paper and ink and off to school on the way there he was to take off his cap and salute the folk he met giving them the inside of the road and he was to call his schoolfellows at school he was to salute his master and schoolmates go straight to his place undo his satchel take out his books and learn as hard as he could after school he was to walk orderly home quote, not running on heaps as a swarm of bees as at this day every man it now sees not using but refusing such foolish toys as commonly are used in these days and boys as hooping and hallowing as in hunting the fox that men it hearing deride them with mocks End quote. the model boy which i heartily hope will shakespeare wasn't was on the contrary not to talk or chatter as he walked home or to gape or gaze at every new fangle but to go soberly be free of cap and full of courtesy 
and when he reached home he was to bid his fellows farewell and salute his parents with all reverence then he was to wait on his parents at dinner first say grace then make a low curtsy and say much good may it do to you if he was big enough he was then to bring the food to the table taking care not to fill the dishes too full so as to spill them on his parents clothes or the tablecloth he was to have spare trenchers and napkins ready in case any guests came in to see that there was plenty of bread and drink often empty the voiders into which bones were thrown and be always ready in case anything was wanted then he was to clear away first cover the salt cellar then set a voider dirty plate basket on the table and put into it all the dirty trenchers and napkins as forks were not yet in use and folk ate with their fingers the napkins would be made very dirty then sweep the crumbs into another voider and lay a clean trencher before every one then set on cheese fruit biscuits or caraways with wine if there was any or else ale or beer when all had finished he was to turn in each side of the tablecloth and fold it up beginning at the top that done spread a clean towel on the table or if there was not a towel use the tablecloth bring the basin and ewer and when people were ready to wash their greasy hands pour water on them but not too much then clear void the table that all might rise and lastly make a low curtsy to them the hungry boy is at last free to eat his own dinner but no he must pause a space for that is a sign of nurture and grace then he is to take salt with his knife to cut his bread not break it not to fill his spoon too full of pottage or soup for fear of spilling it on the cloth and not to sup his pottage or speak to any his head in the cup his knife is to be sharp to cut his meat neatly and his mouth not to be too full when he eats quote, not smacking the lips as commonly do hogs nor gnawing the bones as it were dogs such rudeness abhor such beastliness fly at the table behave thyself mannerly he is to keep his fingers clean by wiping them on a napkin and before he drinks out of the common cup he is to wipe his mouth so that like chaucer's prioress he may leave no grease on the edge at the table his tongue is not to walk he is not to talk or stuff temper thy tongue and belly alway for measure is treasure the proverb doth say he is not to pick his teeth at the table or spit too much this rudeness of youth is to be abhorred he is only to laugh moderately and is to learn as much good manners as he can for quote, aristotle the philosopher this worthy sayings writ that manners in a child are more requisite than playing on instruments and other vain pleasure for virtuous manners is a most precious treasure End quote. so our chestnut-haired fair brown-eyed rosy-cheeked boy went to school and waited on his father and mother and their guests was he like seeger's model lad or jakes's quote, whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face creeping like a snail unwillingly to school End quote. as you like it act two verse seven did he never unlike quote, the blessed son of heaven prove a mica and eat blackberries a question to be asked End quote. first henry the fourth act two verse four did he not play nine men's morris midsummer night's dream act two and more sacks to the mill hide and seek love labours lost act four and other games like hockey football etc that strut names and that we played at school too undoubtedly he did and birds nested too i dare say and joined in may day christmas and new year's games helped make hay went to harvest homes and sheep shearings winter's tale act four fished much ado act three ran out with the harriers venus and adonis stanzas 113 to 118 and loved a dog and horse venus and adonis stanzas 44 to 52 midsummer night's dream act four shrew richard the second act five first henry the fourth act two as dearly as ever boy in england did it is good to think of the bright young soul's boy life but in one of those dramatic bits 
that he occasionally gives us in his plays he tells us that in his boy days he did not hear of goitrous throats and travellers lies Quote, gonzalo when we were boys who would believe that there were mountaineers dewlapped like bulls whose throats had hanging at them wallets of flesh or that there were such men whose heads stood in their breasts which now we find each putter out of five for one will bring us good warrant of End quote. tempest act three what did shakespeare learn at school latin of course and notwithstanding bragging ben jonson's sneer of shakespeare's owning little latin and less greek it is clear that he must have been well grounded in latin at least see capel on dr farmer's essay on the learning of shakespeare seventeen sixty seven on this subject dr lupton the editor of collet the best authority i know says quote, i think you would be safe in concluding that such a school as stratford about fifteen seventy there would be taught one an a b c book for which a pupil teacher or a b c darius is sometimes mentioned as having a salary two a catechism in english and latin probably knolls three the authorized latin grammar i e lilies put out with a proclamation adapted to each king's reign i have editions fifteen twenty nine fifteen thirty two sixteen fifty five etc four some easy latin construing book such as Erasmus's Colloquies, Corderius's Colloquies, or Baptista Mantunanus, and the familiar Cato, or Distica de Moribus, which is often prescribed in statutes. A copy I have is dated 1558. From these easier Latin books, the students proceeded to construe such authors as Seneca, Terence, Plautus, Cicero, Ovid, and Virgil. The Greek grammar, if any, in use at Stratford, would most likely be clenards, i.e., institutiones absolutissime in Graecam linguam, Nicolao Clenardo actore. My copy is dated 1543. Instruction in Greek was more rare, but the quickest scholars were often given lessons in it. The treatment of boys at school was sharp and shakespeare no doubt got wax on the hands and back with a cane to say nothing of being birched over a desk or hoisted on another boy's back for making mistakes like the rest of us in later time english we may be pretty sure he was not taught it is now only just making good headway in schools and with the foundation of the english association ought to be more and more efficiently taught of some of the university subjects the trivials grammar logic rhetoric and the quadrials i mean arithmetic music geometry and astronomy harrison 1577 to 1587 book 2 page 78 of my edition i suppose some smattering was given in the grammar school but i know no authority on the point on september the 3rd 1572 john shakespeare ceased to be chief alderman of stratford in 1573 he was made overseer to the will of alexander webb the husband of his sister-in-law agnes and on march the eleventh fifteen seventy four his third son richard died february the fourth sixteen twelve or thirteen was baptized in this year too the earl of leicester's players played at stratford in 1574 the Earl of Warwick's and the Earl of Worcester's players both acted at Stratford in 1575 as record of the fine levied on the purchase shows John Shakespeare bought the traditional birthplace of the poet both houses with its garden and orchard for 40 pounds and in the July of that year he may have taken his boy will to see some of the festivities that went on at the fine redstone Kenilworth Castle 12 miles off at the entertainment leicester gave queen elizabeth from saturday july the ninth to wednesday july the twenty seventh shakespeare's lines in midsummer night's dream at two describe a somewhat like scene to that of triton on a swimming mermaid and arion on a dolphin's back at kenilworth on monday july the eighteenth and the rough coventry men's play of the repulse of a danish invasion partly by english women acted partly on sunday july the seventeenth 
and fully on tuesday july the nineteenth may have been the poet's first hint of historical plays this play had been acted yearly at coventry but was now of late laid down they knew no cause why unless it were by the zeal of certain their preachers men very commendable for their behaviour and learning sweet in their sermons but somewhat too sour in preaching away their pastime in fifteen seventy six john shakespeare pays twelve pence towards the salary of the town beadle in fifteen seventy seven troubles appear to begin to come to him he does not attend regularly the meetings of the corporation and instead of paying like other aldermen six shillings and eightpence towards the furniture of the pikemen i e billmen and one archer he is let off with three shillings and fourpence on october the fifteenth fifteen seventy nine he and his wife sell their interest in her property at snitterfield to robert webb in consequence apparently of pecuniary embarrassment and on november the fourteenth fifteen seventy eight they mortgage her ashby's property at wilmacott to edmund lambert for forty pounds a mortgage which they never redeem in the list of debts annexed to the will of roger sadler a baker at stratford dated also november the fourteenth fifteen seventy eight is item of edmund lambert and cornish for the debt of mr john shakespeare on november the nineteenth when every alderman is ordered to pay fourpence a week for the relief of the poor john shakespeare is let off he shall not be taxed to pay anything all this seems to show the respect in which he was held in fifteen seventy nine however john shakespeare is returned as a defaulter for not paying his years three shillings and fourpence for pike and billman see above on april the fourth his daughter anne born september the twenty eighth fifteen seventy one is buried and he pays for the bell and pall of mr shakespeare's daughter seemingly fourpence for the bell and fourpence for the pall the same year the players of both lord strange and the countess of essex play in the guild hall at stratford as do lord derby's players in fifteen eighty on may the third fifteen eighty edmund son to mr john shakespeare is baptized and john shakespeare of stratford upon avon in the hundred of barlick way is entered in a book of the names of dwelling places of the gentlemen and freeholders of the county of warwick fifteen eighty john shakespeare's financial troubles seem to go from bad to worse he becomes heavily involved to his brother-in-law lambert who is apparently not disposed towards leniency and a writ is issued against john shakespeare but he has nothing with which to meet his liabilities in september fifteen eighty six his alderman's status is taken from him in consequence of his long neglect of municipal affairs it is probable that shakespeare left school at the age from fourteen to sixteen of what he did when he left there is no evidence a mr buston's report given by aubrey is that shakespeare understood latin pretty well for he had been in his younger years a schoolmaster in the country possibly the a b c darius or pupil teacher that mr lupton speaks of above a mr dowdall writes in sixteen ninety three that the old clerk of stratford church then above eighty says that this shakespeare was formerly in this town bound apprentice to a butcher but that he run from his master to london it has been supposed that shakespeare was then apprenticed to his father but we should beware of traditions and inferences if we are to give credence to the voluminous literature which has dealt with his intellectual attainments he must have followed almost every trade and profession that absorbed the activities of humankind and all of these almost simultaneously there was apparently no branch of study in which he had not indulged and his miscellaneous information was sufficient to provide material for an encyclopedia with a remarkable prescience he anticipated the future discoveries of science for new modern evolutionary theories and was thoroughly acquainted with the mysteries of astrology every tradition concerning him has been amplified and illustrated our very ignorance as to his doings and fortunes has provided an excellent field for ingenious speculations another tradition says that he was an attorney's clerk and that he was so at one time of his life i as a lawyer have no doubt 
of the details of no profession does he show such an intimate acquaintance as he does of law the other books in imitation of lord campbell's prove it to any one who knows enough law to be able to judge they are just jokes and shakespeare's knowledge of insanity was not got in a doctor's shop though his law was i believe in a lawyer's office shakespeare and his life as a stratford lad must be left to the fancy of every reader my own notion of him is hinted at above taking the boy to be the father of the man i see a square-built yet lithe and active fellow with ruddy cheeks hazel eyes a high forehead and auburn hair as full of life as an egg is full of meat impulsive inquiring sympathetic up to any fun and daring into scrapes and out of them with a laugh making love to all the girls a favorite wherever he goes even with the prigs and fools he mocks untroubled as yet with hamlet doubts but in many a quiet time communing with the beauty of earth and sky around him with the thoughts of men of old in books throwing himself with all his heart into all he does at this time we may infer too with some certainty that he noted the many rural scenes around him took stock of the wild flowers and the birds and learnt much of the lore of dogs and horses which he displays in his works his frequent references to sports hawking coursing and hunting making us believe that he must have seen all of these frequently and probably have indulged in them personally his frequent references to boyish games seem to show that his childhood was a happy one to the stratford of his boyhood likewise we may safely suppose the suggestions to have come from the rural clowns such as bottom and his mates which he afterwards put on the stage with their village green performances of course every impulsive young fellow falls in love and of course the girl he does it with is older than himself who is there of us that has not gone through the process probably many times young stupids we were no doubt so was shakespeare but unluckily he went further and one day near michaelmas 1582 he of eighteen and a half and his anne hathaway of twenty-six read no more their marriage became necessary the bond of the bishop's officials to enable the marriage to take place after once asking of the bands was dated november twenty eighth fifteen eighty two and their baby susanna was baptized on may the twenty sixth fifteen eighty three such things were common enough then as they have been since especially in country life and i don't think this one is helped by supposing a public betrothment of william and anne beforehand in the presence of friends i doubt john shakespeare or any other father being likely to consent formally to the pledging of his boy of eighteen and a half when both he and his boy were poor to a woman of twenty-six who was poor too unless the case was one of necessity a father would be much more likely to tell his boy not to make a young fool of himself in that way anne hathaway was one of the daughters of richard hathaway husbandman of shottery a little village within a mile of stratford where his thatched cottage tenanted in eighteen eighty one in part by one of his supposed descendants mrs baker is still to be seen a pleasant body mrs baker was and pleasant is the walk across the fields to her cottage richard hathaway in his will left six pounds thirteen shillings and fourpence to his daughter agnes there can be little doubt that this agnes was shakespeare's anne the two forms being then only different versions of the same name exactly when or where this marriage was solemnized we do not know there is no entry in the stratford registers to guide us says munro and there is no actual corroboration of the tradition that the ceremony was performed at Laddington nearby. One important item of evidence, however, on the marriage has been discovered in the register of the diocesan bishop of Worcester, where Fulke Sandals and John Richardson, farmers of Stratford, bound themselves November twenty eighth, fifteen eighty two, in a surety of forty pounds, to free the bishop from all responsibility, should there be any lawful impediment afterwards discovered which would have destroyed the legality of the marriage shortly to be performed between william shakespeare and anne hathaway such a bond not only in the ordinary sense exculpated the officiating minister in the event of the marriage being subsequently found to be illegal but expedited its solemnization as only once calling of the bands was rendered necessary 
this was not however the only irregular feature in the marriage such bonds as this invariably stipulated that no ceremony should take place without the consent of the parents on both sides and certainly a minor like shakespeare could not have been married without his parents consent no mention of the father john shakespeare or of the mother mary was made however and the minister who conducted the marriage must have been induced by some means or other to have conveniently overlooked this circumstance the fact that the two sureties were both from shottery the bride's home that shakespeare's father was not a party to the wedding and that shakespeare's first child susanna was born about six months after his marriage shows what was probably the true state of things the shakespeare family may not have known of the affair till after its conclusion under these circumstances we may think it improbable that the marriage would be solemnized at stratford and see therefore why the town registers contain no entry of it Quote, on the day previous to the date of this bond moreover november twenty seventh fifteen eighty two a license was granted according to an entry in the worcester register of bishop whitgift for the marriage of william shakespeare and anne waitley of temple grafton the discovery of this record has led to a number of ingenious speculations among shakespeare critics from the suggestion that anne hathaway was a widow most certainly wrong to another that the poet was implicated in two separate affairs that two different women claimed him and one got him the most acceptable is that of mr joseph hill in historic warwickshire j tom burgess 102 cited by j w gray that waitley is a misreading of hathaway or hathway the m at the end of the latinized anam being mistaken for a w mr gray who can speak on these matters with authority points out that the register entry was possibly made from the allegation to which the applicant was sworn and in which full particulars of those concerned were rendered in this case the difference of one day in the date is no serious inconvenience and was in fact not an uncommon occurrence the name waitley was quite familiar to those who made the entries as it occurs often about the time of the shakespeare entry and mistakes similar to this of waitley for hathway are cited by mr gray i should add that mr gray dissents from the usual interpretation placed on the marriage bond etc in any case he says the view that something discreditable to shakespeare or his wife is implied by the application for the license is not sustained by the documentary evidence or by a consideration of the known facts relating to their marriage he suggests a number of reasons why secrecy might have been used and denies that the marriage took place without john shakespeare's knowledge and consent End quote. What Shakespeare had to keep himself his wife and baby on is not recorded But he probably lived at Stratford for there his twins Hamnet and Judith probably named after Hamnet Sadler Possibly a baker and Judith his wife were baptized on February the 2nd 1585 Here then is our young poet not 21 yet with three children and a wife eight years older than himself pretty well weighted for his run through life was his early married life a happy one i doubt it look at the probabilities of the case and at the way in which shakespeare dwells on at the evils of a woman wedding one younger than herself in twelfth night act two of the disdain and discord which grow through mistakes like his own in the tempest act four and of a wife's jealousy in his second some folks say his first play the comedy of errors act five and on the doctrine that men are masters to their females and their lords i suspect that the abbess and luciana in the latter play represent their creator's then opinion on these points while adriana speaks his wife's if so this would be one cause to lead shakespeare to seek his fortunes elsewhere the need of winning money and fame would be another and tradition gives us a third that shakespeare joined some wild young fellows in breaking into sir thomas lucy's park at charlcote about three miles from stratford and stealing his deer for which and for writing an impossibly bad ballad against sir thomas the latter so persecuted the poet that he had to leave stratford the lawfulness of poaching was even in my young days strongly impressed on the country mind 
and no doubt Stratford folk held Andrew Board's opinion of venison. Quote, I am sure it is a lord's dish, and I am sure it is good for an Englishman, for it doth animate him to be as he is, which is strong and hardy. End quote. And one would expect Shakespeare to have a hand in any fun that was going on. But all is uncertain. The objection that Charlecote was not a park till Charles the Second's reign is of little avail, because Rathgeb notes that deer were kept here in woods as well as parks. My Harrison, page eighty two, and that the Lucys had deer is pretty clear, because Sir Thomas's son sent Lord Ellesmere a buck in sixteen o two. Anyway, it is generally supposed, though without any sure ground, that Shakespeare left Stratford in or about 1586, as we have no tidings of Chaucer for seven years from his ransom for sixteen pounds from France in the spring of 1360 to 1367, so we have no tidings of Shakespeare from the baptism of his twins in February 1585 till 1592, when he is successful enough as actor and author in London, to be sneered at in Green's posthumous Groatsworth of Wit. I say no tidings, though we have, in a record of his father's action in the Queen's bench for thirty pounds against John Lambert, the son of the mortgagee of the Ashby's property. John Shakespeare's statement in 1589, first, that John Lambert agreed on September the 26th, 1587, to pay him twenty pounds if he john shakespeare his wife and son william would confirm the ashby's property to lambert second that he john shakespeare and his wife and son william had always been ready so to confirm the property but that john lambert had never paid the twenty pounds halliwell's illustration part one we must now hark back a bit by 1586 John Shakespeare's money troubles had increased on June the 19th the return made to a writ to distrain goods on his land was That he had nothing which could be distrained So a writ to take his person was issued on February the 16th and again on March the 2nd He was also deprived of his aldermanship on September the 6th Because mr. Wheeler and mr. Shakespeare doth not come to the halls when they be warned nor hath not done of long time on march the twenty ninth fifteen eighty seven john shakespeare produced a writ of habeas corpus in the stratford court of record which shows that he had been in custody or prison probably for debt and as he would urge put there illegally his father being thus in fresh difficulties and shakespeare himself probably not prosperous the queen's players not known to be the company with which shakespeare is always connected came for the first time to Stratford in 1587, and this was probably the turning point in Shakespeare's life. At any rate, sooner or later, he left his birth town for London, and took the way to fame and fortune. Two roads lay before him for his journey, one over Edge Hill through Drayton, Banbury, Buckingham, Aylesbury, Amersham, Uxbridge, the road engraved by Ogilby in 1675, the other by Shipston, Long Compton, Woodstock, Oxford, High Wycombe, Beaconsfield, and Uxbridge. Perchance Shakespeare took the latter, over Lees and Ulite at first, to see the town that Henser describes in 1598 as, quote, Oxford, the famed Athens of England, that glorious seminary of learning and wisdom, whence religion, politeness, and letters are abundantly dispersed into all parts of the kingdom. End quote the sight of which must have filled the young poet's heart with delight. No doubt he wished that he could then, in 1587, have been taking his master's degree there, as his only rival, then unknown to him, Christopher Marlowe, the Canterbury shoemaker's son, was taking his master's at Cambridge. Over the Chiltern Hills, the Wickham Chalk, whose fair downs and woods elsewhere bound Thames Stream, from Hedsett to past Pangbourne, he'd descend to London Clay, and from Uxbridge pass through my old school village Hanwell to Ealing Shepherd's Bush and so to London through Newgate Leaving on his left st. John's Wood where in Crowley's day 1542 and long after were foxes for my Lord Mayor to hunt on his road up William Shakespeare would take his ease in his inn whether he walked or rode for says Harrison quote, 
those towns that we call thoroughfares have great and sumptuous inns builded in them for the receiving of such travellers and strangers as pass to and fro the manner of harbouring wherein is not like to that of some other countries in which the host or good man of the house does challenge a lordly authority over his guests but clean otherwise sith every man may use his inn as his own house in england and have for his money how great or little variety of victuals and what other service himself shall think expedient to call for our inns are also very well furnished with napery bedding and tapestry especially with napery for beside the linen used at the tables which is commonly washed daily is such and so much as belongeth unto the estate and calling of the guest each comer is sure to lie in clean sheets wherein no man hath been lodged since they came from the laundress or out of the water wherein they were last washed if the traveller have a horse his bed doth cost him nothing and if he go on foot he is sure to pay a penny for the same but whether he be horseman or footman if his chamber be once appointed he may carry the key with him as of his own house so long as he lodgeth there shakespeare would also go armed for he would be liable to meet suspicious looking fellows with as harrison says page two hundred and eighty three of my edition the excessive staves which divers that travel by the way do carry upon their shoulders whereof some are twelve or thirteen foot long beside the pike of twelve inches but as they are commonly suspected of honest men to be thieves and robbers or at the leastwise scarce true men which bear them so by reason of this and the like suspicious weapons the honest traveller is now enforced to ride with a case of dags pistols at his saddle bow or with some pretty short snapper whereby he may deal with them further off in his own defence before he come within the danger of these weapons finally no man travelleth by the way without his sword or some such weapon with us except the minister who commonly weareth none at all unless it be a dagger or hanger at his side seldom also are they or any other wayfaring men robbed without the consent of the chamberlain tapster or ostler where they bait or lie who feeling at their alighting whether their capkisses or budgets be of any weight or not by taking them down from their saddles or otherwise see their store in drawing of their purses do by and by give intimation to some one or other attended daily in the yard or house or dwelling hard by upon such matches whether the prey be worth the following or no End quote. probably shakespeare on his first journey would not be worth robbing his road would no doubt be a fair one to travel on except perhaps on the oxford and london clays his garmables of the merry wives count mumplegart drove from london to oxford forty-seven miles in august fifteen ninety two in a day and a half which means good roads for the lumbering coaches and post horses of the day or even for riding when out on a tour his secretary thus describes the country quote, between london and oxford the country is in some places very fertile in others very boggy and mossy and such immense numbers of sheep are bred on it round about that it is astonishing there is besides a superabundance of fine oxen and other good cattle End quote. rye england as seen by foreigners in the days of elizabeth and james i page thirty for his arrival in london and the rest of his outward life see chapters ten and eleven End of chapter one Chapter Two of Shakespeare, Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Shakespeare, Life and Work by F. J. Furnival and John Monroe. Chapter Two: Shakespeare's London. And what was the London into whose gates Shakespeare entered? not a vast ever-expanding smoke-begrimed city like our own with its roar and bustle and its intricate network of subterranean and invisible communications nor yet that wilderness of houses which called forth the wonder of heine 
but a free, open city in the green fields, pleasant with its flower-gardens and its tree-shaded walks, situated for the most part on the left bank of a clear crystal river, spanned by the noble bridge which was reckoned one of the wonders of the world, and gay with the constant passage of a hundred boats. Silver streaming Thames, as Spencer called it, then the great highway of London, was not yet dark with pollution. Salmon could still live in it where it flowed past the Temple or Blackfriars. Hampstead and Islington were distant villages on the hills, Hampstead noted for its mills, and Islington for its dairy and its duck hunting. In the fields, at Finsbury and Smithfield, the city archers went to practice. Flowers bloomed in profusion in Eli Palace, which opened out to the fields. London was still recognizably a medieval city, enclosed in many gated walls, with every evidence within it of its long historic past, not yet too large to be loved, as an old writer has said. A fair city, proud of its great halls and mansions, rejoicing in ever-recurring civic displays and costly pageants, lovely London, as Peel called it, the flower of cities all, in the words of Dunbar. London was a walled city from early times, from the later Roman period. In Elizabethan days the old wall along the river had long since disappeared, but the northern wall with its gates was still intact. At Ludgate, the nearest entrance to the river, was the jail, where the poor prisoners begged alms through the grating with melancholy cries. Here, too, on that fatal Sunday in February, 1601, Rash, unruly Essex burst into London with his handful of malcontent followers to raise the city. Here, too, his small forces were scattered and his rebellion quelled. From Ludgate the wall went northward to Newgate, for centuries the main western entrance to the city. Long used as a prison, and once rebuilt by Mayor Richard Whittington, where again the ears of passerbys were assailed by the plaintive wails of the miserable prisoners begging for bread and meat. Northward the wall went to Aldersgate, through Christ's Hospital precincts, and St. Martin's Le Grand, where the foreign craftsmen dwelt, and where the old church of St. Martin's had tolled the curfew till the bells of Bow took up the refrain in their place. From Aldersgate the wall proceeded to Cripplegate, with an outpost in the watchtower or Barbican. From here the next gate was at Moorgate, made by the mayor Thomas Falconer in 1415, for the use of hay and wood carts visiting the London markets. Without the wall was Moorfields, in early days a morass, in later times the favorite walk of the citizens. Bishopsgate came next, called after Erkenwald, the Saxon bishop of London, long in the charge of the Hans merchants, who were freed from paying the tolls by reason of their responsibility for repairing and keeping the gate. The last gate, proper, was Aldgate, where gentle, jovial Chaucer lived and wrote, and thence the wall turned towards the tower not then the mere relic of a bygone age, but still the strong citadel and state prison of the city. A great number of churches, most of them with spires, stood in the old streets and were burnt down in the great fire. The highways of the city were generally narrow, fires being a constant danger and infectious diseases spreading with terrible rapidity. The curfew bell of Bow was echoed throughout the city and suburbs by St. Bride's, St. Giles, and Cripplegate chimes. The city gates were then clapped to, and the night watch patrolled the streets with their formidable bills. The picture given by Shakespeare of Dogbury and his mates seems to have been only too correct. The watch were often scoundrels and cowards, open to bribery, liars, thieves, and useless in emergencies. Burley, writing to Walsingham, described a knot of twelve watchmen with their long staves under a penthouse at Enfield, who— on his inquiring for what they waited, replied that they were watching for three young men concerned in Babington's conspiracy against the Queen, with no other indication to guide them than that one of the three had a hooked nose. Many of the city streets, very narrow and always poorly lighted, were dangerous at night. Night walkers were apprehended by the watch, brawls were frequent, and the dawn of day sometimes disclosed the body of a man lying across the pathway with a sword wound in his breast. In the lonely by-lanes of London, the courtesy man lingered at night to waylay the solitary pedestrian and win money from him by means of humble and courteous address and a variety of lies. Gallants, emerging from the taverns, hired a link-boy or a tavern-drawer to light them home, and many were the devices they employed to escape from the ignorant watch. "'If,' says Decker, "'you smell a watch, 
and that you may easily do, for commonly they eat onions to keep them in sleeping, which they account a medicine against cold. Or, if you come within danger of their brown bills, let him that is your candlestick, let ignis fatuus, I say, begin within the reach of the constable's staff, ask aloud, Sir Giles or Sir Abram, will you turn this way or down that street? It skills not, though there be none dubbed in your bunch. The watch will wink at you only for the love they bear to arms and knighthood. All the way you pass, especially being approached near some of the gates, talk of none but lords, and such ladies with whom you have played at Primero, or danced in the presence the very same day. It is a chance to lock up the lips of an inquisitive bellman. The life of the citizens was, to a large extent, an open-air one. The shops were generally penthouse sheds over which swung ponderous signs, and before which sharp and often rascally apprentices cried aloud, "'What do you lack, gentles, what do you lack?' itinerant hawkers passed through every street with a medley of different wares colliers tinkers lace buyers apple sellers mat makers fish vendors and milkmen all crying aloud their articles for sale the broom man proclaims his goods in a set song not unpleasing to hear a somewhat unruly crowd of prentices gather round a ballad seller who sings his ballads free will you hear a spanish lady how she wooed an englishman garments gay and rich as may be decked with jewels she had on of a comely countenance and grace was she and by birth and parentage of high degree all sorts of men and women jostle in the streets we see a grey and aged antiquary hobbling off to buy an old manuscript of lydgate an awkward-bodied country knight swaggering proudly along resplendent with a superabundance of gold lace two disdainful gallants with their murray french hats their embossed girdles and their laced satin doublets talking aloud of fair ladies and rich wines ever drawing their new watches from their pockets to proclaim their wealth therein conspicuous in their great starched ruffs and jingling their spurs as they proceed towards the playhouse or the ordinary a poor rough ragged pot poet with his small eyes staring out of his fire-red cherubinous face like chaucer's somnor whose verses are as patched as his doublet and hose whose muse runs like the tap, and ebbs and flows at the mercy of the spigot, and who draws his inspiration from the back-street tavern where he is ever in debt. The fair, buxom hostess of a certain inn, with a merry eye and a red lip, and a witty jest for the occasion, the lodestone of the iron knights, gallants, and roarers, and what if she is kissed by the riotous rascals who haunt her house in the evening? A poor shrivelled attorney, muttering broken Latin, never being sure of the endings, with a roll of parchments under his arm of the same colour as his complexion, emerging from the dusty dungeon in which he conducts his affairs, into the open highway where the light makes his old eyes blink. A red-faced rogue, with his arm bound up to pass for a wounded soldier, in an old torn jacket of blue with a red cross, in loose breeches, a dirty scotch cap on his head decked with a ragged feather, and a pair of mouldy shoes on his feet destined after a career of thieving and roguery to end his days at tyburn fair citizens wives like mistresses ford and page dimple-cheeked and merry children staring open-mouthed at the strange characters who pass them sober-faced parsons in russet and black sir john and sir robert loved of their parishioners poor needy tutors little honoured and little requited for their learning a coarse, brutal sergeant disguised as a butcher. An endless procession of men and women in a wonderful variety of different dresses of different colours, cuts, and materials. A motley throng in every sense passing hither and thither in those old narrow streets under the gabled houses hung with many signs. The prentices, in spite of the rigorous law, were a rebellious and turbulent mob, and fights in the street were frequent and dangerous and often the sheriff's men were called out to make peace between the blue-coated serving-men with their silver badges and the rough prentices engaged in a pitched battle fraudulent tradesmen slanderers quacks and cheats were put in the public stocks thieves had their ears nailed to the pillory and were given a knife to cut themselves free vagabonds were dragged across the thames at a boat's end strumpets were whipped at a cart's tail through the streets the heads of traitors were fixed on the spikes of Bridgegate on the southwark side of London Bridge. The fashionable gallant, in his silks and velvets, mounted his hobby and rode through the city, his Irish footboy running by him and his French page following behind. Ponderous Dutch coaches rolled through the narrow streets with footboys running at their sides. 
Sometimes one or more of the twelve great companies made a pompous procession through the highways to and from their halls. The fellowship of the fishmongers in all their livery attended the obit of John Mongham every year at the church of St. Marriott Hill, whereto went also at other times my lord mayor with his mace-bearer and sheriffs. The London archers in their rich dresses took part in the great pageants. Elizabeth herself often passed through the city, and sometimes her pomp was curious. A thousand men in harness, with shirts of mail and corselets and morris pikes, and ten great pieces carried throughout the city, with drums and trumpets sounding, and two morris dancings, and in a cart two white bears. The magnificent watch-night pageant, with its horses, its glitter, its torches, and its revelry, is described in two manuscripts, containing the official regulations. To see this splendid spectacle all the people of London must have issued from their doors. Sometimes there was a great procession on the river, the companies in all their livery, with their bright banners, in their decked and gilded barges, or the mayor himself in all his civic glory, speaking of opulence and peace, in his official barge, streamers flying, trumpets sounding, noises of shouting and cheering. Or Cynthia, that crown of lilies, like queenly Cleopatra on the Sidness, the virgin queen herself, in the barge of state, riding over the clear water past the flower-hemmed gardens of her nobles' houses, standing back from the river's edge. On its eminence in the city stood St. Paul's, the centre of London life. Its great isle was the promenade of the city, the meeting-place of friends, the centre of fashion, the resort of poets, players, gallants, cheats, pickpockets, lawyers, and out-of-place serving-men. Francis Osborne, in the traditional memoirs on the reign of King James, says of it about 1610, it was the fashion of those times, and did so continue till these, wherein not only the mother but her daughters are ruined, for the principal gentry, lords, courtiers, and men of all professions, not merely mechanic, to meet in St. Paul's Church by eleven, and walk in the middle aisle till twelve, and after dinner from three to six, during which time some discoursed of business, others of news. Now, in regard of the universal commerce, there happened little that did not first or last arrive there and I, being young and wanting a more advantageous employment, did, during my abode in London, which was three-fourth parts of the year, associate myself at those hours with the choicest company I could pick out. John Earle says, Paul's Walk is the land's epitome, or you may call it the lesser isle of Great Britain. It is a heap of stones and men, with a vast confusion of languages, and were the steeple not sanctified, nothing like our Babel. The noise in it is like that of bees, a strange humming or buzzy, mixed of walking, tongues, and feet. It is a kind of still roar or loud whisper. It is the great exchange of all discourse, and no business whatsoever but is here stirring and afoot. It is the synod of all pates politic, jointed and laid together in most serious posture, and they are not half so busy at the Parliament. It is the general mint of all famous lies. All inventions are emptied here, and not a few pockets. The best sign of a temple in it is that it is the thieves' sanctuary, which rob more safely in the crowd than a wilderness, whilst every searcher is a bush to hide them. It is the other expense of the day, after plays, tavern, and a body-house, and men have still some oaths left to swear here. The visitants are all men without exceptions, but the principal inhabitants and possessors are stale knights and captains out of service, men of long rapiers and breeches, which after all turn merchants here, and traffic for news. Some make it a preface to their dinner, and travel for a stomach, but thriftier men make it their ordinary, and board here very cheap. Decker is very satirical over the swagger and display to be seen in the middle aisle. Your Mediterranean isle, he says, is then the only gallery— wherein the pictures of all your true fashionate and complimented gulls are, and ought to be, hung up. Be circumspect and wary what pillar you come in at, and take heed in any case, as you love the reputation of your honour, that you avoid the serving-men's log, and approach not within five fathom of that pillar. The duke's tomb is a sanctuary, and will keep you alive from worms and land-rats that long to be feeding on your carcass. There you may spend your legs in winter a whole afternoon, Converse, plot, laugh, and talk anything, jest at your creditor, even to his face, and in the evening, even by lamplight, steal out, and so cousin a whole covey of abominable catchpoles. All the diseased horses in a tedious siege cannot show so many fashions as are to be seen for nothing every day in Duke Humphrey's walk. 
Duke Humphrey's Walk was so named after Duke Humphrey's tomb which stood in it, but which was really the resting place not of Humphrey, but of Sir John Beauchamp, who died in the middle of the fourteenth century. The poor gallant who walked through the church in lieu of taking dinner at an ordinary was said, ironically, to have dined with Duke Humphrey. Here, then, in the great aisle, London met. At one pillar waited the lawyers for their clients, a practice which fell into desuetude. At another stood the poor serving-men, many of whom could have been hired for a small sum to give false witness and perform ill offices. Cut-purses in various disguises moved silently through the crowd. Money-lenders there lured their victims into ruin. Gallants met their tailors there by appointment, and tailors arrived before midday to note the new fashions of the throng. Political spies hovered about to glean news and discover secrets. Card-sharpers decoyed their innocent victims to neighboring taverns and robbed them of everything. Every matter of passing interest and importance was discussed there. All news was brought there and thence disseminated to every quarter of London. Drake's departure in 1585, with his twenty-five ships for the Spanish main, his brilliant exploits at San Domingo and Carthagena, his return laden with spoil in 1586, the latest poem of Spencer's or play of Shakespeare's, the achievements of Raleigh, the expeditions of Essex, the gigantic struggles of the Netherlands, the fall of Antwerp, the progress of Elizabeth at Kenilworth, with all its days of mingled delights, these and all other tidings and matters, grave, gay, and serious, were talked of and heard of in St. Paul's Walk. In the middle of the churchyard stood the historic pulpit, St. Paul's Cross, from which were uttered so many speeches and sermons and papal bulls, expressive in their changes of the history and progress of England. In the woodwork at the top of the great steeple men carved their names. Morocco, the famous intelligent horse of Banks, who was afterwards burnt in Italy for a witch, had been up there. The number of clerics in the neighborhood of Paul's, from early times, had attracted there the shops of the principal booksellers. The taverns of those days played a great part in London life. Church business was often conducted in them, and the church there often bought drink for its servants, till the advance of the Puritan spirit condemned the tavern. It is the busy man's recreation, says Earl, the idle man's business, the melancholy man's sanctuary, the stranger's welcome, the innocent court man's entertainment, the scholar's kindness, and the citizen's courtesy. It is the study of sparkling wits, and a cup of canary their book, where we leave them. The most famous of the taverns were the Apollo and Devil's Tavern in Fleet Street, the Three Cranes in the Vintry, where the gypsies resorted, the Bear at Bridgefoot, the Mermaid in Bread Street, where Shakespeare, Johnson, Beaumont, and the Wits held merry meetings, the Mitre in Cheap, the Woolsack, and the King's Head in Fish Street. These were, for the most part, the better taverns where one could get bastard, alicant, upsy, freeze, and sack. The drawers waited on the guests with their cries of Anon, Anon, sir, like Francis in First Henry the Fourth, and good country vicars on a journey to London resorted there with their companions to drink and eat. The taverns in the byways were dangerous, and of ill repute. Desperados and suspected men haunted them. Bullies and ruffians gambled and diced there with unsuspecting dupes, resorted to a hundred intricate cheating devices, and at the last often knocked over the lights, upset the tables, and escaped with all they could seize in the confusion. Drunken revellers were stabbed and robbed. Duels, conducted in the new foreign style with rapiers, were hatched there. Intrigues between gallants and mistresses were conducted there. The taverners were sometimes in league with thieves, housed and protected them, and received stolen goods. They put lime in their sack, used short measures, sold bad ale, for which the brewers were sometimes seen at the pillory, and overcharged their customers, a process which the gallants held it bad taste to challenge. When the terrible reckoning, says Decker, like an indictment, bids you hold up your hand, and that you must answer it at the bar. You must not abate one penny in the particular. No. Though they reckon cheese to you when you have neither eaten any, nor could ever abide it, raw or toasted, but cast your eye only upon the totalis and no further, for to traverse the bill would betray you to be acquainted with the rates of the market. Men in those times dined often at the ordinaries, of which there were kinds to suit all purses. At the most expensive, knights and men of the court resorted, discussed the latest news and the newest book. At the meanest, the poorer and less affable dined, generally without intercourse. After the dinner, at the best ordinaries, came wine. After the wine, cards. 
after the cards an afternoon at the theatre or elsewhere in pleasure the diners smoked before their dinner and chatted sometimes of pipes and tobacco various parts of london were full of foreign shops the milaners of st martin's who also sold jewels periwigs fans and ruffs competed with the english sempstresses of the exchange there are italian armourers dutch shoemakers french dancing masters italian masters of fence foreign bravos it is a vain and buoyant time when there is some dash and danger in life luxury is on the increase and foreign articles of luxury are in many shops there might have been seen handsome ruffles and silken hose for our gallant silver spurs from milan for his heels jewels for his ears french gloves for his hands silken rosettes for his shoes a heavy gold chain for his neck gold spangled bands and feathers for his french hat a jewelled brooch for his silken doublet a handsome dagger and gilt rapier for his embellished girdle neapolitan perfumes for his beard and gay apparel golden watches from germany for his pocket jewelled fans and venetian mirrors for his mistress all from the lands over the sea our old friend andrew board's description of his englishman was more than ever true of elizabeth's subjects i am an englishman and naked i stand here musing in my mind what raiment i shall wear for now i will wear this and now i will wear that now i will wear i cannot tell what all new fashions be pleasant to me i will have them whether i thrive or thee now i am a frisher all men doth on me look what should i do but set cock on the hoop what do i care if all the world me fail i will get a garment shall reach to my tail then i am a minion for i wear the new guise the next year after this i trust to be wise not only in wearing my gorgeous array for i will go to learning a whole summer's day board's englishman was in truth not half so gay as elizabeth's the fashions of all the foremost countries of europe seem to have been concentrated in the latter's sumptuous person his stockings were of orange and peach-coloured silk his boots of spanish leather his cloak of some fair hued silk faced and trimmed with lace even his wristbands were of the italian cut this is what decker says of the tailors and fashions tailors then in adam's days were none of the twelve companies their hall that now is larger than some dorps among the netherlands was then no bigger than a dutch butcher's shop they durst not strike down their customers with large bills adam cared not an apple paring for all their lousy hems there was then neither the spanish slop nor the skipper's galligaskin the switzer's blistered codpiece nor the danish sleeve sagging down like a welsh wallet the italian's close strasser nor the french standing collar your treble quadruple dedalian ruffs nor your stiff-necked rabbitos that have more arches for pride to row under than can stand under five london bridges durst not then set themselves out in print for the patent for starch could by no means be signed a considerable portion of our gallant's time must have been spent with the barber who officiated in those times as master of dentistry and the surgical and tonsorial arts the barber's shop was a favourite resort and debating place where a guitar lay always ready for use an interesting variety of styles were for the customer's selection the poor man had his head trimmed round like a cheese the courtier could select from the italian style the french cut the spanish or the dutch cut the bravado fashion the mean fashion the gentleman's cut the common cut and the court and country fashions the habit of smoking tobacco was greatly on the increase denounced as it was by some in most forcible terms silver tongs and other elaborately ornate implements were treasured accessories of the fashionable smoker who often attended a professed master to acquire feats such as blowing out rings the dresses and devices of the women were as elaborate as those of the men sham hair was worn by some face powders and paints were used jacob rathgeb tells us that in england women had more liberty than in any other land that they loved fine clothes ruffs and stuffs and that some of them though they had not a crust at home would wear fine velvets in the public streets from van meteren we derive further evidence on these points and learn that the english wives loved gossip and meetings of all kinds banquets feasts christenings and so on that they were beautiful fair well dressed and modest that married women wore hats and unmarried women none les femmes estimées says perlin sont les plus belles du monde et blanches comme elles battre et ne déplaisent aux italiennes flamandes et allemandes elles sont joyeuses et courtoises et de bon recueil we have changed a little since those old days hensa remarks that the english excelled in dancing and music that they were active and lively 
and also that they were vastly fond of great noises that fill the ear, such as the firing of cannon, drums, and the ringing of bells, so that it is common for a number of them that have got a glass in their heads to go up into some belfry and ring the bells for hours together for the sake of exercise. Uh, we doubt the commonness of the last item. An artificial gallantry, tempered by a genuine love of pure and beautiful womanhood and strong and noble manhood, pervaded polite society. Wherever was color and dash, true gallantry and splendid heroism mingled with sham and roguery, a strong, happy world, capable, for all its hollow glitter and its weaknesses, of bidding its formidable foes defiance and sweeping them off the seas. The sports and games of the people were mostly out of doors. There was a tilt-yard at Regent's Park. The cruel sport of cock-fighting was indulged in to a great extent, and the rearing and training of the birds was a separate profession. There were running at the ring and quintain, fencing and sword and buckler play. The citizens, for their relaxation, went to see the famed lions of the tower, beheld the many pageants of the city, played bowls, practiced archery, or went on excursions to Hoxton, Islington, or even Richmond. There were dancing schools for all classes. In Southwark, in the Paris Garden, were the rings for the bear and bull baitings, the favorite resort of Londoners. The din in the bear ring was intolerable. A perpetual shouting, stamping, barking, shrieking, and yelling went on, and the name of the bear garden is perpetuated for all time in consequence as descriptive of uproar and disorder. The bears, chained to their stakes, were worried by great dogs, who were often injured or killed. Blind bears were whipped till they bled, driven furious by the blows, and sometimes in their wild endeavors seized their assailants. In all this the spectators took delight. It was rough and noisy, and it suited them. Betting and fighting were common incidents of the sport. The show was varied by the antics of monkeys on the backs of ponies, sword-play, and even juggling. To these rings foreign ambassadors and distinguished guests were taken. The richer men had hawking and hunting for their sports. The former developed into a science with many branches in breeding, taming, training, and using the birds. All classes played cards and dice except the Puritans, and all except them gambled. Fencing, with its necessary consequence in hot-blooded times, dueling, played a large part in Elizabethan life. All men went armed. The duel was the natural outcome and termination of all quarrels and insults, generally fought in the fields about London, but often over the sea near Calais. The language of the gallants, who attended the fencing school, was distinguished greatly by its phraseology. The dress of the different citizens and gentles marked their classes. The needy and the opulent rubbed shoulders almost in the social functions of the city. The rich tradesman with the scented courtier, the player with the grave lawyer, but there was no true intercourse beyond this. With the exception of the rogues, who assumed all manner of disguises, a man was as his dress denoted him. He belonged to a class with a recognized status, with recognized rights and liberties. The declarations of Shakespeare in Troilus and Cressida concerning government— and the recognition of the proper order of the different ranks of men, are essentially those of one who has observed and considered the ordered condition of Elizabethan society, where things followed greatly by settling prescription, and nothing was expected to exist of the government's cognizance and arrangement. Footnote. Those who agree with Tolstoy in condemning Shakespeare for his attitude toward the proletariat should consider the age in which the poet lived, and its ideas of government, the condition of people, then, greatly different from our own, and, above all, the ideas of the poet's contemporaries concerning the masses. In the old play of Respublica, people is a very poor figure, whose principal virtue is that he respects and obeys his superiors. Compare, too, Harrison's division of society into four sorts, gentlemen, citizens or burgesses, yeomen, and artificers or laborers. The gentlemen consist of princes, dukes, marquises, earls, viscounts, and barons knights, esquires, and lastly simple gentlemen, and so on down to the common people. This fourth and last sort of people, therefore, have neither voice nor authority in the commonwealth, but are to be ruled and not to rule others, etc. Harrison's England, edited by Furnival. The references of others are less complimentary. We cannot blame Shakespeare for not holding the political ideals of the twentieth century. End footnote. Courtly ceremony and titles of respect were not then merely complimentary matters of show, 
but also the tacit national recognition and acceptance of a certain gradated condition of society and a certain principle of government the condition of the elizabethan highways is not to be envied by us edwardians the roads themselves were often bad outside the cities and within were very narrow the country lanes were infested with gypsies and wandering rascals of every kind who haunted the fairs and to whom the unwary were a prey the abolition of the monasteries had not only in its effects upon land tenure and agriculture tended to increase this army of vagrants but had destroyed those very institutions which had provided for them by organized charity this great army of vagabonds and rascals was therefore let loose more than ever on elizabethan society this was one of the gravest evils of the time the theatre was the resort of all classes except the puritans who condemned it utterly our gallant resorted there smoked and seated in the boxes or on stools set on the green rushes of the stage displayed his apparel to the commons the commons themselves appear to have been almost as turbulent and unruly in the theatre as in the bear garden the one being to them merely a rival show to the other edibles were consumed and ale was drunk while the plays proceeded and the greatest noise seems sometimes to have prevailed years before shakespeare came to london plays had been acted by companies in the metropolis the condition of elizabethan society which permitted no underling to remain undetached necessitated the players maintenance of a connection with the nobles whose servants they were publicly declared to be the old companies performed in the yards of the large inns where the various classes of men were wont to resort the authorities seem to have had early a disposition to discourage the theatrical companies and in the year of her accession elizabeth issued a proclamation designed doubtless to dispose of some of the objectionable irregularities in connection with the stage its import being to prevent plays without license the days however were dangerous days of plague and the puritanic spirit was on the increase and in fifteen seventy two the plays were interdicted but a recognized class of actors were by this time dependent for their livelihood on the traffic of the stage and with the known predilection of elizabeth and the nobles for the drama it is not surprising that in fifteen seventy four the queen granted james burbage and four fellows of the earl of leicester's company a special license to perform in fifteen seventy five the mayor and corporation of london ostensibly tremulous because of the plague but probably possessed of an antipathy to the players banished all the companies from london the players then perforce deserted the courtyards of the city inns and must have repaired to those outside the city's jurisdiction this condition of affairs led to a step of great importance in the history of the drama and english literature the building of the first playhouse james burbage was for some time a joiner by profession and became a player doubtless by inclination the city being closed to him by the authorities and the liking for plays being apparently on the increase burbage decided to build a permanent theatre outside the walls a favourable spot presented itself in the liberty of holywell in the parish of shoreditch a locality associated with the festivities of the people from earliest times near the drill-ground of the city forces the ancient priory of holywell and the sacred well itself which gave the liberty its name the district was a favourite resort of the people when they were bent on play the theatre as the new house was named probably from the movable stage it contained stood on the ground of giles allen it was circular built of wood was decorated had scaffolds or stages around the arena and was open at the top to the weather arrangements which showed the influence of the traditional circular form of places for theatrical and athletic shows and the inn-yards where the companies first acted the stage was movable because the theatre was not given up entirely to plays for tumbling vaulting fencing and other shows were given there during some of which at least the stage would be removed soon after the opening of the theatre a similar building the curtain called after the land on which it was built was erected in the near vicinity meanwhile the prejudice against plays was growing in some quarters the city authorities still fearful because of the plague gave evidence frequently of their antipathy to the playhouses but the lords of the council were for them and stood the actors friends plays were still going on in the inn-yards the theatre and the curtain were the butts for all the arrows of the puritan satire and abuse in fifteen eighty three the mayor once more expressed himself somewhat forcibly concerning the profane spectacles at the playhouses the lords and probably the queen however were not disposed to acquiesce in the suppression of a craft in which they took delight 
and Sir Francis Walsingham accordingly gathered together the best actors of the various companies, and principally those of Burbage's, the Earl of Leicester's servants, and enrolled them under the master of the revels as the Queen's players in 1583. Of this company Shakespeare became a member. Other playhouses subsequently sprang up after the example of the theatre. There were the Black Friars, the White Friars, the Fortune in Gold Lane, the Cockpit in Drury Lane, and the Hope, Swan, and Rose, small public playhouses. The theatre itself, in consequence of difficulty with the ground landlord, Allen, in 1598, was pulled down and rebuilt with the old materials by Cuthbert and Richard Burbage, sons of James, and Peter Street, a carpenter, in the Bankside, where it was destined to achieve still greater fame under the name of The Globe. There was a good deal of wrong and roguery in this old London, a good deal of nobility and greatness. For the condition of the people, economic and social changes which affected the city, the withholding of corn, plague, unjust magistrates, increasing luxury, drunkenness, see Harrison's England. Read there that in contrast to the turbulent and rascally substratum of society, both the artificer and the husbandman are sufficiently liberal and very friendly at their tables, and when they meet they are so merry without malice, and plain without inward Italian or French craft and subtlety, that it would do a man good to be in company among them. For the beautiful women of the court turn to Spencer's Colin Clouts Come Home Again, for the strife and envy of the court to the same poem. For the splendid men of the court turn to the history of England, where their names are written large, for the rascals read Spencer's Mother Hubbard's Tales. Harmon's Caveat, and Decker's Bellman of London, etc. For the Puritan view, from which much is to be learnt, see Stubbs, Northbrook, and their fellows. For the satirists, read Decker, Earl, etc. All these show us a London which is indeed the heart of England, throbbing responsively to the great events which endangered or ennobled the national life. The exploits of bold navigators sailing round Africa to Asia, and across the Atlantic to America, the fearless excursions in the Spanish seas of hardy fighting men who return triumphant, the struggle for independence in the Netherlands against the power of Spain, the resistance of the Pope's pretensions, the assertion of a national independence, self-reliance, audacious defiance in the face of danger, all these things had their immediate effects and consequences, and often their origins, in this walled London set in the green fields. Here, then, in 1587 or before— Footnote. The date is sometimes put as early as 1582. End footnote. From his rural Stratford on the Avon came our William Shakespeare. London was in jubilation. The plot of Thomas Babington against the beloved Queen, whose accession had meant the cessation of the evils of Mary's reign, had been discovered by Walsingham, the player's friend. Mary, Queen of Scots, was implicated. Babington was executed in September 1586. Mary was beheaded at Fotheringay on February 8, 1587. The bells of London were rung and bonfires lit in exultation. Mary's execution was defiance to Rome and Spain, the powerful foes of England, a defiance which had its aggressive results. On the 26th of June, 1587, Drake sailed into Plymouth Harbor after a voyage of fighting and victory, rich with the spoils of Spain. Spain sought reparation. In the May of 1588, the Great Armada set sail for England with its 132 ships and its 33,000 men. When it arrived in the Channel, 17,000 soldiers from the Netherlands would join forces with it. But the Armada failed. In October 1588, the poor remainder of this mighty host got back to Spain. It had united England. The clarion note of triumph which resounds through the second period plays of Shakespeare is the echo only of the outburst of patriotic feeling, devotion, and love for the precious stone set in the silver sea, which Englishmen felt for England, a feeling which increased in spite of the plague and other evils, and found outlet on such occasions as Essex's departure for Ireland, when the confidence, patriotism, and martial fervor of London were denoted in Shakespeare's Henry V. The Elizabethan age stood high in general level of intellect over preceding times. From the Norman conquest to the middle of the fifteenth century, genius and conspicuous ability were rare exceptions. But already in Chaucerian days the spirit of humanism and the Renaissance, which was to lift the minds of men, began to assert itself. Increasing prosperity, and in England to some degree, increasing national independence and unity, assisted in disseminating culture and knowledge. 
the whole of the sixteenth century shows a truly marvellous uplifting which culminates at the beginning of the seventeenth and maintains a level for fifty years the early part of this level with the rise to it which took place at the end of the sixteenth century is the shakespearean age the following curve which takes no consideration of increase or decrease of population for which changes allowance should be made where possible shows clearly the rise and fall in the number of individuals of genius and eminent ability from eleven o one to eighteen thirty it is made from statistics supplied by havelock ellis in his valuable study of british genius nineteen o four page twelve which book is based on a thorough study of the dictionary of national biography End of chapter 2「Shakespeare, Life and Work」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. « Shakespeare, Life and Work » by F. J. Furnival and John Monroe, Chapter 3 writing in eighteen seventy seven i had to complain that it was a question that had not been yet enough attended to in england involving as it did the cure of the great defect of the english school of shakespeareans their neglect to study shakespeare as a whole they had too much looked on his works as a conglomerate of isolated plays without order or succession bound together only by his name and the covers of the volume that contained them whereas the first necessity was to regard shakespeare as a whole his works as a living organism each a member of one created unity the whole a tree of healing and of comfort to the nations a growth from small beginnings to mighty ends the successive shoots of one great mind which can never be seen in its full glory of leaf and blossom and fruit unless it be viewed in its oneness certain it is that no one work of shakespeare's or any other man's can be rightly and fully valued and understood unless it is set by his other works and its relation to them made out the progress of his mind up to that point followed and the advance of it afterwards ascertained this process can alone enable the student to get the full yield out of the play or the author he studies while it gives him quite a new interest in the author's works by the light it casts on the history of that author's mind the getting shakespeare's plays into the nearest possible approach to their right order of writing is thus a matter of first importance to all students of our great poet the evidence for this order is twofold from without and from within a that from without consists of one entries of poems and plays before or on publication by publishers in the registers of the stationers company incorporated by queen mary in fifteen fifty seven of which the book entries from fifteen fifty seven to sixteen forty have been printed by professor e arbour in five volumes for two two the publications of the poems and plays three allusions in contemporary books diaries letters etc these give the date at which the poem or play must have been in existence though it may have been written long before numbers one and two the stationers registers and publication date sufficiently for us two poems and six plays all printed in shakespeare's lifetime except as you like it which though not expressly dated sixteen hundred is in such a place in the stationer's registers that no other year than sixteen hundred can be meant see arbour's transcript three thirty seven entered published venus and adonis fifteen ninety three lucrece fifteen ninety four one henry the fourth fifteen ninety seven much ado sixteen hundred entered 
published hamlet sixteen o two sixteen o three sixteen o one lear sixteen o seven sixteen o eight mentioning sixteen o six pericles sixteen o eight sixteen o nine number three allusions in contemporary books etc date for us five plays romeo and juliet before fifteen ninety five julius caesar sixteen o one twelfth night february sixteen o two winter's tale sixteen eleven henry the eighth sixteen thirteen the authorities are as follows weaver's sonnet in his epigram fifteen ninety five romeo richard more whose names i know not etc weaver's mirror of martyrs sixteen o one for julius caesar the many-headed multitude were drawn by brutus speech that caesar was ambitious when eloquent mark antony had shown his virtues who but brutus then was vicious there is no such scene in plutarch's life of caesar which was shakespeare's original so that no doubt weaver alluded to shakespeare's play manningham's diary camden society eighteen sixty eight edited j bruce page eighteen manningham was a barrister of the middle temple for twelfth night february two sixteen o one two at our feast we had a play called twelve night or what you will much like the comedy of errors or menechmi in plautus but most like and near to that in italian called ingani a good practice in it to make the steward believe his lady widow was in love with him by counterfeiting a letter as from his lady in general terms telling him what she liked best in him and prescribing his gesture and smiling his apparel etc and then when he came to practice making him believe they took him to be mad etc the external evidence is confirmed by the internal the new map with the augmentation of the indies to which maria refers in twelfth night is an allusion to the new map of the world published at that time in hacklet's voyages dr foreman's diary in number two zero eight of the ashmole manuscript in the bodleian library oxford article twelve for winter's tale says in the winter's tale at the globe sixteen eleven the fifteenth of may and his spelling being modernized observe thee how leontes the king of sicilia was overcome with jealousy of his wife with the king of bohemia his friend that came to see him and how he contrived his death and would have had his cup-bearer to have poisoned bohemia who gave the king of bohemia warning thereof and fled with him to bohemia remember also how he sent to the oracle of apollo and the answer of apollo that she was guiltless and that the king was jealous etc and how except the child was found again that was lost the king should die without issue for the child was carried into bohemia and there laid in a forest and brought up by a shepherd and the king of bohemia's son that married that wench and how they fled into sicily to leontes and the shepherd having showed the letter of the nobleman by whom leontes sent away that child and the jewels found about her she was known to be leontes daughter and was then sixteen years old for henry the eighth one thomas lorcan's letter in the harleian manuscript seven thousand two british museum to sir thomas puckering dated london this last of june sixteen thirteen no longer since than yesterday june twenty nine while burbage his company were acting at the globe the play of henry the eighth and there shooting of certain chambers small cannon or mortars in way of triumph the fire catched etc singer to john chamberlain's letter to sir ralph winwood dated london eight july sixteen thirteen and winwood's memorials volume three page four sixty nine but the burning of the globe or playhouse on the bank side on st peter's day june twenty nine cannot escape you which fell out by appeal of chambers but i know not upon what occasion were to be used in the play 
the tampon or stopple of one of them lighting in the thatch that covered the house burned it to the ground in less than two hours with a dwelling-house adjoining and it was a great marvel and fair grace of god that the people had so little harm having but two narrow doors to get out at singer the burning of the globe is mentioned also by howes in his continuation of stowe's annals edited sixteen thirty one page nine twenty six but sir hyde wotton in his account of it reliquiae wotaniae page four fifty two edited sixteen eighty five says that the play was a new play called all is true b the evidence of date from within the plays is one from allusions in them to past or contemporary events etc these date positively only one play henry v which in line thirty of its prologue to act five page one fifty four refers to the earl of essex then in command of the queen's army in ireland but now behold in the quick forge and working house of thought how london doth pour out her citizens the mayor and all his brethren in best sort like to the senators of the antique rome with the plebeians swarming at their heels go forth and fetch their conquering caesar in as by a lower but loving likelihood were now the general of our gracious empress as in good time he may from ireland coming bringing rebellion broached upon his sword how many would the peaceful city quit to welcome him much more and much more cause did they this harry and there can be little doubt that the prologue to act one also refers to the newly built wooden o or globe theatre opened in fifteen ninety nine see page fifty six above can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of france or may we cram within this wooden o the very casks that did affright the air of agincourt but the date of one other play may also be taken as decided by an allusion in it and that is romeo and juliet by the nurse's words as to juliet's age come lammas eve at night shall she be fourteen susan and she god rest all christian souls were of an age well susan is with god she was too good for me but as i said on lammas eve at night shall she be fourteen that shall she marry i remember it well tis since the earthquake now eleven years and since she was weaned i never shall forget it of all the days of the year upon that day one three pages thirty seven eight through eight now the great earthquake of shakespeare's time to which he also probably refers in venus and adonis was on april sixth fifteen eighty and unless juliet was suckled till she was between two and three the nurse's eleven years should be thirteen this gives either fifteen ninety one or fifteen ninety three for the date of the play and as it must be close to venus and adonis entered and published fifteen ninety three either date may be held for it though i incline to put it before venus and adonis rather than after it thus far then we have trustworthy dates for two poems venus and adonis fifteen ninety three lucrece fifteen ninety four and eleven plays romeo and juliet fifteen ninety one through three one henry the fourth fifteen ninety seven henry the fifth fifteen ninety nine as you like it and much ado sixteen hundred twelfth night sixteen o two hamlet sixteen o two through four lear sixteen o six pericles sixteen o eight winter's tale sixteen eleven henry the eighth sixteen thirteen two and for the dates or rather the order of the rest twenty-six of shakespeare's thirty-seven plays eighteen printed during his life and nineteen after his death excluding the two noble kinsmen as well as part of his sonnets we are thrown back on the second part of the evidence from within the style and temper of the works let us first take the point of metre in which shakespeare was changing almost play by play during his whole life here are two passages from plays of his youth and his age just read them and see which has the formality of the beginner which the ease and the flow of the practised writer 
the comedy of errors one one ninety nine through one twenty one page eighty eight folio text merch oh had the gods done so i had not now worthily termed them merciless to us for ere the ships could meet by twice five leagues we were encountered by a mighty rock which being violently borne upon our helpful ship was splitted in the midst so that in this unjust divorce of us fortune had left to both of us alike what to delight in and what to sorrow for her part poor soul seeming as burdened with lesser weight but not with lesser woe was carried with more speed before the wind and in our sight they three were taken up by fishermen of corinth as we thought at length another ship had seized on us and knowing whom it was their hap to save gave healthful welcome to their shipwracked guests and would have reft the fishers of their prey had not their bark been very slow of sail and therefore homeward did they bend their course thus have you heard me severed from my bliss that by misfortunes was my life prolonged to tell sad stories of my own mishaps the winter's tale four three cam he's irremovable resolved for flight now were i happy if his going i could frame to serve my turn save him from danger do him love and honour purchase the sight again of dear cecilia and that unhappy king my master whom i so much thirst to see Flo. now good camillo i am so fraught with curious business that i leave out ceremony cam sir i think you have heard of my poor services in the love that i have borne your father Flo. very nobly have you deserved it is my father's music to speak your deeds not little of his care to have them recompensed as thought on cam well my lord if you may please to think i love the king and through him what's nearest to him which is your gracious self embrace but my direction if your more ponderous and settled project may suffer alteration on mine honour i'll point you where you shall have such receiving as shall become your highness where you may enjoy your mistress is it not plain that the error's lines are the work of the novice the winter's tale ones of the trained artist with full command of his material who has learnt how to conceal his art compare the formal structure of the first with the ease and varied pauses of the second note in the error's passage how every line but three dwells on the last word has a pause after it though with three central pauses too while well, in the winter's tale one of twenty-one full lines not only do nine run on into the next line with central pauses here and there but also to facilitate this running on we have in five lines a light l or weak w k ending at the last word this to get the freedom and ease of natural talk note again that the errors lines have all ten syllables or five iambic measures while in the winter's tale eleven lines have an extra or eleventh syllable and one a twelfth to break the monotony of the verse just compare then the percentages of these characteristics run on lines errors three in twenty three or one in seven point six six winter's tale nine in twenty one or one in two point three extra syllable errors zero winter's tale twelve in twenty one or one in one point seven five week endings errors zero winter's tale five in twenty one or one in four point two note again that in shakespeare's earliest genuine play love's labour's lost as compared with three of his latest the proportions of rhyming five measure lines to blank first ones are as follows love's labour's lost one thousand twenty eight rhyme to five hundred and seventy nine blank or one two point fifty six the tempest two rhyme to one thousand four hundred and fifty eight blank or one to seven seventy nine winter's tale zero rhyme to one thousand eight hundred and twenty five blank or one to infinity so the proportion of n unstopped lines to n stopped ones in three of the earliest and latest plays is as follows love's labours lost one in eighteen point fourteen the comedy of errors one in ten point seven 
the two gentlemen of verona at one in ten latest plays the tempest one in three point zero two simelin one in two point five two the winter's tale one in two point one two note to the frequency with which shakespeare in his later plays employs the central pause not at all in the passage cited from the errors but with remarkable regularity in all the later plays compare the winter's tale five one page one fifty i thought of her even in these looks i made but your petition is yet unanswered i will to your father your honour not overthrown by your desires i am a friend to them and you upon which errand i now go toward him therefore follow me and mark what way i make come good my lord now these changes in shakespeare's metre are not accidental they are undesigned outward signs of his inward growth they were accompanied by other changes in style and temper that marked the progress of shakespeare's mind and spirit he soon gave up the doggerel the excessive word-play the quip and crank of his early plays their puns conceits and occasional bombast their use of stanzas in the dialogue he put his early superabundant use of fancy more and more under the control of the higher imagination and of straight aim he subdued the rhetoric of his historical plays he changed the chaff the farce the whim of his early comedies into the death struggle of the passions into the terror of his tragedies laying bare the inmost recesses of the human soul and then passed serene and tender to the pastorals and romances of his later age changing developing shakespeare always was and as his growth is more and more closely watched and discerned we shall more and more clearly see that his metre his words his grammar and syntax move but with the deeper changes of mind and soul of which they are outward signs and that all the faculties of the man went onward together this subject of the growth the oneness of shakespeare the links between his successive plays the light thrown on each by comparison with its neighbour the distinctive characteristics of each period and its contrast with the others the treatment of the same or like incidents etc in the different periods of shakespeare's life this subject in all its branches was the special business of the second school of victorian students of the great elizabethan poet as antiquarian illustration emendation and verbal criticism to say nothing of forgery or at least publication of forged documents were of the first school the work of the first school minus the forgery we had to carry on not to leave undone the work of our own second school we had to do in it gervinus of heidelberg dowden of dublin hudson and brass are the students best guides that we have in english speech i can only hope to help to their end by saying how shakespeare's successive plays have struck me who came late to the study of them resolved to try to get at their relation to one another and their author and not to submit to the mere gammon i used to hear succession of shakespeare's plays my dear fellow impossible shakespeare was infinite no before and after in him or succession can't be done the very utmost you can hope for is to say to which of the three periods a play belongs as if the same powers of mind which could put a play into a period couldn't with further exercise settle the place of the play in that period i don't say that we can do this entirely even yet we can't but it's only because we haven't yet used our eyes and heads enough assuredly a day will come when the large majority of reasonable critics will be agreed as to the order of shakespeare's plays and as soon as folk know their shakespeare a b c we shall have no more such silly fancies as the late mr hunter's that the tempest was love's labours one and written before fifteen ninety eight or mr swinburne's that henry the eighth was an early second period play and therefore before or about fifteen ninety six the handiest test for shakespeare's earliest plays is that of metre combined with evident youngness of treatment we find in certain plays such a large proportion of rhymed lines mixed with blank verse in the ordinary five measure dialogue 
and in others such unripeness of handling that we pick out as the first period plays love's labors lost the early part of all's well representing love's labors won the comedy of errors midsummer night's dream the two gentlemen of verona romeo and juliet with the poems venus and adonis and lucrece and probably the troilus part of troilus and cressida richard the second and the quadrilogy of one two and three henry the sixth and richard the third as the shakespeare temple garden scene in one henry the sixth has an extra syllable to one fourth of its lines while love's labors lost has one to only nine lines in the whole play i do not suppose shakespeare's ascribed part in one henry the sixth to be his earliest work End of chapter 3chapter 4 shakespeare life and work this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org shakespeare life and work by f j furnival and john munro chapter 4 titus andronicus the story of Titus Andronicus is briefly that Titus, returning from the Gothic wars with prisoners, finds Bassianus and Saturninus, two brothers, in conflict for the emperorship. Through Titus, Saturninus is made emperor and would wed Lavinia, Titus's daughter, but Bassianus carries her off and weds her. Titus gives his prisoners Tamar, queen of the Goths, Aaron, her Moorish paramour, and her two sons, two Saturninus, who weds Tamra. Titus has granted one of Tamra's three sons as a sacrifice for his dead sons, and Tamra seeks revenge. Titus has slain his own son, who sought to prevent his pursuit of Lavinia. Tamra's two remaining sons find Bassianus and Lavinia in a wood. The former they kill, the latter they ravish and mutilate. Martius and Quintus, Titus's sons, are accused of the crime and condemned to death. Titus is deceived that he may save them by cutting off his hand. Aaron performs this office, but the sons are killed. Titus's son Lucius goes to join the Goths and takes revenge on Rome. Tamar is delivered of a blackamoor child whose nurse and the midwife Aaron, its father, murders. Tamar and her two sons go disguised to Titus to induce him to recall Lucius. Titus feigns not to recognize them and persuades Tamar to go and leave her sons. Having previously discovered their crime, he slays them. He recalls Lucius and invites Tamar, Saturninus, etc., to a banquet where he serves up a pie made of the blood and bones of Tamar's sons. General carnage ensues. Titus kills Lavinia and Tamara, Saturninus kills Titus, Lucius kills Saturninus, and is afterwards proclaimed emperor. We believe that Shakespeare had very little or nothing to do with this abomination among plays. It has not one redeeming feature and is full of the grossest horrors and bestiality. Love's Labor's Lost In his first genuine play, Shakespeare dealt with some of the leading topics of his day, the relation of man to woman, the education question, and the worth of the wit on which London gallants so prided themselves. He took for his male characters the King of Navarre, Henry IV, and his generals, in whose war for the crown of France the Elizabethan Protestants were so greatly interested and whom they helped. The king takes it into his head to make his court an academy, where he and his three nobles, Byron, Dumaine, and Longueville, swear to study for three years, to see no woman, to fast one day a week, and have but one meal a day on the other days. To them comes the Princess of France, with a demand from the king, her father, for the repayment of a hundred thousand crowns, and the yielding up of Navarre's claims to Aquitaine. She brings with her her three ladies, the dark Rosalind, Maria, and Catherine, 
and of course the king and his nobles at once fall in love with them the king with the princess byron with the sparkling rosalind longueville with maria and dumaine with catherine when they leave the ladies each of the men writes verses to the girl he loves and they go one after another to a wood to sigh and to read their poems byron is first he is overcome by rosalind's beautiful black eyes hearing some one coming he climbs a tree the king then appears reads his verses to the princess and hides them when longueville turns up with his sonnet to maria then longueville hides when dumaine comes in and spouts his lines to his cape on which longueville steps forward and reproaches dumaine then the king turns out and abuses both and byron jumps from his tree and scolds all three of them when his own verses to rosalind are produced and the four men confess they are all in love and call on byron to justify them this he does brilliantly as love in a lady's eyes is worth all the books they then say they'll entertain their french lady loves with a mask and they dress as russians but the girls get wind of this and change favors so that when the men come each takes the wrong girl and is chaffed by her they are all dry beaten with pure scoff so they depart and return in their proper clothes and are told by the girls that a mess of russians has been to visit them but couldn't say one happy word they are too polite to call the men fools but says rosalind this i think when they are thirsty fools would fain have drink the underplot is concerned with armado a spaniard full of fantastical words and his wooing of jaconetta a pretty country girl whom the clown costard wants his witty little page moth makes great fun of him over it he is asked by the king to get up a show for the ladies and his mask of the nine worthies leads to plenty of fun costard wants to fight him in his shirt for jaconetta and armado has to confess that he has no shirt suddenly comes news that the french princess's father is dead so she must go home at once the king of navarre and his friends ask for love pledges from the princess and her ladies these are refused till the men have shown they are worthy of good women's love the king is to go to a hermitage for a year byron is to work in a hospital and cure his jibing spirit dumaine and longueville are to wait for a year too armado is to hold the plough for three years before he gets jaconetta the women have shown the men that they can't do without them and that they must do good work to win them the play is a bright open air one full of quip and chaff with two capital songs to wind it up and takes the conceit out of men who fancy they are lords of the world and can do without woman's guidance and help the comedy of errors having thus relieved his feelings by telling the wits of his day what he thought of em shakespeare resolved on a change and went back about eighteen hundred years for the plot of his next play the comedy of errors to the old roman comic dramatist plautus who lived about b c two fifty four to one eighty four and some of whose work shakespeare may have read at school this took him from the pyrenees to the mediterranean from the south of france to syracuse in sicily and ephesus in asia minor these two cities having quarrelled they both decreed that if any one of either place came to the other he should be killed unless he paid one thousand marks a syracusan merchant Aegean, was found in syracuse and condemned to die unless he paid the fine which he couldn't do so he told his story that his wife and a poor woman had both borne twins at the same time the twin of each pair being so like his brother that they couldn't be told apart that he had taken the poor twins as slaves to his own boys that all of them had been wrecked he being saved with his elder twin and slave boy while his wife and the younger twin and boy were rescued by fishermen of corinth in search of them his twin and boy when eighteen left home and for five years the father had been trying to find them unknown to him his younger son and slave antiphilus and dromio of syracuse had also come to ephesus and there the elder twin and slave antiphilus and dromio of ephesus had all along been and their mother unknown to them was there too having thus a pair of master brothers and a pair of slave brothers each one of each pair liable to be mistaken for the other and the ephesian master brother having a jealous wife 
adriana and this slave twin being married too a most amusing series of mistakes occurs which leads to one master beating the wrong slave to both wives taking the wrong twins for their husbands to the ephesian twin being put in prison etc etc all good fun which space prevents being told here in the end the mistakes are explained and all ends happily with midsummer night's dream we are still in the mediterranean but at athens though the charm of the play lies in the fairies of england and its fun in english mechanicals the country workmen whom shakespeare had seen figuring as actors in out-of-door plays at stratford and elsewhere the king of the fairies oberon has quarrelled with titania his queen because she won't give him her page boy so he tells his spirit puck to get him the flower love in idleness whose juice when dropped on any one's eyes will make her or him in love with the first animal she or he sees girl man or beast this juice oberon drops on titania's eyes meaning not to take it off till she gives him her page and when she awakes she falls in love with a delightfully humorous and conceited weaver bottom with an ass's head over his own her scene with her fairies and him is charming before this oberon also told puck to drop the juice into the eyes of a sleeping athenian meaning one demetrius to make him in love again with helena whom he had deserted for her friend hermia but puck unluckily drops it in the eyes of hermia's sleeping lover lysander who sees helena when he awakes and this leads to a quarrel between the two girlfriends and to an attempted duel between their two lovers at last puck sets the matter right and the two sets of sweethearts are to be married on the same day as their duke theseus and his lover hippolyta but in honour of the coming wedding bottom and his friends quince the carpenter snug the joiner flute the bellow mender snout the tinker and starveling the tailor rehearses and then act the play of pyramus and thisbe in which pyramus on seeing thisbe's scarf bloody by a line stabs himself for love of her and she then stabs herself for love of him and then the fairies appear and bless the bridal bed the whole play is full of delightful fancy and fun to which no kind of justice can be done in a short sketch the two gentlemen of verona we move to italy in the two gentlemen of verona to verona milan and the frontiers of mantua and find two young friends the simple frank valentine in love with sylvia the daughter of the duke of milan who disapproves the match and the fickle and scheming proteus in love at first with julia valentine is at the emperor's that is the duke's court and proteus's father sends him against his will to be with valentine as soon as proteus sees sylvia he falls in love with her gives up julia and treacherously resolves to oust valentine valentine trusts him with his plan to elope with sylvia proteus betrays this to the duke her father and he banishes valentine and urges her to accept an older lover thurio whom proteus plays on and betrays too but sylvia refuses both thurio and proteus and escapes with an old friend eglamour to follow valentine who has agreed to be the chief of a band of outlaws proteus finds her in a wood and tries to ravish her but is stopped by valentine who on proteus's repentance and his acceptance of julia who has followed him in disguise generously forgives him and all ends happily proteus has a delightfully comic servant launce who owns a dog has a sweetheart with no teeth and a temper but who can milk and brew good ale so that her virtues outbalance her vices and he and valentine's man speed enliven the play romeo and juliet in verona two families the capulets and the montagues were at feud romeo was of the latter family juliet of the former old capulet gave a feast to which went romeo and his friends mercutio benvolio etc romeo's purpose was there to see rosalind whom he loved and to compare her beauty with that of other veronese ladies there he saw juliet and there began their love for one another romeo leaped at night over capulet's orchard wall and juliet appeared at her window here they settled that juliet's nurse should go to romeo early on the morrow to arrange their marriage romeo departed for the cell of friar lawrence to whom he told his story and whom he induced to consent to wed him and juliet that afternoon 
the nurse came and was told the arrangements and juliet pretending her purpose was shrift went to the monk's cell and was secretly married juliet returned home tybalt juliet's cousin shortly afterwards attacked romeo in the street but romeo refused to fight mercutio affronting tybalt was killed in the ensuing duel romeo subsequently attacked tybalt and slew him the prince and rival families entered romeo was condemned to banishment he had hidden in lawrence's cell and his grief at the news was excessive he climbed the rope ladder to juliet's chamber that night and bidding her farewell at dawning went to mantua juliet's parents anxious at her grief sought to induce her to wed paris to whom they had promised her before the feast this she refused to do and departing from her irate father's threats went for counsel to lawrence he advised her to pretend consent to the marriage and gave her a sleeping potion to take in the night before the wedding this she did and was considered dead by her kin she was borne to the sepulchre on an open bier lawrence sent off a messenger to acquaint romeo and hid him bid him come to take her when she awoke the messenger however was detained in a house in the town through the plague romeo's servant meanwhile had gone to mantra and told him juliet was dead romeo bought poison from an apothecary and departed for verona arrived at the sepulchre at night he found paris there with flowers paris attempted to apprehend romeo the two fought and paris was slain romeo entering the sepulchre embraced juliet and taking the poison died juliet then awoke and discovering the truth stabbed herself with romeo's dagger the play is full of luxuriant fancy its lines pulse with passion it is swift ecstatic romantic in the extreme distinguished by lyrical splendor moving pathos and tragedy venus and adonis the story of venus and adonis shakespeare got from the tenth book of ovid's metamorphoses ovid says that adonis was educated by the naiads his beauty enthralled venus who took part in the chase through woods and among bushy rocks and warning adonis against hunting boars and such ferocious beasts she led him to a poplar shade where she told him the story of atalanta shakespeare's poem starts then and describes venus's efforts to win the love of adonis he however fled from her and was killed by a boar venus stricken with grief changed his blood into the anemone or wind flower the poem is full of luxuriant imagery and country recollections aphorisms on love and life with lines of passionate and even sensual appeal it is a young man's work showing nature love and nature knowledge command of words and a fine sense of their music the rape of lucrece as in the venus shakespeare's source in lucrece was ovid not however the metamorphoses this time but the fasti chaucer too may have been drawn from the lust of the venus is continued here not now purified by the sweet wind which steals over english woodlands but hot and stifling the poem is concerned with the ravishing of lucrece the chase by tarquin to whom colatine had boasted of her beauty and with her suicide to save her shame the verse is in chaucerian rhyme royal and is characterized by long-winded and laboured soliloquy etc which may be due to the influence of chaucer's troilus richard the second this piece commences historically the dramatic version of our national story which ends with richard the third in the play bolingbroke before richard accused mowbray of treason and challenged him richard withheld the two foes in their anger and directed them to attend the coventry lists on st lambert's day at the lists, just as the opponents were about to fight richard threw down his warder and stopped the charge mowbray he exiled, exiled from england for life bolingbroke for the sake of gaunt his father only for six years richard surrounded by flatterers and intriguers was afraid of bolingbroke's power and courting of the people the king then prepared for quelling the rebels in ireland but his treasury due to extravagances was empty news came that old john of gaunt was sick to death the king wished him dead that he might seize his riches and went to his bedside where gaunt delivered him that beautiful wise and patriotic speech dear to all britons against his evil ways gaunt died 
and richard now possessed of money left for ireland bolingbroke learning that the king had seized his patrimony gathered force abroad and landed at ravensburg ross northumberland willoughby and other lords disgusted with richard joined bolingbroke york who had been left regent went also to his side richard returned to england to find all things turned to disaster the army of salisbury on which he relied was disbanded his favourites at court unjust taxes and extravagances had turned all from him he was in bolingbroke's power bolingbroke insisted that he came merely for his own richard knew the crown was at stake seeing that resistance was useless he went to london and there before parliament after much posing resigned the crown he was led through the streets where he parted from his queen and after bolingbroke was crowned henry the fourth richard was killed by exton in a dungeon at the new king's instigation in richard the second are reflected the political problems of elizabeth's day succession to the crown favorites exactions the lesson is preached that to rule wisely is to rule well the play pulses with the patriotic fervor of dying gaunt and the rhetoric of national feeling heard here echoes again in later plays henry the sixth the three parts of henry the sixth give the dramatic version of english history from the death of henry the fifth to the accession of edward the fourth they depict the seemingly interminable succession of internal conflicts which arose from the rivalry of york and lancaster and show how york obtained the ascendancy they describe the wars in france the bravery of talbot and the exertions of joan of arc for her countrymen part one commences on november seventh fourteen twenty two with the funeral of henry v and concludes with the arrangement for the wedding of henry the sixth to margaret of france in it we see the disturbances between gloucester and winchester the development of enmity between the york and lancastrian factions the engagement at orleans the conduct of jean la pucelle and her treatment by the french and english the engagement at rouen and the cowardice there of sir john fastolf the death of brave talbot and the series of intrigues that made the court a peril and foreign plans a failure the first part is somewhat incoherent little of it is by shakespeare the second part of henry the sixth is a recast of the first part of the contention betwixt the two famous houses of york and lancaster it continues the story of intrigues given in the first part margaret arrives in england eleanor gloucester's wife aspires to the crown for herself and her husband who however is faithful to his king she falls into the power of a rascally priest a conjurer and a witch instigated by suffolk and is by him betrayed she is affronted by the queen in the court and is forced to do open penance in the streets the enemies of gloucester bring about his downfall and suffolk has him murdered winchester now a cardinal who had greatly helped in his ruin died soon after in mental agonies the populace demanded vengeance on suffolk for whom the queen held a guilty and secret love and he was banished some sailors murdered him off the coast york meanwhile aspired to the crown to which he believed himself heir and had won salisbury and warwick to support him a rebellion occurring in ireland he was given men and sent to quell it a caricature of the rebellion of cade which occurred in his absence is given in the play york returned to england with an army and claimed the crown his supporters rallied round him part two concludes with the battle of st albans which york won may twenty two fourteen fifty five the action in part three commences immediately after the battle of st albans the yorkists had marched to london and york was seated on the throne in the parliament house henry weakly agreed that york should succeed him thus dispossessing his son margaret enraged attacked the yorkists beat them in battle captured york and killed him richard the hunchback and edward hearing of their father's death with warwick's assistance gave the yorkists battle at toton and turned what was almost a loss into a victory henry fled to scotland margaret to france edward was crowned king richard became duke of gloucester and george his brother duke of clarence warwick was sent to france to win lady bona to be wife to edward who meanwhile through lust wedded lady grey 
warwick meeting margaret at the french king's court and angered with edward's conduct joined her henry had by then strayed from his place of safety and was captured warwick surprised edward in his tent in the camp and imprisoned him henry was king once more but made joint regents of warwick and of clarence who had joined him edward escaped to burgundy where he and his friends raised forces and returning to england occupied york they surprised henry in london and thrust him into the tower where gloucester afterwards murdered him warwick was surprised at coventry and beaten and killed at barnet margaret was beaten at tewkesbury where young prince edward was stabbed before his mother's eyes the three parts of henry the sixth are a patchwork in which several hands at least four took part they contain many magnificent themes for a dramatist of which the writers did not take full advantage fine heroic figures are rare the picture of mankind given shows men in the main base and treacherous or weak and foolish shakespeare's part was the amplification of the work of his predecessors richard the third this play continues the story of three henry the sixth and shows how richard the hunchback won and lost the crown he was far from the kingship many of his own kin stood in his way these he diabolically cleared from his path and seized the crown amid the execrations curses and tears of the wives and mothers of those he had murdered he had murdered henry the sixth but he wooed and won his widow through him his brother clarence was killed the king died and richard had murdered his two little sons in the tower the nobles who opposed him he just as ruthlessly had executed by simulating religious fervour he obtained the acquiescence of mayor and people in his coronation buckingham who had helped him all through he refused a promised reward and had executed after that noble's army which was raised in revolt had been dispersed meanwhile the english nobles were deserting him some fled overseas to richmond whom henry the sixth had said would some day reign exeter was in arms dorset and lovell were up in yorkshire and the men of kent had risen richmond was coming to england with his forces the two armies met at bosworth richard on the night before the battle was tormented by the ghosts of those he had slain the forces of richmond triumphed and richard was killed the play rings with the terrible curses of margaret stung into fury by insufferable wrongs and the lamentations of the kin of the slain it is dominated by the great figure of richard himself who is drawn after the manner of marlowe review of shakespeare's first period in shakespeare's first period fifteen eighty nine to fifteen ninety four or so the poet served his dramatic apprenticeship and laid the foundation of his fame the whole of his work in that time bears the impress of youth but of youth gifted with most wonderful powers some of the work was necessarily revision as in henry the sixth most of it was original and instinct with the personality of a young and independent man looking round with a keen eye and a kindly heart on the affairs of men in the earliest of his plays shakespeare shows an extraordinary facility in expression and a felicity in the choice of phrases and epithets which in its later developed form effectually distinguished his composition from that of any of his contemporaries but the verse of shakespeare's early days was not even at the best a happy vehicle for expression it consisted as a rule of five rigid iambic feet dark night that from the eye his function takes the ear more quick of apprehension makes wherein it doth impair the seeing sense it pays the hearing double recompense midsummer night's dream three to page seventy and the custom of rhyming made the verse even more mechanical and unfitted for dramatic expression true that it never at its worst presented the artificial character that strikes one on reading the french alexandrine je viens per se en cur cur j'adore qui m'aime et pourquoi le per se qui l'ordonne moi-même racine berenice four four yet all who read the dramatic works of the period composed in this cribbed and restricted style must be struck by the evident disparity 
between the author's own conception of his subject and his rendering of it in composition consider how much shakespeare's idea in the four lines quoted above suffers from its expression and repetition in rhyming couplets even when rhyme was not used the poet's lines sometimes exhibited an obscurity which was perplexing the extreme parts of time extremely form all causes to the purpose of his speed and often at his very loose decides that which long process could not arbitrate love's labours lost five two page one forty one here is thought jived and restricted struggling to be free as shakespeare progresses his mastery of words becomes more absolute the foundations of english blank verse style were laid before shakespeare norton and sackville in the earliest english renaissance tragedy of gorboduc had employed the blank verse meter introduced into english by surrey the style of norton and sackville was flat and unraised though the verse contained an astonishing number of central pauses and run-on lines with the production of marlowe's tamberlane in fifteen eighty seven blank verse disclosed its tremendous possibilities here first we discover an appreciation for the harmony and value of well-woven words and henceforward the path of progress is direct and visible the lift in imagination inspired by the stirring events and great stories of danger and discovery of elizabethan days to the creation of glowing forms and gorgeous scenes naturally had its effect on choice of phrase and development of style the influence of that master of word music edmund spencer on all poetic composition must have been very great it was however under the hands of shakespeare himself a lyricist of the highest powers that blank verse attained its greatest utility and development capable of expressing the delicate beauty of a flower the most gentle and the most unruly of emotions the sadness of the death scene the splendid pageantry of state and arms running smoothly on like the soft music of flowing water or thundering like the reverberating cannon on the field of death these powers were not attained all at once here and there in the earlier plays and passages of different lengths the growing master is revealed but in the early plays of the first period the dramatist is more or less bound by a certain rigidity of line due to a regularity of rhyme and metre obviously the tremendous difficulty imposed by rhyme and metre running in almost perfect regularity and the monotonous and cramped effect which these characteristics produce must give rise to an impulse towards a metre of a less mechanical but not necessarily less musical kind one more in keeping with the naturally uneven progress and outfolding of thought and emotion one might expect to find that rhyme the principal impediment in composition would first diminish and tend to disappear and so we find it in the first period of shakespeare in the earliest of the plays love's labours lost there are one thousand twenty eight fully rhymed lines to five hundred and seventy nine blank ones about one to point five eight and in richard the third the last play of the period there are only a hundred and seventy rhyme lines to three thousand three hundred and seventy four blank ones or about one to twenty the first period however does not actually show a gradual diminution in the number of rhymes in each succeeding play though it well shows the general tendency in richard the second which precedes richard the third rhyme is employed greatly five hundred and thirty seven lines to two thousand one hundred and seven blank but never again in the works of shakespeare is it used so much and in the winter's tale the last play of all it disappears entirely having arrived at the tendency to rid the line of the impediment of rhyme the poet was more at liberty to indulge in other metrical devices among the first of which we may notice the double endings these at first are rare love's labours lost containing only nine but they increase in number as we go on with some variations till richard the third which ends the first period and contains five hundred and seventy at the same time with the consciousness that the termination of each line with an emphatic syllable was as awkward as the rhyming which had necessitated it the poet developed the habit of ending some lines with a monosyllabic unemphatic word which really belonged to the next line and had to be more or less read with it 
which else would put you to your fortune and the hazard of much blood i would dissemble with my nature where my fortunes and my friends at stake required i should do so in honour coriolanus three two page one twenty nine endings so used such as and and where are of two kinds those on which the voice can dwell in reading as where and those which we are bound in pronunciation as well as sense to run like and into the following line and is a weak ending where is a light ending light and weak endings are not an early device of shakespeare's in the whole first period there are only seventeen light endings and two weak ones while the later play of antony and cleopatra alone contains seventy-one light and twenty-eight weak and the last plays of shakespeare show the employment of these devices in increasing proportion the general tendency in metre is towards freedom metrically then the early plays are very different from the late they contain as a rule more rhyme and more doggerel more alternates and more sonnet metre but less double light and weak endings were none of this evidence regarded however and were there no external evidence available the plays of the first period would betray their early composition they are linked together in plot and in expression they are mainly lyrical in their character and they are chiefly concerned with the affairs of youth the first of them love's labours lost is evidently the work of a young man conversant with the works of his contemporaries experimenting with some of their styles and ridiculing others the play relies not so much on character as on fine or witty speech and situation it is partly based on the fundamental idea which underlies all the other early comedies that mistaken identity is the best source of fun it is full of romantic sentiment and chivalrous allusions it enters lightly into the cares and love affairs the recreations and the studies of young people and endows young men with a boyishness that is almost ridiculous it quizzes contemporary foppery mannerisms and affectations what plot it possesses is constructed on a symmetrical system which ends in every jack having his four appointed jill after some errors confusion and waiting different types of characters are distinguished by their different bearing language and affectation but various characters of the same type are very little differentiated by the possession of different intellectual endowments or psychological attributes such as we find in henry the fourth or the tempest noticeably too the play contains no pathos rough country play is brought on to the stage and old country games are mentioned historical accuracy is not regarded most of these characteristics come out generally the symmetrical plot and mistaken identity devices are employed again in the comedy of errors midsummer night's dream and two gentlemen as the sonneteering and other verse in love's labours lost verges on conceit so the blank verse in richard the second sometimes verges on ramps and bombast as the characters in the first play lack individualization so richard the third lacks relief and those further touches which would render him a possible character richard is an elementary villain as the men of the first play indulge in boyish exuberance so the women of the dream indulge in ungentle and unrefined threats and illusions more stratford life is brought into the plays and the sub substantial similarity between members of the different groups in love's labours lost is repeated in the errors the dream and the two gentlemen in the historical plays historical accuracy is not greatly considered and in richard the second the rhyme quibbles and weak lines are matched by inconsistencies in the play's central figure richard the third shakespeare shows the influence of his greatest dramatic contemporary marlowe still in spite of faults there is an undoubted lift as we go on pathos increases till the shadow afterwards disparate in the airs becomes the dark night of romeo there is an intermingling of themes partly combined as in the dream which become the plot and underplot of later plays the principle which is partly a consequence of tragedy and is afterwards followed in almost all the plays except the very late ones of causing the action to revolve around and depend upon one or two central figures of making character and not incident the source of the action begins to be followed in romeo and the two richards and the differentiation of characters so ably effected in all the later dramas 
particularly in caesar othello macbeth antony and the tempest may be said to have its first beginnings in one part of the dream in romeo and the two following plays there is an increasing command over materials displayed by the dramatist and an increasing insight into character and mind the interest which commenced with satirizing contemporary fashions extends to the handling of political themes and the teaching of political lessons henry the sixth is a weak but virtuous king without resource whose ineptitude brought disaster on england richard the third is a strong resourceful king without virtue who brought on calamity through his false lust for power and his oppression richard the second is a weak mean and vacillating king who compassed his own ruin and harmed his country through his changefulness and unwise favoritism the difficulties and questions of the elizabethan political world seem to be reflected in the historical plays and suggest that shakespeare took a great interest in the affairs of the state the first period is the lyrical period also the poet's imagination calling up a thousand glorious forms of physical and material beauty in the poems becomes wrapped in romeo and the two gentlemen in the ecstatic environment of youthful love as, I, as i have said elsewhere of romeo a rapturous passion expressed in a perfect lyricism and reckless of all on earth that did not lend it glory and add to its greatness sweeps through and pervades the play and even in this early period shakespeare began to turn his attention to the tales of the italian novelist who were afterwards in his maturity to provide him with plots which his genius rendered immortal the poems venus and lucrece are the work of a student as much as of the keen observer of nature they are polished with the exquisite refinement which a young author always aims at they disclose a man who revels in the splendid beauty of the earth one to whom the fairness of man and woman is a delight who takes nature in the gross accepts it all and lives enchanted in the external fairness which it displays the first period shows shakespeare to have been a man of wide reading he had read old plays plaudus plutarch ovid montemayor florio lily sidney chaucer lord bonaire's uh, monday brook rich lodge marlowe daniel hollinshed stowe and the bible all of these authors and books he used in the composition of his plays shakespeare's position among his contemporaries was assured from the first there is only one dissentient voice which sounds in the chorus of praise which welcomed the rise of shakespeare and that is green's in the microcosmos of john davies of hereford sixteen o three we learn of shakespeare and richard burbage that they had wit courage good shape and good parts and that they were generous in mind and mood spencer in his colin cloud is considered to refer to shakespeare in his lines on edion a gentler shepherd may nowhere be found whose muse full of high thoughts invention doth like himself heroically sound weaver wrote an enthusiastic sonnet in praise of him in eight fifteen ninety five Mary's lauded him in fifteen ninety eight and many of his contemporaries decker marston drayton southwell etc alluded to his works imitated them or borrowed phrases from them as for the dissentient voice of green his publisher chettle made amends for its discordant note for he subsequently expressed his sorrow for the publication of green's attack and lauded its victim and reported his good fame and high repute the greatest tribute of all to shakespeare however is the return from parnassus part one sixteen hundred which at so early a date sets him supreme above all other poets end of chapter four Chapter Five Shakespeare Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Shakespeare Life and Work by F. J. Furnival and John Monroe. Chapter Five The Second Period. King John this play of pathos and patriotism is linked to richard the third in period one by its subject and treatment it reflects the political troubles of elizabethan days the play shows the efforts of france to win england for prince arthur how prince's policy is subject to commodity and the necessity of national union 
against foreign interference we see france and austria in battle with england before angiers each party claims victory and the citizens allegiance the citizens decide to await final results before submitting to either party and when the angry powers are about to combine their forces against them they propose amity and a marriage between blanche niece to england and the dauphin louis the cause of arthur and constance his mother is forgotten the marriage is arranged john gives provinces to the wedded pair and the late rivals enter angiers in amity constance hears of this and is smitten with grief and rage she reproaches and upbraids the friends who have betrayed her to them all enters pandolf the pope's legate he excommunicates john for his defiance france may no longer befriend england and in spite of the entreaties of blanche france withdraws from alliance battle follows england is triumphant austria slain arthur captured john sends arthur to england with hubert whom he has incited to kill the boy and directs the bastard falcon bridge to get money from the abbots john then leaves for england hubert when he goes to kill arthur is won to pity by the boy's pathetic appeals and lets him live but tells john he is dead the nobles have wind of john's treachery and demand the boy john repents the deed he learns that arthur is living and sends this news to win back the rebellious nobles but the boy driven to despair has by then jumped from the castle walls and died the nobles find his body and in anger they join the dauphin who has arrived in england to fight for the realm for himself a strange unrest prevails in the land rumours are current john sees resistance is hopeless in desperation he resigns his crown to rome and receives it back again rome no longer supports the dauphin's claims and bids him withdraw he refuses the bastard goes blustering to him about john's power but the dauphin is for battle fortune is against france his supplies are lost he compromises and withdraws while john the coward dies at swinston abbey the finest characters in the play are constance and the bastard whose blunt jocularity wins us to him the merchant of venice the merchant of venice takes us to the pile-built city of the adriatic whose streets are canals and whose palaces are grand with marble here we find the moneyless young bassanio anxious to marry a beautiful rich girl of belmont portia his wealthy merchant friend antonio hasn't ready cash enough to fit him out for his venture but borrows three thousand ducats for him from the jew shylock who hates him on condition that if the loan is not repaid in three months shylock may cut a pound of flesh from antonio's body where he will with this money bassanio goes to portia and is accepted as a lover but she has two other lovers the prince of morocco and the prince of aragon and by her father's will she is to marry the man who chooses that casket of three one gold one silver and one lead which contains her portrait the princes choose the wrong gold and silver ones bassanio the right lead one and in a beautiful speech portia gives herself to him meantime bassanio's friend gratiano has run off with shylock's pretty daughter jessica and a lot of her father's jewels and money then comes news to bassanio and portia on their wedding day that antonio has failed to pay the three thousand ducats in due time and that shylock claims his pound of flesh portia at once lets her husband go to antonio and she sends to a learned lawyer friend for books and dress and starts for venice with her maid nerissa shylock's claim comes before the duke and magnificos of venice and portia as a young barrister with nerissa as her clerk appears as counsel for antonio she offers shylock thrice the sum he claims she appeals to him for mercy in most moving words and when all is vain and he insists on his pound of flesh she turns on him and shows he has incurred the penalty of death and the forfeiture of his goods by plotting against antonio's life the duke lets him live on his giving half his fortune to lorenzo and jessica at once and the whole after his death the after lovely moonlight scene at belmont and the amusing one on portia's revealing her disguise 
we have not space to dwell on but in the merchant the first full shakespeare is seen the taming of the shrew in the taming of the shrew we are first in england where a lord finds a warwickshire tinker dead drunk and plays him the practical joke of having him put to bed in the best room and when he wakes getting the servants to persuade him that he's a lord dress him up as one and bring him as his lady a young page in a woman's smart attire then he agrees to see and hear a play and the scene of this is padua in italy and a country house near baptista has a gentle young daughter bianca whom three lovers want to wed lucentio old gremio and hortensio and a fiery elder daughter kate the shrew and he won't let bianca marry till kate is cleared off so hortensio gets his strong rough and ready friend petruchio to undertake to marry the rich handsome temporary kate in a clever and most amusing off-hand way he pooh-poohs her rudeness keeps her waiting in the church for her wedding knocks down the parson carries her off sword in hand instead of taking her to the marriage feast puts her on a wretched horse which tumbles her in the mud and falls on her and when they get to his house he throws away her food and her new dressing cap under the pretense that they are not fit for her he makes her say that the sun is the moon and an old man is a virgin just as he tells her and when she is regularly tamed he takes her back to her father's meantime hortensio has got rid of his rivals and wedded bianca while lucentio has married a widow the other married men chaff petrocchio about his shrewish wife he bets them a hundred crowns apiece that his kate is more obedient than their wives this he triumphantly proves and makes her give an eloquent exhortation to the other wives on the duty of obeying their husbands one henry the fourth the first part of henry the fourth is a mixture of richest shakespearean comedy with the finer shakespearean history the play opens in about fourteen o two henry now old is thinking of pilgrimage to jerusalem when news comes of mortimer's capture by owen glendower at the same time the fiery hotspur son to northumberland was victorious against the scots and had taken many prisoners these hotspur wished to withhold from the king praying for the ransom of mortimer which was refused stung by his treatment hotspur revolted burst into torrents of threats and with york worcester and his father joined the welsh and scotch rebels we see the revolted leaders dividing up england before they have won her and we behold their alliance nearly smashed by the furious scorn of hotspur against the credulity and superstition of the infuriated glendower the king envies northumberland his able son hotspur his own son hal indulges in dissolute revels with falstaff and his fellow rogues in london the fun of the immortal robbery at gad's hill of the scenes in the boar's head in east cheap of the lies boasts subterfuges and escapades of falstaff cannot be done justice to here hal comes under his father's noble remonstrance and promises better things still he gives falstaff a charge of foot a charge which the old ruffian wrongs and betrays prince john and westmoreland march against the rebel camp where all goes wrong northumberland falls ill glendower is held by prophecies worcester's horse is tired and part of vernon's has not arrived when the king's forces approach some of the rebels are for caution and delay hotspur is mad for battle the king's offer of clemency is thrust aside and the rival forces meet at shrewsbury douglas kills blunt and is put to flight by prince hal who has sworn to vanquish hotspur and when they meet slays him falstaff feigns death when douglas attacks him and claims to have killed hotspur after hal had left him fallen worcester and vernon are captured and executed the king is wounded the royal forces are triumphant and rebellion is quelled the play continues the story of bolingbroke whom we saw in richard the second it is full of splendid figures perfectly drawn and gives us the full blast of shakespeare's genius in his maturity making the culmination of his power in comedy and humour to henry the fourth the second part of henry the fourth continues the story of the first part but in it pathos increases humour is less gay laughter dies after shrewsbury rumour is busy old northumberland 
hears the rebellion is victorious but speedily learns of its disaster still york bardolph hastings and mowbray are in league against the king their success depends on the assistance of northumberland and the division of the royal forces against france and glendower lady percy and his wife urge northumberland not to aid the rebels till he sees how fortune turns glendower dies the old king failing in health sends westmoreland and john of lancaster against the revolted lords prince hal is still playing the fool with the time with falstaff the fat rogue gets into scrapes with the lord chief justice and mistress quickly and escapes through his invincible humour impudence and rascality we see him in his old tavern bussing dal tiersheet and abusing prince hal he is sent off to the wars and told to get troops on his way in gloucester he meets his old friend shallow whom he cheats and ridicules and there he gathers his army of pitiful broken beggars the rebels are met at galtree by westmoreland who after a good deal of artful and deceptive haranguing induces them to cite their grievances and disband their armies they are then treacherously seized and executed falstaff swaggers over his capture of colville who had quietly delivered himself up the king meanwhile is ill in london afflicted in conscience and perpetually worried over the fate of england shortly to be left to his dissolute hal he awakes one day to find the crown stolen from his pillow hal has taken it the poor dying king father admonishes his repentant son in loving kingly words urges him to nobler ways and gives him counsel for his future duties news comes to falstaff that the king is dead how his friend is king all things are his he posts to london with shallow eager for his new greatness but times have changed how the wild is now sober and kingly he turns from the dissolute rascal to the wise advisers of his departed father falstaff is crushed the play ends on april nine fourteen thirteen henry v the patriotic feeling which we saw in the earlier histories rises to its greatest pitch in henry v here we have the further story of how the archbishop of canterbury and the bishop of ely are perturbed about a bill which would decrease their power and revenues henry has claimed french provinces as his canterbury explains to him that salic law does not debar his claim to the french crown and takes all moral responsibility for the war which henry proposes against france by this means staving off the bill to henry's claim the dauphin sends a derisive reply and a present of tennis balls henry makes elaborate preparations for war france has found three traitors in england cambridge scroop and gray who will assist him nym and pistol have quarrelled over nell quickly and pistol has won and wedded her there is much mock fury bluster and rant between the rivals old falstaff dies as ludicrously as he has lived execrating sack and women pistol and his confederates are off to the french wars the king has discovered the traitors they unsuspecting his discovery urge him to punish a poor offender he proclaims their guilt and sends them to execution meantime the french not without trepidation prepare for hostilities the english land at harfleur and besiege the city pistol and his friends are driven to the fight by fluellen the welshman who has an argument on military matters with the irish macmorris harfleur yields the french are startled by the english progress and stung into action by shame they organize their forces and send to henry asking submission the english army is then spent and wasted sickness has claimed many victims only a remnant remains of the great host but henry sends back a dignified defiance weak as he is he will not seek battle but as he is he will not shun it he marches towards calais but is barred at agincourt the french gay and splendid trappings are overconfident and play dice the english rest the result of agincourt needs no telling the army of france was conquered and ten thousand soldiers slain we hear more meanwhile of the falstaff gang bardolph has stolen a pax and in spite of pistols beseeching fluellen is hanged the king disguised meets pistol in camp at night and hears the latter boast that he will knock fluellen's leak about his head 
the king also unrecognized disputes with a soldier williams and exchanges gloves in challenge pistol captures a terrified frenchman he is met by fluellen chastised and forced to eat the leek he despises the king gives fluellen williams's glove and the welshman has his ears boxed whereupon the king intervenes williams's fault is shown he is forgiven and rewarded burgundy brings the rival kings together in conference france allows england's claim henry woos fair catherine who has been learning english and wins her the play ends with promise of better things of peace between the two neighbor nations but the actual sequel was far from bright the able son that henry expected from his marriage turned out to be the weak henry the sixth whose history we have already discussed and whose incapacity was the cause of long turmoil and terrible wars the merry wives of windsor queen elizabeth says tradition was so amused by sir john falstaff that she bade shakespeare show him in love and so the poet wrote his merry wives of windsor in a fortnight he made the fat knight pretend to be in love with the wives of two windsor townsmen mrs alice ford who had a jealous husband and mrs george page who had a sensible one each gets a love letter from falstaff declaring that he loves her only and when mrs ford shows mrs page her letter they find both are the same and they resolve to play him a trick so mrs ford invites falstaff to her house next morning when falstaff goes mrs page rushes in and declares ford is coming so they huddle falstaff into a clothes basket cover him up with dirty clothes and their men carry him off to the thames and shy him into it then mrs ford gets him to visit her again and when her husband is again coming the wives dress the old knight up as the witch of brentford and ford thrashes him well with his stick they explain their fun to ford and then both husbands and wives play falstaff a third trick they put a stag's head on him in windsor park and get children dressed as fairies to pinch him and burn him and he confesses that he's been made an ass an amusing underplot turns on the page's daughter sweet anne page of seventeen who has three lovers one a silly country gentleman master slender whom shakespeare quizzes delightfully and whom her father wants her to marry two a hot-tempered french doctor cailly whom her mother wants her to marry and three a handsome well-born spendthrift master fenton who smells april and may and whom anne means to marry needless to say that taking advantage of the fairies seen in the park anne does go off with fenton and wed him while slender and cailly carry off instead of anne two boys dress by her in girls clothes of the respective colours that page and his wife severally told their candidates to choose the whole comedy is full of fun much ado about nothing the scene of much ado about nothing is messina in sicily its governor leonato has a gentle daughter hero and a brilliant witty niece beatrice to them come two young officers from the war benedict of padua and claudio of florence as soon as beatrice sees benedict she attacks and chaffs him and they keep up a war of words all through the play claudio falls in love with hero and gets a friendly prince of aragon to woo her for him they then make a plan to persuade benedict and beatrice to fall in love with one another by letting each overhear a talk in which each is said to be dying for the other though neither will say a word to show it this succeeds meantime don john the prince of aragon's brother just to make mischief arranges that his man borachio shall talk to hero's maid at night out of her window in the hearing of witnesses as if she were hero herself and on the strength of her doing this claudio accuses hero of incontinence in the middle of her intended wedding and the marriage is stopped hero is declared dead from grief and is mourned beatrice full of generous indignation insists on benedict's challenging claudio which he does but through borachio when drunk repeating the treachery of don john and himself hero's innocence is made known claudio repents is forgiven and weds her and beatrice agrees to marry benedict borachio's confession is overheard by a delightfully and absurdly comic watchman dogberry whose charge to his comrades and whose examination of their prisoners is great fun 
beatrice's spars with benedick are brilliant in their repartee and wit as you like it sixteen hundred the most charming of shakespeare's comedies takes us back nominally to france the forest of ardan but really to a robin hood like fancy land which lions and serpents haunt and where wedding frocks and heathen goddesses can be had out of woods at an hour's notice a younger brother frederick has usurped the dominions of his elder brother the duke who lives in exile in the forest with a few friends but his daughter rosalind stays at court with the usurper's daughter celia who loves her to a wrestling there comes young orlando whom his elder brother oliver has treated badly and whom he has urged a trained wrestler to kill but instead orlando throws and kills the wrestler and rosalind falls in love with him and gives him her chain the usurper banishes her and his daughter celia leaves him and goes with rosalind who dresses as a man and the fool touchstone to her father's forest there she meets orlando and seeing he is in love tells him to play lover to her though she seems a man and the fun she has with him is altogether delightful at last she promises to produce his real rosalind and his bad brother oliver having been rescued from death by orlando repents as and is accepted by celia rosalind appears in her wedding frock she and celia wed orlando and oliver and all ends happily the genial fool touchstone who makes great fun weds his country wench audrey and phoebe a shepherdess who fell in love with rosalind when posing as a man and scorned the loving corin marries him too when she finds rosalind is a woman a melancholy man jaques a friend of the duke's is well snubbed by rosalind for being out of sorts with all the world and he ultimately goes to the religious folk whom the usurper frederick has joined after repenting and giving up his duchy to its rightful owner rosalind's father twelfth night takes us to illyria on the coast of the adriatic sea where we find a music-loving duke orsino in love with a rich countess olivia who will have nothing to do with him as she is full of sorrow at the death of her brother to orsino comes as a page cesario a sweet unselfish girl viola who has been shipwrecked on the coast and fears that her brother sebastian who is exactly like her has been drowned she falls desperately in love with the duke who sends her as his page-boy to make love to olivia for him and the result is that olivia falls in love with the seeming man cesario viola now olivia has a sharp-witted little waiting woman maria and a noisy drunken uncle sir toby belch who plays on a delightfully absurd sir andrew aguchi to make love to olivia and because olivia's consequential steward malvolio reproves sir toby for his noisy drinking bouts maria devises a most amusing plan for making malvolio believe that olivia is in love with him and when he acts on this belief they declare he is mad and they have him locked up as sir toby thinks that viola is a lover of olivia's he persuades the cowardly sir andrew to send her as cesario a ridiculous challenge viola is afraid of sir andrew and he is afraid of her sir toby urges them both on and their preparations for the duel are most absurd but it is interrupted by the entrance of the captain of the ship who rescued sebastian and who mistakes his sister viola in boy's dress for him olivia then appears also mistakes sebastian for viola and shows her love for him and at once troth plights herself to him the duke finding he can't have olivia makes up his mind to marry viola malvolio is set free and maria is to be lady belch sir andrew must shift for himself all's well that ends well takes us to france and tuscany and has as its unpleasant subject the wooing of an unworthy man of noble birth by the far higher natured orphan daughter of a learned physician but we all know that the gusts of love blow where they list and we often see in life the better wedded to the worse helena has been long in the household of the countess of rousillon and adores her son bertrand with his arched brows his hawking eye his curls he is to go to the french court with an attendant a bragging 
cowardly fool paroles the french king has a deadly disease fistula which his doctors cannot cure but helena has a recipe of her dead father's for it and with it heals the king who promises to give her in reward the hand of any noble of his court whom she may choose she selects bertram he at first refuses but then accepts her in fear of the king's threats though he tells his man that he'll not bed her but will send her home he does so and goes to the war writing to his wife that she is not to call him husband till she can get his ring from his finger and show him a child begotten by him on her which will be never at the war the cowardice of this bragging fool paroles is brilliantly exposed and he bertram tries to seduce a girl diana the daughter of the widow with whom helena who has followed her husband lodges she gets diana to consent in appearance to bertram and then at night takes her place in bed with him and gives him the ring which the king had before given her in exchange for his ring before the king and his court this ruse is explained the rings are identified and then bertram at last declares that he'll love his wife dearly ever ever dearly space fails to do justice to the countess her friend le Feu, and the other characters of the play sonnets the sonnets are a series of one hundred and fifty four poems first published with a mysterious dedication by thomas thorpe in sixteen o nine they are addressed to a great extent to the unknown master mistress of the poet's passion and are concerned with his intrigue with a dark married woman who forsook him for his friend they are full of enigmas and pitfalls for the critic the sonnets are unequal in merit composed at long intervals and their order has been often questioned they followed a prevailing literary fashion sonnet sequences were then the vogue but these transcend all other compositions of their kind by their music and refinement the exquisite aesthetic sense of the artist who wrote them and the depth of his insight into life and emotion criticism varies widely as to their import and the identity of the characters concerned but all criticism unites in praising their ethereal delicacy and charm and the student may well be satisfied with that and let the problems go in any case the sonnets seem to show the poet's heart troubled they fittingly conclude the second period where laughter has gradually diminished and pathos has gradually increased and prepare us for the dark third period with its storm darkness and death review of the second period this is the sweet and joyful time of shakespeare linked by thought motive and theme with the past and future redolent of the pure breath of the green fields and of flowers lit by a warm sunshine of gladness resonant with the strong exultant rhetoric of splendid patriotism and martial achievement ringing with a chorus of laughter that sounds and re-echoes like a peal of bells of different metals cast in different moulds the reverse creeps in for contrast clouds come over the sun there's sorrow there's pathos and there's sin no laughter without sadness somewhere kings may be cowards and brave men may be fools the innocent may suffer the guilty may go unpunished and even find good fortune but virtue nevertheless shall have its reward and triumph the wrong shall disappear before the forces of good the laws of love shall be followed and devotion shall not go unrewarded what a splendid and all-perceiving man this shakespeare of the second period including in his comprehensive vision the manifold pursuits of mankind so many different phases of life and types of character so full of interest and power kindly and generous friendly and sympathetic impressed with the soundness beauty and admirability of man what a variety of forms pass before us as we watch the progression of the plays there's john the selfish coward king from whom still good might proceed henry the fourth a pathetic figure strong-willed and able touched in conscience and failing in health not a little disturbed about the past but more fearful for the future longing for peace and quiet 
but ready in an instant to don his armor and take up the sword to hold for himself and his the england he loved so well henry v wild and wilful in his youth falstaff's friend his father's daily sorrow and yet springing into a new life on duty's call wise self-reliant ambitious brave pious the hero of shakespeare's manhood hotspur's vanquisher england's lion conqueror of agincourt catherine's wooer a noble and resolute man then follows the strong and venerable king of all's well distinguished by the royal attributes of gratitude and virtue above the artificial distinctions of rank one who loves a man as a man there are battles sieges parleys treaties duels quarrels threats insults plots treachery rebellions executions and murders the old political lessons which were taught in the first period are reiterated in this henry the fourth advises his son that foreign wars unite a nation and henry v acts on that policy the questions of elizabeth's sovereignty her right to the crown are reflected in john and in henry the fourth as are the elizabethan necessity of preventing foreign intervention in national politics and the principle that vexatious controversy concerning the right to rule might be and was less important than the duty of ruling strongly wisely and well throughout is the plea for national unity throughout is the exaltation of national strength pride of england love of its green fields and its sea-bound shores rejoicing in its conquests faith in its power and hope for its future greater characterization distinguishes this second period from the first mercutio was a conspicuous and well-drawn figure in romeo but how much more well-drawn is hotspur both indeed are the embodiment of fiery impetuosity and youthful energy but there is no satire of life in hotspur he can become furious and wrathfully indignant is inconsiderate undiplomatic and rashly aggressive therein lie his failings and his end notice the knowledge of the celtic temperament shown by shakespeare in these plays glendower in one henry the fourth credulous superstitious passionate overruled in his contracts by prophecies gower in two henry the fourth fluellen in henry the fifth one who loves argument quotes precedent forgets names likes literature and is brave and hardy and sir hugh evans in the merry wives a most vehement man is addicted to being melancholies has collars and trembling of mind indulges in a duel feels like crying at the rendezvous and then falls into singing an old song about fragrant posies and madrigals introducing bits from a metrical rendering of the one hundred and thirty seventh psalm the dark and terrible side of the celtic nature is not yet dwelt upon lear and macbeth are yet to be but the laughter of falstaff of benedict and beatrice the bibulous refrains and witticisms of sir toby belch the humour of touchstone the merriment of mistress ford and mistress page are too real for their coming yet a while there is a lift in the women characters the figures of constance and eleanor and john presage the better ones coming portia in the merchant is the beginning of that succession of beautiful types of splendid womanhood whose sufferings devotion sacrifice struggles for their loved ones and pathetic appeal with their beauty and their purity against fate are a legacy to the men of all time hermia and helena have gone by the memory of stratford girls and stratford ways seems to have faded before the acquaintance of the strong but gentle and refined women whom the poet must have met portia is endowed with all the great virtues of womanhood sympathetic accomplished faithful she attempts to awaken in shylock a generous instinct which he does not possess before condemning him to the rigours of the law to which he appeals she tries to arouse in him a pity for the sufferings of that humanity with which he claims to be kin she precedes helena of all's well ophelia isabella desdemona and cordelia hero of much ado and helena introduce the patient suffering type who strive against terrible odds and are wronged but who through all in the face of death in its very clutches retain their gentleness and their nobility and triumph even when they deliver up their lives over those who do them wrong beatrice of much ado is able like portia but has a touch of kate the shrew 
she and benedict refer back to byron and roslin of love's labours lost her repartee is as swift as falstaff's her humour rich her outlook in spite of her scorn happy and sound she is not naturally submissive to man as the types which follow her but stands as his mate and equal willing to help the wronged and the afflicted the ready humour she advances the ability she strikes us as possessing come out again in the maria of twelfth night where the whole of the comedy with the conceited puritan malvolio depends upon her plot and actions but beatrice stands above maria as the woman with accomplishments has more genuine affection more pity and more knowledge of life the female figures of as you like it that sweet pastoral comedy set in such environment as the ideal folk of the fairy tales are themselves of a more ideal cast who is not familiar with the figures of rosalind and celia wandering wearily with their devoted touchstone through the wild wonderful ways of a strange forest where lovelorn shepherds like the daemon of virgil's eclogue lamenting for his nysa tell the story of their love sorrow in metrical cadences where a duke and his faithful following like old robin hood and his merry men pass their time as the birds under the open sky and fleet the time carelessly as they did in the golden world in this the gayest of the comedies the pathos is diminished but in the stories of orlando and rosalind it is there all the same the clash of arms the contention of nations the sounding rhetoric of warriors and statesmen the rough wit of falstaff and toby belch even the merry raillery of beatrice and benedict and the buffoonery of dogberry and his men all these things are hushed and forgotten we are in an enchanted land impossible maybe but glad and joyful free from the court troubles and the conventions of elizabethan life and reminiscent of the green glades of stratford in all's well the sweet time comes to its close for the gallant orlando the manly benedict we have the ungallant and unmanly bertram blood proud and unfaithful and the vicious paroles whose nauseating personality is felt throughout the play here too we have in the words of the clown and paroles the inception of that reference to and disgust at the carnal side of man taken up in the third period seemingly with greater repugnance in hamlet antony measure for measure and troilus and cressida all sorts of men are shown us kings as we have mentioned above and princes statesmen and courtiers in the historical play soldiers and traders the rich citizen life is portrayed in the shrew and the merchant the lesser citizen life in the merry wives shylock drawn sympathetically and generously by shakespeare as compared with contemporary pictures of jews is like baptista in his thought for gold before his daughter for ba baptista would give his child for money petruchio and benedict are like the dashing merry fellows who haunted the stage the fencing school paul's walk and the ordinary henry the fourth shows us knighthood exalted and fallen the life of the tavern the adventures of the highway gives us immortal pictures of the rogues and cheats poins gadshill pito bardolph and pistol of the unscrupulous innkeeper mistress quickly of the common courtesan doll tearsheet of that eternal legacy of laughter to the world john falstaff knight villain soldier robber liar cheat and wit concerning whom no words can be adequate but his own here too we see the fussy old justice shallow with his colleague silence telling in the dotage of advancing years the foolish story of his would-be wayward youth mouldy shadow wart feeble and bull-calf recruits for his majesty's army rough rude men whose names alone bring a smile to our lips fang and snare sheriff's officers and beadles kinsmen of dogberry and his foolish watch in the merry wives some of the henry the fourth characters are seen again falstaff and his crew still more fallen the french doctor the welsh parson the blustering innkeeper the merry honest citizens wives windsor forest and hearn's oak henry the fifth shows us the mixing up of nationalities gower and fluellen of wales mcmorris of ireland jamie of scotland twelfth night shows us again a picture of fallen knighthood of women's ready wit of rewarded love of foolish puritanism and mocked conceit 
love between women is shown us in the rosalind and celia of as you like it love between men in the sonnets together with the drama of wrongful passion and the triumph of better impulses the links that connect this period with the first are many and interesting the historical plays like the previous ones abound in rhetoric the political lessons are continued the plea for life is carried on the magnificent lyrical outburst of romeo where the lovers bid their sad farewell as the lark commences its matutinal song and the stars fade as the red streaks of sunrise lace the eastern clouds finds an echo in the merchant when jessica so like juliet and lorenzo tell over again the story of their love seated on a bank on a moonlit night the starry expanse above them and the wind gently stealing through the trees marlowe's influence which was shown in richard the third comes out again in shylock and to the poet himself shakespeare alludes in as you like it dead shepherd now i find thy saw of might whoever loved that loved not at first sight for the reference to elizabeth in midsummer night's dream the imperial votarist dr furnival detects a second in the merchant of venice i want he says to call attention to shakespeare's compliment in the merchant of venice to the beauty and power of queen elizabeth's public speaking we've all long known of his first compliment to his queen as the fair vestal and the imperial votaress of midsummer night's dream two to page forty but so far as i know no one has hitherto called attention to his second compliment to elizabeth in bassanio's speech to portia after she has given herself and all that is hers to him in the merchant three to page ninety one madam you have bereft me of all words only my blood speaks to you in my veins and there is such confusion in my powers as after some oration fairly spoke by a beloved prince there doth appear among the buzzing pleased multitude where every something being blent together turns to a wild of nothing save of joy expressed and not expressed elizabeth's oratory is praised by contemporaries prince was applied to her as well as to men being used as equivalent to our sovereign and shakespeare plainly meant his english audience to understand that he spoke of the english queen whose speeches some of them had heard in like manner when he made lorenzo talk to jessica of the glory of the floor of heaven thick inlaid with patterns of bright gold shakespeare meant his audience to know that this was his own feeling about the starlit sky just as he meant them to realize that he was speaking of what he and some of them had seen in an english field when he made lorenzo ask jessica bred in the horseless venice of canals as if she had been an english country girl to note a wild and wanton herd or race of youthful and unhandled colts fetching mad bounds bellowing and neighing loud if they but hear perchance a trumpet sound or any air of music touch their ears you shall perceive them make a mutual stand their savage eyes turned to a modest gaze by the sweet power of music shakespeare's personality is of course in all his plays and his native land is in most of them the whole of the period is full of satires on contemporary fashions and allusions to contemporary affairs throughout from time to time we come upon reminiscences of stratford scenes and characters stories which were begun in period one are continued here the history of henry the fourth and the men who helped to lift him into power goes on rosalind and celia repeat in part the story of julia and sylvia in the two gentlemen the device of mistaken identity employed in the dream and the errors is used again in twelfth night the attention to italian models and tales which began in period one is carried further in period two and will advance yet in period three for the venus and lucrece we have the sugared sonnets shakespeare's love of music is shown in several of the plays and his love of animals and flowers in most the period is an advance in every way on all that has gone before in characterization in power in knowledge in the greater attention to contemporary characters in wit in wisdom in political insight in the use of contrast and pathos in the presentation of suffering in the higher types of men and women portrayed and correspondingly there is a great advance in those metrical developments which we showed to have begun in period one 
the proportion of double endings increases considerably in the first period shakespeare used only eight per cent in his verse in the second the rate increases to eleven point two per cent light and weak endings in period one are as rare as point one six two per cent in period two they are used in the proportion of point three five nine per cent the rhyme used diminishes in quantity the ratio between the rhyme and blank verse in the first period was as one to three point three in the second period it is only as one to ten point o four these results speak for themselves the first period alone made shakespeare famous the great figures of the second become commonplaces in literature and the name of shakespeare was revered and his works admired till praise became a habit and eulogy of his characters a matter of course meanwhile his contemporaries and successors did not hesitate to echo his words and borrow his ideas the sources he employed in this period are many and diversified he read and used old plays for king john the shrew henry the fourth and henry the fifth holland shed and hall provided him with historic particulars he had read the fairy queen of spencer lodge's rosalind harrington's translation of ariosto's orlando the gesta romanorum marlowe monday's translation of sylvain's orator giovanni's il pecorone in a translation probably the two lovers of pisa by straparola in tarleton's news out of purgatory the novels of bandello in translations riches of polonius g i ingenati an italian play painter probably wyatt and surrey and daniel's sonnets end of chapter five Chapter Six of Shakespeare, Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Shakespeare, Life and Work by F. J. Furnival and John Monroe. Chapter Six The Third Period. Julius Caesar it is far from the story of the sonnets to that of julius caesar we leave shakespeare's london and the tale of a man's heart for rome and the history of the struggle for the empire of the world yet in both sonnets and play there is friendship broken trust betrayed the play opens with caesar's triumph people throng the streets rejoicing caesar's glory is not wholly welcome the man is too powerful too ambitious brutus his friend is troubled cassius discovers it and leads the noble brutus to favour conspiracy against this colossus overshadowing the world caesar fears the lean cassius who sees through men he is offered the crown which he secretly wants and which he thrice refuses amid acclamations he acts before the people swoons is theatrical the conspiracy progresses cassius wins men in at brutus window is thrown a paper urging him to action there are strange portents the earth shakes there is thunder a line is seen in the capital the conspirators cassius casca decius cinna metellus cimber and trebonius call on brutus at night brutus is won henceforward his spirit dominates them through his nobility they fall cassius would slay antony who loved caesar but brutus decides otherwise and all agree caesar is old and superstitious vain and swayed by prophecies a dream of calpurnia's and the report of augurs stop him from going to the capital where the senators would give him the crown decius the conspirator disposes of caesar's scruples caesar goes artemidorus a sophist attempts to warn caesar of danger but caesar brushes him aside at the capital the conspirators beg freedom for publius cimber whom caesar refuses to liberate then all turn on him casca stabs him first the others follow and when brutus plunged his steel into the body of caesar who loved him caesar exclaimed in bitter reproach et tu brute 
and fell and died tumult ensued the god had fallen brutus allowed antony to come from his house whither he had fled in amazement and addressed the people after him a fatal error brutus quieted the people and won them antony showing them caesar's body inflamed them into uncontrollable fury against the conspirators they rushed hither and thither mad to burn to slay sinner the poet they killed only for his name octavius caesar had then arrived in rome the conspirators had fled and pitched their camp near sardis antony and octavius marched against brutus cassius and brutus had quarrelled and their cause was near wreck when they again became friends news comes that portia whose tender pleading with her husband brutus is the most beautiful thing in the play was dead and that the forces of antony were at philippi brutus to whom caesar's ghost had appeared marched to meet them against cassius advice and met disaster brutus in the battle gave too soon the word to advance cassius was killed titinius slew himself cato fell brutus fell on his sword and died octavius was triumphant the finest character in the play is brutus whose nobility wins all to him hamlet in hamlet we turn from the italy of caesar's day to the dark northern land of denmark the story of hamlet is a long one and we can only briefly review it the play opens on a winter's night at elsinore horatio hamlet's friend has come with others to see the ghost of hamlet's father which has before appeared to the sentries the ghost comes in most stately manner and when they try to hold it disappears we next see the king hamlet's uncle who has wedded his mother and been but lately crowned permitting laertes son of polonius the chamberlain to return to france whence he had come for the coronation hamlet is sad and world-weary he suspects already foul play to his dead father by his uncle he wishes death were easier he is shocked by his mother's marriage the king and queen are perplexed at hamlet's conduct horatio tells him of the ghost and he resolves to see it laertes warns his sister ophelia against hamlet's love which can be only a passing thing and his father first gives him a few old aphorisms as to his conduct abroad and then again warns ophelia who promises to reject hamlet's advances horatio hamlet and marcellus wait without elsinore at night the ghost comes it motions hamlet apart then he learns of his father's murder by his uncle and is urged to take revenge which he solemnly swears to do his friends find him them he binds by oaths to secrecy and says he may feign madness the super crafty polonius sets a spy on his son and ophelia tells him of hamlet's strange entry into her chamber sighing regarding her strangely his doublet unbraced his stockings down polonius thinks this ecstasy of love is the cause of hamlet's strangeness tells the king and queen of his discovery and shows them hamlet's curious love-letter to his daughter the king sends for rosencrantz and guildenstern to spy on hamlet and he and polonius arrange to hide behind an heiress while hamlet meets ophelia polonius meets hamlet and he jibes satirically at the old man yet seeming unsound in his mind likewise he treats rosencrantz and guildenstern who confess inability to sound him players arrive at elsinore hamlet who has not resolution to slay the king has a scheme to try him by a play hamlet meets ophelia while polonius and the king watch in hiding there hamlet adjures ophelia to go to a nunnery abuses women and expresses loathing at marriage birth and the time-honoured institution of men ophelia thinks him mad polonius and the king are more puzzled hamlet next gives the players good counsel on their art and arranges his play to which the whole court comes and which represents his father's murder the guilty king starts up in fear before the play ends and goes out the queen is affected and sends for hamlet to her chamber where the son scourges his mother with bitter remonstrance which renders the queen heartbroken polonius has secreted himself behind the heiress hamlet seeing a movement makes a thrust with his sword and kills him 
and afterwards secretes the body to him appears again his father's ghost to wed his blunted purpose and to it he prays for protection the king has decided to send hamlet to england with rosencrantz and guildenstern he is stricken in conscience and tries to pray but cannot hamlet discovers him kneeling and once more weakly puts off slaying him he tells hamlet afterwards he must go to england to whose king he has treacherously addressed letters for hamlet's murder ophelia's woes have now turned her reason we see her decked with flowers singing idle songs laertes hearing of his family's misfortunes arrives he demands his father in rebellious terms he sees his poor sister and is stirred to revenge hamlet has left for england has been captured by pirates on the way and having sent on his companions with letters for their death returns to elsinore where the king has inflamed laertes against him and promised a duel wherein laertes may poison his foil ophelia is drowned she is found floating on a stream wearing fantastic garlands hamlet comes on the grave-diggers making her grave where he moralizes over the skull of yorick the jester the funeral cortege arrives laertes in wordy grief leaps into his sister's grave hamlet leaps in too and rants there is a struggle and the two are separated the duel is arranged the king has provided two cups of wine one poisoned and he will drink to hamlet if he scores first hit the queen takes up the poison cup and drinks in a scuffle the duellers change rapiers and hamlet wounds laertes with his own poisoned weapon the queen dies laertes falls hamlet stabs the king and then dies through his poisoned wound giving the election to the crown to fortinbras of norway so all ends in death and hamlet has at last fulfilled his oath the play is the tragedy of a mind strong in imagination and overloaded with dismal thought but weak in resolution presented with a duty private and public to the execution of which it cannot rise though the natural and supernatural combine in incentive measure for measure in measure for measure we move to vienna and have again an unpleasant subject for a play the city is known as a morally lax one and young claudio has just got his sweetheart juliet with child the duke has for a time given up his power to a severe angelo whose doom is that claudio must die his saint-like sister isabella goes to angelo to plead for her brother's life and he who thought himself above temptation yields to it and promises that he'll save her brother if she'll give up her chastity to him she then visits claudio in prison and feels sure that he'll set death for himself before the sacrifice of her honour but he fears to die and pleads with her in some of the most eloquent words that shakespeare ever wrote to let him live she scorns him for his meanness and bids him perish the duke who knows what has passed comes in as a friar and arranges that isabella shall seem to consent to angelo and then substitute in his couch mariana the once betrothed of angelo whom he shamefully abandoned when she lost her fortune this is done but angelo decrees that claudio shall still be put to death before this can be done however the duke discloses himself resumes his power bids claudio wed juliet and angelo marry mariana while he himself claims isabel as his bride there is an underplot of loose immoral folk which may well be left out here troilus and cressida this play takes us to homer's troy and like measure for measure is a story of lust troilus the good soldier loves cressida whose despicable uncle pandarus goes between them and inflames one for the other cressida after affecting disdain for troilus in order the better to win him at last gives him her love this story is set in the larger one of the trojan war fought for paris's lust the greek leaders with sententious rhetoric discuss the war and ulysses shows that troy stands because of division among the greeks lesser men imitating the sullen achilles who holds himself apart hector challenges a grecian to single fight and the greeks select 
the most the boastful and blockish ajax so as to arouse envy in achilles the trojans discussed delivering up helen and ending the war but against this troilus strongly stands and the war goes on despite the prophetic ravings of cassandra achilles is asked to fight but refuses he is then slighted by all and lectured by ulysses much to the injury of his pride calchas cressida's father who has deserted troy for the greeks asks that antenor a prisoner be exchanged for his daughter the greeks agree and diomed is entrusted to return antenor to troy and bring back cressida diomed goes and in troy gives paris strong opinions about his idolized helen cressida and troilus have spent the night in pandrus's house cressida refuses to go but soon consents she has before sworn eternal fealty to troilus and repeats her oaths departing with a sleeve of troilus's for a keepsake diomed promises to govern his lust when cressida arrives she is kissed by all the chief greek except ulysses who detects the language of lust in her every gesture the much-mouthed combat ends in nothing hector feasts with the greeks and achilles boasts on the morrow to slay him but is afterwards withheld by a letter from polyxena whom he loves troilus is in the greek camp and goes with ulysses to watch at calchas tent where cressida rests thersites whose savage and scurrilous utterances full of satire and abominations form a fitting chorus throughout the play goes too there troilus's heart is wrung by cressida's amorous play with diomed and her giving his sleeve to the greek for a token which he says he'll wear in his helm lechery lechery says thersites still wars and lechery on the morrow hector goes to the field despite the entreaties of his kin cressida writes to troilus who destroys her letter afterwards he meets diomed in the field fights with him and has his horse captured which is sent to cressida hector kills patroclus achilles friend and at last achilles is roused to fight he goes to battle but behaves like a sneak and coward surrounds hector with his myrmidons and so overcomes him and ties his body at his horse's tail the play ends with the curse of troilus on pandarus the play is a heavy satire on the renowned heroes of antiquity the tender cressida of chaucer is debased into a mere wanton pandarus is a despicable clown othello in othello we turn to the city of canals and to cyprus in the blue mediterranean lust hatred and jealousy are our themes othello a splendid moor in the service of the signori has wed desdemona the daughter of senator brabantio she discerning the nobility beneath his dark skin and loving him for his manhood and the dangers he has passed iago the moor's ancient and his secret foe awakes brabantio at night and tells him in foul terms of his daughter's flight before the senate brabantio accuses othello of spells and witchcraft over his daughter othello in plain noble words tells the story of his love and desdemona simply and innocently tells how she was won brabantio professes resignation othello and his wife set off for cyprus for the turkish war iago goes too with his foolish dupe roderigo and cassio the moor's lieutenant othello and desdemona are parted at sea by storm but meet happily and affectionately at cyprus iago formulates his devilish plot to wreck the moor's love and life by insinuating lust on cassio's part for his wife he tries to excite cassio to amorous thoughts makes him drunk and incites him to attack roderigo an alarm rings othello enters iago professing to screen cassio vilifies him cassio is ignominiously dismissed and is broken-hearted iago arranges through his wife emilia desdemona's maid that cassio shall meet her mistress to plead for him to the moor and bringing othello by at that time makes exclamations of alarm arousing othello's suspicions this is the beginning of a long course of vile insinuation and foul lies which convinces the moor he is wronged iago gets from his wife a handkerchief that othello first gave to desdemona and swears to othello that she has given it to cassio when she pleads for the dismissed lieutenant othello demands the handkerchief it is missing his belief is more confirmed 
cassio gives the handkerchief to bianca his mistress having found it in his chamber iago chats to him quietly about bianca and othello hears his replies thinking he speaks of desdemona bianca enters in a temper and gives him the handkerchief back othello is now assured the hot fires of wrath and vengeance burn within him he strikes his fair wife in public though emilia swears desdemona is true othello pursues unrelentingly his revenge iago has led roderigo to attack cassio at night but he himself maims cassio and stabs roderigo dead into desdemona's bedchamber othello goes he kisses her he tells her death is near and in spite of her pleading he strangles her emilia comes with news that cassio has killed roderigo she learns othello's crime proclaims his wrong and cries for help iago and others enter emilia tells the true story of the handkerchief othello realizes his monstrous act and runs at iago who stabs emilia and escapes he is captured and returns with cassio he is wounded by othello who slays himself and falls on desdemona's body iago is sent off to punishment cassio is made governor macbeth from the bright south we travel to the gloomy north once more to scotland the play opens with three foul witches on a heath macbeth bellona's bridegroom has done valiant service against macdonald rebel to king duncan macbeth and banquo his fellow general are met by the witches with their weird spells macbeth is hailed as thane of gloms thane of cawdor and king banquo as greater than macbeth father of kings then the witches vanish immediately ross and angus meet the generals and proclaim that the king makes macbeth thane of cawdor one step in the prophecy is fulfilled macbeth is kindled to seek higher things he gives the king allegiance but writes to his wife of the supernatural and prophetic utterances which stir him macbeth is kind his wife would have him great would take the nearest way murder news comes that king duncan will rest with macbeth that night lady macbeth rises to a terrible pitch of evil resolution unsexes her woman's nature and prepares for duncan's death macbeth is conscience troubled only the tremendous resolution and daring of his wife nerve him to undertake the crime an invisible dagger dances before his eyes with the courage of desperation he enters the king's chamber where his wife has drugged the grooms and stabbed duncan he hears strange voices the terror of guilt is on him his hands are smeared with blood lady macbeth takes back the daggers macbeth has brought away lays them by the grooms and smears them with duncan's blood macduff on the morrow goes to call the king and returns screaming of horror the castle inmates rise in terror malcolm and donalbain the king's sons make their escape lady macbeth affects to swoon macbeth slays the grooms for the crime and is afterwards crowned at scone banquo suspects him macbeth would cheat him of the witch's promise that he should be father of kings and gets two murderers to waylay him and his son fleance macbeth is in mental torture and sends a third murderer to make sure banquo is killed fleance escapes at a feast which macbeth gives banquo's ghost sits in the king's chair at macbeth's repeated exhibitions of uncontrollable terror the feast is broken up duncan's sons are accused of killing him and fleance of killing banquo but the true murderer is soon known macbeth seeks knowledge from the witches three apparitions tell him to beware macduff the thane of fife that none of woman born shall harm him and that he shall never be conquered till burnham wood go to dunsinane duncan's son malcolm is in england and macduff goes there to win the help of seward whom while his wife and children and household are cruelly murdered by macbeth he and malcolm get soldiers and march north yearning for revenge lady macbeth has broken down is afraid of darkness walks by night and ever tries to wash from her hands the blood her eyes see on them the scotch are in arms against macbeth and join the english forces near burnham wood macbeth though desperate thinks himself safe and makes a bold show lady macbeth dies news comes that burnham wood moves towards dunsinane the soldiers are carrying boughs above their heads for screens 
in the battle against macbeth the king slays young seward and is faced by macduff who proves to have been prematurely born and therefore is accepted from the condition made by the apparition and he slays macbeth malcolm is king thus ends the story of an ambition which used all means for its accomplishment and entailed its own terrible nemesis king lear old lear decided to give up government and divide his realm between his three daughters goneril regan and cordelia first asking them which loved him most the first two gave profuse expressions of affection before which sham cordelia said nothing lear enraged divided his land between his two eldest daughters and gave cordelia nothing neglected as she was the young king of france took her for his wife and kent who had remonstrated with the rash old man was banished lear was to spend some time with goneril and some with regan his first goes to the former he has struck one of her men she is enraged and tells her servants to neglect him she storms at him herself rebukes abuses and threatens him and asks him to dismiss many men he begins to see his folly in giving up his land and injuring poor cordelia cursing this ungrateful daughter he turns to regan to whom goneril has sent before him kent whom he had banished joins him in disguise and serves him well his fool gives him loving and bitter jests on his folly all along kent goes before to regan at gloucester's castle and gets put in the stocks though gloucester protests here lear is treated worse than before is told to return to goneril and ask for pardon goneril enters and the sisters would deprive lear of all his men and so abuse him that the old man his reason failing goes to a wild heath in a tremendous storm with his fool kent follows and finds him the underplot is that edmund gloucester's bastard son by his cunning plots deceives his father that his legitimate son edgar would murder him and persuades edgar to fly to hiding he goes to the heath and lives there almost naked like an abraham man and calls himself poor tom king fool and kent meet him rumours of discord between albany and cornwall arise the french hearing of lear's wrongs have landed at dover and kent sends a messenger to tell all news lear has been raging bareheaded in the storm and talking idly with poor tom when gloucester in pity arrives and takes all the party to shelter thence lear his reason quite gone is carried towards dover gloucester is betrayed to cornwall by edmund cornwall puts out his eyes and in doing so is slain by a servant gloucester is then led to dover by edgar whom he does not know albany and regan with edmund have combined against the french though albany is indignant at the sister's conduct and these two are rivals for edmund's love lear is found mad dressed in fantastic weeds and flowers and is taken to cordelia who has him cared for goneril incites edmund to slay her husband albany and edgar warns albany of edmund's villainy in the battle edmund and albany are victorious lear and cordelia captured edgar and edmund fight and edmund is slain sending before he dies to stop his order for lear's and cordelia's death but cordelia by then is dead goneril poisons regan and stabs herself we see the poor old king heartbroken with his dead cordelia in his arms watching her cold lips for the motion which is theirs nevermore then he dies too antony and cleopatra this magnificent play shows us again the antony who pleaded for caesar but a fallen antony he is slave to the voluptuous cleopatra who holds him from duty he learns from rome that fulvia his wife is dead and that pompey has defied caesar and is in arms with a great effort he breaks from cleopatra and goes to rome where all discuss his debasement there he meets caesar a sort of friendship is arranged and antony weds caesar's noble sister octavia resolving to lead a worthier life but enobarbus his friend says nothing can hold him long from cleopatra and when a soothsayer bids him leave caesar in rome he wants his egyptian again 
antony and caesar meet pompey an agreement is made and all go to a feast where menus tempts pompey to murder his guests and so win empire a temptation which pompey dismisses then for a time all is well antony has promised fidelity to octavia cleopatra in egypt is lost without antony dreams of him and hears all news of him with jealous anger then antony in athens hears caesar is warring again on pompey has seized his friend lepidus and debased him antony gathers forces octavia goes to rome to sue for peace and arrived there learns that antony has fled cleopatra and made her absolute in egypt caesar goes against antony who fights him at sea for bravado in the fight when advantage is with him cleopatra foolishly turns her ships and flees antony follows caesar is then master refuses to consider antony's petitions and asks cleopatra to yield him up antony whips caesar's messenger collects his forces and prepares for battle challenging caesar to single fight caesar laughs in the battle antony wins but next day in the engagement he tells us cleopatra has ruined his chance and this time for ever she has disposed with caesar his men have joined caesar's and gone carousing with them he curses the woman he loves she leaves him in grief goes to a monument and sends word she is dead antony falls on his sword but does not die is carried to cleopatra and dies as she kisses him caesar sends to cleopatra promising kindness but intending as she knows to exhibit her in rome she is seized but has got asps from a peasant and applying them to her breast and arm she dies her women die too so ends antony having lost his greatness for the splendour and sensual revels of his passionate impulsive egyptian thinking that one of her tears rates all that is won and lost coriolanus this play gives us a picture of the struggle between the ligerian plebeians of rome and the sabine patricians their masters before the populace hungry with famine clamouring for innovations the patricians recede yet caius martius steps forward and bursts into vituperation of the frenzied people who hate him the volscians are at war with rome and martius victoriously commands the forces against them in his absence the populace are satisfied corn is distributed and tribunes are granted them who prove ignoble and unscrupulous martius now called coriolanus for his valour is received back with acclamations by his old foe the people and the error is made of electing him consul for this office he has to beg votes of the people and show his wounds he does so and is elected but the people's tribunes inflame the mob against him and then tell coriolanus of the mob's attitude he lashes the people with bitter words and the old hatred is reborn meantime the volscians are marching on rome to unite rome and so save it volumnia prevails on her son to bow his head again and face his accusers it was a fatal error his temper could not stand it to the evil reckless accusations of the tribunes he thunders his scorn and hatred of their baseness he is banished and joins the volscians rome is in paroxysms of fear who shall save it now volumnia with coriolanus's wife virgilia and his son and valeria go to him and after long battery take his stubborn heart rome is saved coriolanus turns towards antium but jealousy has rankled in the heart of alphidius the volscian and treachery goes before the roman to antium when he arrives at the city he is treacherously slain crying his indignation timon of athens in timon we turn from rome to athens timon a noble lavishly and foolishly squanders his money in feasts shows and presents he seeks to bind men to him by pandering to their basest tastes his land is sold his debt increases one of his creditors a senator demands his money and then bills flow in till flavius timon's faithful steward knows not what to do timon refuses to hear of his condition and then abuses flavius for not telling him timon will appeal to his friends the senators have already refused to help flaminius expecting a present sends back time as man with refusal lucius expecting a present too regrets he isn't just then furnished with money 
sempronius is offended at being troubled at all and then expresses annoyance that timon did not send to him first so all refuse and timon is done by his creditor's servants whom he drives from the house he then invites all his false friends to feast once more the feast is served in covered dishes and when the covers are removed the dishes are full of water which timon was imprecations throws at his guests he then leaves athens for ever cursing mankind meantime alcibiades has asked the senate for the life of a friend condemned for a foul crime and is refused he bursts into anger and is banished and goes to get men to march against athens timon repairs to the woods and digging for roots finds gold there he is visited by alcibiades and his army and mistresses by apimantus a cynic come to curse by a poet and painter greedy for gold and by flavius who touches his heart to all he gives gold and to all except flavius curses the senators in fear over alcibiades beseech him to return to athens he refuses and curses all the senators beg alcibiades to spare the city promising that the guilty against him shall die to this he consents then a poor soldier who has found timon's tomb arrives with his epitaph which alcibiades reads review of the third period let us now cast a glance over those plays of the third period which we have just detailed that third period opened in sixteen o one the year of the petted essex's rebellion against elizabeth and we see in julius caesar not only shakespeare's public lesson of political wisdom as in his early historical plays to his countrymen but also his private feeling of that ingratitude treachery of the closest friend of his hero which in his third period he so often repeated we see illustrated in the suicide of the misjudging yet noble brutus and the insanity and suicide of his equally noble wife the lesson of the third period that the generous are the victims of the designing and that for all misjudgment and crime comes death to the misjudger the criminal if brutus may be so called and the innocent woman whose life is bound up in his in hamlet we see the bright and happy life of the young prince darkened by the lust and ingratitude of his mother eclipsed by the revelation of his ungrateful uncle's foul murder of his father while on him more unfit than brutus for his task was laid the burden of revenge we see the many shirks from doing his duty of which hamlet was guilty and yet how at last and as it were under the pressure of that providence that shapes our ends rough hew them how we will the danish prince in his own death carried out the task his father set him and again proclaimed that for weakness misjudgment as well as crime death is the penalty on the wrongdoer while the sweet weak ophelia who loved him shared his fate we then turn to measure for measure and in this one of the so-called comedies of the period we have a moral of like kind preached in the way you have sinned in the same shall you be punished atonement you shall make not shirk and though this play was called a comedy we notice the strong contrast of its gloom of lust and filth with the bright health-giving outdoor air of all but the last of shakespeare's second-time comedies yet above this lust and filth rises radiant as a star the figure of the ensky and sainted isabella god's handmaiden who could not be unclean Troilus and Cressida comes next, with the bitter, foul mouth Thersites as its expounder and philosopher. The great early poem of the history of the Western world, the lifelong delight of a Gladstone, is stripped of all its romance, and the Trojan War is shown in its bitterest, vulgarest reality as a mere struggle for a harlot wife to gratify a cuckold husband's revenge. Everyone is mean, everyone acts from low motives ulysses is just a clever wire-puller ajax a bragging fool achilles a petty spiteful chief who doesn't even dare to meet his tired enemy alone hector prefers a childish notion of honour to right and patriotism and good sense cressida so beautiful in chaucer's picture is debased into a mere wanton no light of nobleness is on the play except in the short reception of hector by nestor in the grecian camp the end of the war is not given but cassandra's voice tells us it is at hand lust and selfishness still prevail and the noble misjudging hector has judgment here he's dead 
and at the murderer's horse's tail in beastly sort dragged through the shameful field othello comes next and we are allowed for a while but oh so short a one to dwell on the sweet picture of the hero's winning and wooing and wearing his beautiful bride but the treacherous trusted friend honest iago the devil in man's shape is soon at work with his suggestion to othello of that lust which overshadowed hamlet and measure for measure and chaos has come again the noble and generous moor is the easy victim of his honest friend all desdemona's beauty and touching though misjudging innocence are turned into evidences of her guilt and she the pure and guiltless lies stifled on her bridal bed by the husband who set his life upon her faith soon his own murderer's hand lets out his own life-blood and again the terrible third period lesson is enforced for misjudgment unreasoning jealousy crime death is the penalty no time for repentance is allowed the innocent must suffer with the guilty macbeth follows the powers of another world are called in to help forward the ruin of two human souls ready to fall for the first time shakespeare has unsexed the woman's nature he so reverenced and loved queen margaret of two and three henry the sixth is not wholly his and has made ambition turn to gall that mother's love with whose self-forgetfulness and pathos constance's heart-wrung utterances still fill our souls for the first time he has turned though here but for a while a woman to a demon the traitor couple murder their king and friend the act would they thought to all their nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom they jump the life to come yet as macbeth feared we still have judgment here and so they found it one they were no longer sin kept them apart nights they had no longer macbeth sleep no more you lack the season of all nature sleep all the perfumes of arabia will not sweeten this little hand days of sovereign sway they had not neither joy nor calm content better be with the dead whom we to gain our peace have sent to peace than on the torture of the mind to lie in restless ecstasy but judgment here death under the pangs of conscience for his wife death from Mac for macbeth in no play of the time is the lesson of the third period more directly preached than in macbeth the terrors and horrors of lear follow two women are here unsexed and far more terribly than in lady macbeth's case the ghoul-like lust and fiendish cruelty and ingratitude of goneril and regan render them the most repulsive figures in all shakespeare by their side stand edmund a second iago what a contrast to the noble bastard falconbridge and john and cornwall almost as bad in gratitude of daughters treachery of a son driving fathers to despair to madness and to death infidelity of a wife plotting her husband's death and poisoning her sister to gratify her own lust the heavens themselves joining in the wild storm of earthly passions and witchcraft lending itself to enhance their terrors but still there rises above the foul cauldron of vice the gracious figure of cordelia who cannot lie only when the avenger comes when judgment is given here she the innocent lies dead among the guilty antony and cleopatra comes next with its gorgeous eastern colour its most wonderful study of a woman that shakespeare ever made yet lust and orgies are its theme the ruin of the noble soul who so loved caesar and revenged him we saw how brilliantly he disproved brutus's mean estimate of him we heard the unstinted praise that his rival caesar's nephew gave him for his daring his generous sharing of all his soldiers hardships we saw him tear himself from the arms of the superb paramour who'd enthralled him and wed that piece of virtue in caesar's words that gem of women as he called her noble octavia and we hoped that his redemption was nigh but alas the lift was but that his fall might be the greater again he betook himself to the poison of cleopatra's charms and under them lost all that men value most judgment honour manliness the courage that was his boast and sank 
to a dishonored suicidal grave the senseless victim of his paramour's deceit while she from dread of vulgar taunts died theatrically vain and ease seeking to the last the gentlest death she could secure that of asps bites on her breast coriolanus follows the noble high-born warrior is ruined by class pride he cannot stoop to seek at the hands of its givers the honour that his noble mother has so longed for him the honour that his brilliant deeds of arms for them his fellow-citizens have won he was born to rule them not to beg of them and when in their quick fit of ingratitude at his scorn scorn almost as bitter as thersites they turn on him as they had done before from meaner motives on brutus the selfishness at the bottom of all aristocratic pride comes out coriolanus puts himself his own desire of revenge for personal wrong above his country and joins her foes her life is already in his grasp and he means to take it when the splendid figure of his mother the grand volumnia who loves honour and rome above herself kneels before him and wife and boy help him to rise to his own true height and forgive and not revenge think'st thou it honourable for a noble man still to remember wrongs a prelude to the coming fourth period but for his mistake comes judgment here coriolanus dies by vulsion hands his innocents are not involved with him they live on in rome lastly comes timon with its weakly generous misjudging hero giving his all to those whom he thought friends finding them all desert him in his hour of need and then withdrawing with curses on all mankind to get out of the sight of his fellow man i am misanthropus and hate mankind and so he ends who alive all living men did hate he too has judgment here the gloom of the play is relieved by no gracious female figure two harlots greedy for gold are the only women introduced and the faithful steward alone is true now look at the mass of evil of sacrifice of good to ill of triumph of the base over the noble that this third period represents admit gladly that over all the hell broth of murder lust treachery ingratitude and crime there rise the three radiant figures of isabella in her saintliness and purity cordelia in her truth and daughter's love volumnia in her devotion to honour and her country think too of the one gleam of happy coming bridal between isabella and the duke but look on the other side at caesar brutus and the noble portia dead hamlet and ophelia dead too likewise othello desdemona and emilia macbeth and his wife banquo macduff's wife and all his little ones lear cordelia and eilis gloucester besides regan goneril cornwall edmund hector's gory corpse anthony antony self-slain cleopatra too coriolanus murdered timon miserably dead think of the temper in which shakespeare held the scourge of the avenger in his hand in which he felt the baseness calumny and injustice of the world around him in which he saw as it were the heavens as iron above him and god as a blind and furious fate cutting men off in their sins involving the innocent with the guilty compare for a minute your memories of shakespeare's patriotic brilliant second period set the abounding the overflowing happy life of that against the bitterness the world weariness of this terrible third period and then decide for yourselves whether this change in shakespeare was one of artist only or as i believe one of man too and whether many of the sonnets do not help you to explain it with that hell of time through which their writer passed for if you were by my unkindness shaken as i by yours you've passed a hell of time sonnet a hundred and twenty line six then turn to the fourth period plays and note its change again of temper and of tone true that they deal with treachery ingratitude breach of family relations misjudgment weakness but where is the avenger here he is hardly seen true that cymbeline's queen in her guilt despairing dies the fool cloten is killed the young magmilius under the burden of his base father's accusation of the boy's noble mother hermione droops and dies the one innocent life is lost but in the main the god of forgiveness and reconciliation has taken the avenger's place repentance not vengeance is what he seeks and of all the plays death is not the end but life 
in three of them the happy bridal life of such sweet girls as shakespeare never before drew marina miranda perdita in one the renewed married life of his queens of wifehood and womanhood imogen and hermione in one the life of her who was to bring peace plenty love and truth to the england that with all its faults shakespeare loved so well you turn from the storm the gloom and the whirlwind of the third period and see in the fourth a great peacefulness of light a harmony of earth and heaven sweet fresh english country scenes and here too i see the change not of artist only but of man of the nature of shakespeare himself in his new life in his peaceful stratford home the passage from shakespeare's third period to his fourth always reminds me of the change in handel's israel in egypt from the magnificent series of the choruses of the plagues among them chief the gloom and darkness that might be felt in the terrors of the oppressors cries for the death of their first-born to the glad spring-like sylvan strain but as for his people he led them forth like sheep i hope all my readers know it the metrical developments which we noted in the first and second periods are kept up in this and increase greatly in proportion whereas in the second period the double endings were only used at the rate of eleven point two per cent in the third they are twenty two point zero eight per cent note the tremendous advance on period one where we had only eight per cent the same marked development is shown in the light and weak endings figures for period two where point three five nine per cent for period three they are one point four three per cent again a remarkable contrast to period one where we had only point one six two per cent rhyme decreases proportionately the ratio in period two of rhyme to blank verse was as one to ten point zero four in period three it is as low as one to twenty five point eight compare these last figures with those of period one where the ratio was as high as one to three point three shakespeare's reading is still wide and varied for the classical historical plays julius caesar antony coriolanus and timon he read north's plutarch he used earlier plays in hamlet and perhaps in lear his old source bella Forest, he referred to again chaucer's troilus chapman's homer caxton's translation of the ray suil lydgate's troy book cynthia's hecatomathy Holland's Pliny, Holland Shed's version of Boise and his chronicle, Sidney's Arcadia, a pamphlet by Bishop Harsnat, and Lucian's dialogues he read likewise. Meanwhile, the praise of his contemporaries, their references to and borrowings from his works go on increasing. End of chapter 6chapter seven of shakespeare life and work this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org shakespeare life and work by f j furnival and john monroe chapter seven the fourth period pericles this is a play of suffering forgiveness reunion after long parting pericles of tyre to win antiochus's daughter goes to read the riddle he gives all suitors does so and knows it proclaims this king's incest he flees and a poisoner who misses him is sent after him to tyre by the king who with his daughter is afterwards shrivelled up pericles leaves tyre for travel and goes to tharsis where cleon is governor and gives all corn in famine he goes to sea again is wrecked and cast up alone at pentapolis when fishers whom he meets drag up his armour in their nets the next day he attends the jousts king simonides holds for his daughter is victorious and weds her the fair thaisa the men of tyre meantime are impatient for their king and pericles prepares to return at sea a daughter marina is born to him during a storm and thaisa his wife apparently dies the sailors insist she shall be cast overboard she is put in a strong box and consigned to the sea pericles entrusts marina to cleon and his wife dionyza and goes to tyre 
thaisa is cast up at ephesus where ceremon a kindly and sage man revives her thinking pericles dead she takes vestal livery marina grows up in beauty and accomplishments with philoton cleon's daughter of marina's great superiority in every way dionysa is jealous and employs a murderer leonine to kill the girl as he is about to do so on the seashore pirates enter and steal marina she is sold to bawds and mytilene where she overcomes all even lysimachus the governor by her beauty and purity she teaches to win money for her masters cleon and dionysa put up a mock tomb to marina and give out she is dead pericles goes for his daughter and hearing of her demise is overcome with grief he puts to sea and is driven to mytilene where lysimachus sends for marina to cheer his melancholy father recognizes child and is overcome with joy diana appears to pericles in a vision and sends him to ephesus where he finds his wife once more so after many toils storms and sorrows comes peace reunion and love the tempest takes us to an enchanted island in a stormy sea inhabited by prospero the rightful duke of milan whom his brother antonio has supplanted his lovely young daughter miranda and their brutal and misshapen slave caliban prospero is an enchanter who can rule the wind the waves and all nature and on him attend ariel and other fairy spirits by his device is wrecked on his island a ship containing his usurper brother the king of naples alonso with his handsome young son ferdinand his own brother sebastian and other nobles and also trinculo a jester stefano a drunken butler and sailors as soon as ferdinand and miranda meet they fall in love with one another and prospero sets him to hew logs for her sake antonio conspires with sebastian to murder alonzo and become king of naples but is stopped by ariel at prospero's bidding caliban gets trinculo and stefano to join in a plot to kill prospero and let him ravish miranda but this is also frustrated by ariel under prospero's direction prospero then gives all the nobles a magic banquet and makes the goddesses iris ceres and juno appear and bless miranda and ferdinand he forgives all the wrongdoers his brother returns him his kingdom he gives up his magic powers will sail to naples to see his daughter wedded and then retire to his milan where every third thought shall be his grave cymbeline takes us first to britain and then to rome the king of britain is cymbeline whose two young sons are stolen from him and brought up in wales by one of his nobles whom he has treated unjustly while his daughter imogen is left at his court and educated with her playfellow posthumus the orphan son of one of the king's warriors whom she loves her mother dying cymbeline marries a wicked artful widow with a brutal fool of a son named cloten whom his mother designs for imogen's husband when cymbeline finds that imogen has wedded posthumus he is furious and banishes posthumus who goes to rome after giving his wife a special bracelet while she gives him her dead mother's diamond ring at rome posthumus praises his wife's purity and when iachimo challenges it he agrees that if iachimo can make her commit adultery he will give him her diamond ring if not iachimo is to forfeit ten thousand ducats iachimo comes to britain and tries in vain to tempt imogen so he gets taken into her room in a trunk and while she is asleep notes all the hangings etc of the room and a mark under her breast and unclasps her bracelet with which he steals away and on his return to rome convinces posthumus that he has enjoyed his wife posthumus gives him the diamond ring and mad with anger writes to his man pisanio to take imogen to wales as his letter to her asks her to go there and kill her pisanio goes with imogen but instead of killing her tells her of her husband's base want of faith in her and his wish for her death pisanio then leaves her giving her a drug to comfort her which the wicked queen has given him believing it to be poison though it is only a powerful sleeping medicine imogen puts on boy's clothes and when hungry she eats a meal she finds in a cave where her unknown brothers and their supposed father dwell they welcome her and are most kind to her 
and when she takes the queen's drug as a cordial and goes into a death-like sleep they strew flowers on her and sing her dirge meantime a roman army has invaded britain with posthumus and iacomo in its ranks a battle between it and cymbeline is won by the britons mainly by the valour of cymbeline's two long-lost sons their foster-father and posthumus who joins his father-in-law's troops iacomo is taken prisoner and at the instance of imogen who has acted as page to the roman general also a prisoner confesses his lying treachery to imogen and posthumus she forgives her deceived and repentant husband and cymbeline having his sons restored to him forgives the stealer of them and iacomo and the roman general and all is happiness and peace the winter's tale sixteen eleven is the last of shakespeare's genuine plays and takes us to sicily and bohemia leontes the king of sicily bids his pure and noble wife hermione entertain his friend polixenes king of bohemia and then he most wrongly and maniacally accuses her of adultery with him and orders her baby girl perdita to be taken to some desert place out of his land and left there his innocent queen he has tried for adultery and for conspiring to kill him but the oracle at delphos whom he has sent to consult of course declares her guiltless he is told that she has died and he then repents of his mad crimes and says that he'll daily visit the chapel where she and her young son mamilius who really does die of grief lie buried the bay perdida is left on the bohemian coast and is found and brought up by a shepherd when she has grown to a lovely girl the young prince florizel the son of polixenes courts her in disguise and they go to a sheep-shearing feast where the most amusing and merry scamp that shakespeare ever drew autolycus takes in all the country folk and before and after swindles the old shepherd and his son polixenes finds his son at the feast and utters terrible threats against him and perdita and her reputed father the old shepherd but when the latter tells a story and produces the mantle of queen hermione her jewel about the neck of it found with the babe perdita is recognized as the daughter of leontes and hermione hermione first posing as the statue of herself supposed to be dead shows that she is alive she forgives her sinning husband and embraces perdita and all is happiness and perdita is troth plighted to florizel and is one day to be queen of bohemia the description of perdita with her flowers at the feast is one of the most charming things in shakespeare's works king henry the eighth of this poor play fletcher wrote the larger portion while the smaller is by another hand supposed by many to be shakespeare's by a few to be massinger's or some unknown writers it is in two parts the triumph of wolsey over buckingham in the first and in the second henry the eighth's love for anne boleyn his divorce of queen catherine and the marriage and coronation of anne as queen with the fall of wolsey and the prophecy of the greatness of anne's daughter the future queen elizabeth we see first the rivalry of buckingham and wolsey which ends in the trial and condemnation of the former who goes to his death complaining only of his servants who betray him to the king meantime henry has met and fallen in love with anne boleyn who tells an old lady that she wouldn't on any account be a queen and has made her marchioness of pembroke and given her one thousand pounds a year he pretends that his conscience is troubled because he married queen catherine who was before betrothed to his dead brother she is tried and though wolsey opposes the divorce it is granted and the catalogue of wolsey's possessions having fallen into henry's hands he deprives wolsey of his offices and gets his property he then weds anne who is crowned with great state and soon bears him to his disappointment for he wanted a son a daughter whose future glory is described in glowing terms cranmer who has promoted anne's marriage and succeeds wolsey in henry's favour is accused of misdoings but is favoured by the king and triumphs over his accusers wolsey's famous speech on his fall so often attributed to shakespeare is unquestionably fletcher's review of the fourth period the dark ill-boding times of storm are over 
we are now as it were in a golden morning when the breezes have swept away the clouds of night the sun shines the birds sing there is a scent of flowers in the air of violets and roses cowslips daisies and marigolds contrast with the green grass of the meadows youth rejoices these are the new days with new lessons they are full of peace and calm mercy and forgiveness reunion and reconciliation in these later stories so tender and so true that which was lost is found the calm which of old could only be found through the portals of death duncan is in his grave after life's fitful fever he sleeps well comes now to men on earth storms may sunder the loved ones foes rise up between husband loses wife and father child and men themselves through their own flaws and falseness banish and wrong the pure and the beautiful but all shall come right in the end the wrong shall repent and be pardoned the wronged shall be born into a new life of love and happiness to this end all the powers of the universe shall contribute the highest wisdom that lies in man the tenderness and devotion of woman the spirits of the air the gods of the heaven and the earth the forces of evil shall be vanquished and all shall be well surely a great contrast to what has gone before not without significance and cause look through the four periods of shakespeare's work and see if the story of a man's heart is not wrapped up in it think only of his uses of the fairy and spirit worlds as his labours progress note in midsummer night's dream the wanton roguish genial spirit of idle mischief puck robin goodfellow the merry wanderer of the night who frightens the maidens and labours in the quern peace blossom cobweb moth mustard seed and a host of other dainty fairies tripping lightly in the moonlight between the nodding flowers floating in air on their gossamer wings over the floods and bushes seeking the dewdrops and the bells of flowers and stealing the honey-bag from the humble-bee oberon king of fairy and queenly titania quarrelling petulantly in the forest glades all meddling in and muddling up the affairs of mortals all of them children of dream contrast them with the hearn's oak fairies of the more worldly second period pulsing with humour and patriotic rhetoric sir hugh evans the welsh fairy trib trib fairies be polled i pray you pistol as hobgoblin where fires thou find'st unraked the hearths unswept there pinch the maids as blue as bilberry merry mistress quickly and sweet anne page as fairies too all of them tripping round the crestfallen falstaff burning him with their tapers and pinching him black and blue then turn to the third period see there the sad kingly spirit sweeping through the gloom of elsinore released from its purgation in the fires of an awful unseen prison world to incite a weak vacillating man to revenge for foul unnatural murder eye for eye tooth for tooth hand for hand foot for foot macbeth confronted in the darkness by three secret blackened midnight hags like women and yet bearded like figures of earth and yet not of it powers of darkness or leagued with it wrecking the ship at sea leaping and screaming in circle round their seething cauldron of hell broth with its loathsome ingredients inciting a mortal to the foulest of murders with still more murderous consequences and final ruin turn then to the fourth period celestial diane goddess argentine appears to pericles from the skies and sends him to find his wife and gain his longed-for peace and happiness saruman uses his store of deep wisdom for the good of the suffering prosper on his magic island with its mysterious sweet voices carried on every breeze king of the fair spirit ariel that works for human weal master of the monster caliban that works for human harm with power over all men the winds and the sea bringing juno with the favour of destiny ceres with the favour of earth iris with the favour of heaven and nymphs and reapers with the favour as it were of mortals to bless his daughter's wedding and jupiter in cymbeline descends to posthumus foretells of an end to his trials and of future happiness in these things is clearly reflected the different tempers of the four periods and not in these only but in the women characters also the third period good women are all of them like juliet environed in a world harsh and unfavourable to the nobility of their characters a world which crushes most of them think of portia the gentle wife of brutus cato's daughter lost amid plots and assassination ophelia wronged in her love bereft of her reason drowned isabella tried by temptation yet coming through unscathed in a city of sin 
desdemona whose simple and perfect womanhood cries out against the fate by which she is crushed poor lady macduff deserted and murdered cordelia denied banished from her father wronged and slain chased octavia wedded to antony and deserted volumnia and virgilia themselves made the instruments of that ruin they sought to avert then contrast them with the fourth period women thaisa and marina separated from pericles patient in adversity reunited at last and finding happiness miranda that splendid idealization of pure young womanhood unaffected unsophisticated untainted by one ungenerous thought or impulse tender pitiful open-hearted so different to the stratford type women of period one the merry able london type women of period two the fate-stricken women of period three nurtured in the love and wisdom of a noble father and receiving the love of a noble man imogen belied wronged by her husband but reconciled at last forgiving all who have done her harm hermione disgraced thought to be dead but suffering in silence and finally magnanimously forgiving the husband who had so injured her perdita the fair shepherdess fragrant with the breath of the open fields and wild flowers lost to her kin but found again and taking part in the joyful reunion these fourth period plays take us back to the joys of the simple life of nature the stratford life tell us of the wild flowers of the countryside the goblin tales of the people the merry roguish peddler with his fairings for the maidens the shepherds the sheep shearing and as the country scenes point to shakespeare's renewed life at stratford so the scenes of reconciliation between husband and wife the love of fathers for their daughters and their watchful care over their children's destiny point to his renewed life with his wife anne and his care of his two daughters all that then remained alive of his children the bitter scepticism over natural laws the rebellion against sex the terrible misgivings concerning the life to come which we found in period three have passed by prospero's wisdom tempered and increased by years of wrong does not revolt against law but abides by it leads him to perceive that in its dominion his daughter may be blessed and helps him to procure for her that in which she may be most happy the love of a true man in period three when there was the tendency to regard the earth as nothing but a sterile promontory and man as irrevocably fallen what incentive could there be to rejoice at the propagation of the human race period four tells us in contrast that the way of the ages is enough that youth takes up throughout all time the tale of age that earth wants men and therefore men want wives with the disappearance of tragedy the principle disappears of concentrating the action in two or three main characters character is not less the dramatist's study but there is a greater interweaving of themes the canvas on which the artist paints is broader there is less contrast of highlights and shadows iacomo is not so far removed from imogen as iago from desdemona iacomo repents the main story in othello is never departed from three or four streams of story intermingle in cymbeline it seems as if we return to period one in many things in country life in the portraiture of girls in themes like the sleeping potion but here the handling of materials is finer characterization is deeper charity and forgiveness are everywhere there is a calm seriousness in the plays a philosophic standpoint we are in a new heaven and a new earth the metrical developments which we have distinguished all through are still proceeding for the twenty two point zero eight per cent double endings in period three we have thirty point eight per cent for the one point forty three per cent light and weak endings we have the remarkable increase to five point zero six per cent for the ratio of rhyme to blank verse of one to twenty five point eight we have the remarkable decrease to one to fifty three point eight proportionately there are more song lines in this period than in any other there is no doggerel shakespeare still uses many of his old sources hollandshed and hall were used for henry the eighth which shakespeare probably did not write and hollandshed for cymbeline gower's confessio amantis was employed lawrence twine's pattern of painful adventures old plays many pamphlets hacklet's voyages probably boccaccio green's pandosto and a folk tale percentage of endings in the four periods period first 
double endings compared with rhyme and blank verse combined eight per cent period second double endings compared with rhyme and blank verse eleven point two per cent period third double endings compared with rhyme and blank verse combined twenty two point zero eight per cent period fourth double endings compared with rhyme and blank verse combined thirty point eight per cent light and weak endings in blank verse first period point one six two per cent light and weak endings in blank verse second period point three five nine per cent light and weak endings in blank verse period third one point four three per cent light and weak endings in blank verse fourth period five point zero six per cent proportion of rhyme to blank verse period first one to three point three proportion of rhyme to blank verse second period one to ten point zero four proportion of rhyme to blank verse third period one to twenty five point eight proportion of rhyme to blank verse fourth period one to fifty three point eight the foregoing table disregards titus andronicus henry the sixth timon pericles henry the eighth and the taming of the shrew all of which were certainly not wholly written by shakespeare and some of which owe very little if anything at all to him it shows in a way that the sidel of the bare figures could not do the development of his style in calculating the percentage of double endings i considered the rhyme and blank verse combined in calculating the percentage of light and weak endings only the blank verse the ratio of rhyme to blank verse is given separately m end of chapter seven chapter eight shakespeare life and work this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org shakespeare life and work by f j furnival and john monroe chapter eight my experience in shakespeare work it has been my privilege to set the torch of shakespeare's genius to some young minds and to see them kindle at its touch in a way that it has been one of the great pleasures of my life to witness it has been my privilege too to bring for the first time before some lifelong students of shakespeare the order and succession of his works in their gradual development of power and beauty and wisdom together with the oneness of these works through all their growth and thus to give these students a quite new interest and delight in the great writer they had so long loved i hope this volume may be of like use to a larger number of people now i am certain that the mere study of isolated plays must give way to the study of them as parts of a whole and in relation to the other parts as well as singly that the study of shakespeare's works must be made like that of the works of every other great artist painter musician etc like that of the creator's works natural and scientific and in the order of the maker's making and i claim that the method i have pursued is that of the man of science comparison noting of differences and identities of expression subject character mood and temper of mind and that this method and its results do bring a fresh element of certainty into the order of shakespeare's plays and the groups into which they fall the evidence of this order and grouping has come to me gradually and unexpectedly and it is all undesigned evidence the first thing that struck me on reading gervinus was the absolute necessity of a fourth period for the latest group of plays just as one had been wanted for chaucer next on a second reading of the plays came out the connecting link of the errors or mistaken identity fun between the three earliest plays then came the conviction started by professor hales's chat to us at the new shakespeare society 
that mr hallowell phillips discovery of the allusion to julius caesar by weaver in sixteen o one was justified by the internal evidence of the play and on working the subject out independently many months afterwards i was surprised to find how strong and how many the links between julius caesar and hamlet were several of these are given in the introduction to julius caesar and that the former's place was clearly before hamlet and not after measure for measure as i had put it in my first table gervinus introduction page forty four then at once showed itself the link of likeness of character brutus hamlet claudio angelo all unfit natures for the task set them of failing under the burden laid on them next came the position of the poems following gervinus and many criticisms in print and out of it i at first put the venus and adonis down as shakespeare's earliest work gervinus introduction page forty four i then undertook to edit the leopold volume of shakespeare i wrote the introduction to the venus and thought i had persuaded myself that it really was shakespeare's first work but on turning to love's labours lost and the errors after it the absurdity was too apparent the poem clearly belonged to the passion group which was prepared for by the two gentlemen and my youngest brother's death occurring just at that time i gave up my editing then i had at first put king john in the first period from its dramatic weakness its climax if john's death can be so called having nothing to do with the motives of the play but its variety of well-drawn characters its richness and pathos as compared with richard the third its links with the merchant soon convinced me that it must be of the second period and with the merchant from the life plea group the shrew was difficult to place but the kinship of grumio's humour to falstaff's the admirable drawing of petruchio's character showed that it must be close to though before one henry the fourth and so on it is by one's mistakes that one learns of course this method can be ridiculed by any little fool april or other who wants to raise a laugh just as metrical tests have been there's a man and a woman in the tempest and the dream therefore they are next to one another v and a are in all the plays therefore they were all written the same day etc but it must be a poor method or man that's put down by a gibing spirit whose influence is begot of that loose grace which shallow laughing hearers give to fools love's labours lost five two page one forty six students must too have a certain knowledge of the succession of shakespeare's plays in order to appreciate the value of the evidence may i again refer to a mistake of mine and a happy hit to illustrate this when trying for the order and groups of chaucer's canterbury tales i could at first find nothing better than to follow my best manuscript the ellesmere and our best old editor Turwit but on sending up my scheme to the only man in the world who then knew anything about the subject and had long worked in vain at it mr h bradshaw the sight of my mistake at once enabled him to solve both his own difficulties and mine so in chaucer's minor poems i had followed the best leader in argument i could find and printed the death of blanche the duchess first then mr bradshaw told me he had never been able to get a place for the complaint unto pity on a careful reading of it never till then given i saw it was chaucer's first original poem before the blanche and that the latter alluded to his love sickness explained in the pity mr bradshaw's knowledge of chaucer unequalled it was in these points made him agree in this firstness of the pity but another man with very much slighter knowledge of chaucer details could not agree he hadn't had the special training to enable him to and he made the comical suggestion that chaucer's illness was due to the want of cash of which the poet complains in his very latest poem now the critic i want for the order and groups of shakespeare's plays is a bradshaw some one a friend i hope who knows 
who can say that play or group must come out of your wrong place and go into my right one there and whom one can gladly delightedly thank for setting one right for in these small as in greater matters it's what delights can equal those that stir the spirit's inner deeps when one that loves but knows not reaps a truth from one that loves and knows chaucer was right in putting his clerks gladly would he learn before the gladly would he teach the learning's ever so much pleasanter why don't the men of the level of tennyson spedding pater simmons dowden ingram men of the past and present who have helped in shakespeare labors do more for us at shakespeare wooden heads and pert no littles we've had in plenty but we want the men who see the plays about the place of which there is most doubt are the dream which after formerly shifting to follow the two gentlemen i perhaps wrongly moved back again the shrew troilus which i formerly placed after lear and before antony by reason of its subject and now with professor dowden place after measure for measure with the tone of which play it is not out of keeping in accordance with the metrical evidence the merry wives which i previously put after two henry the fourth and now put after henry the fifth if some plays are in their wrong places now and get moved to their right ones i have no doubt that a number of links of like phrases thoughts subjects characters will be perceived between them and the plays lying next them i believe nay assert that down each side edge of every one of shakespeare's plays are several hooks and eyes of special patterns which as soon as their play is put in its right place will find a set of eyes and hooks of the same pattern on the adjoining play to fit into this was oddly the case with julius caesar when put into its right place before hamlet and the only exception to the rule is where an entirely new or different subject like this julius caesar is started after such a succession of comedies as closes shakespeare's second period in this case the links the hooks and eyes on the left edge of the new play may be wanting note too that as in conjunctions we have both copulative and disjunctive ones so in links we have both bonds of likeness and contrast as i have shown in the introduction to hamlet these links almost always undesigned ones i contend are only what must naturally exist between works written by the same man nearly at the same time of his life and in the same mood from evidence of like kind comparing the general tone of the four periods of his works i hold that shakespeare's plays when looked at broadly in their successive periods represent his own prevailing temper of mind as man as well as artist in the succeeding stages of his life these tempers and moods as they change in shakespeare's four periods are but those of nature spedding who objected to part of my views yet said along with the resemblances between the writings of the same man there will also be differences differences corresponding to changes in his tastes humours habits fortunes and mental conditions in his earlier youth farce and deep tragedy may probably divide his affections between them as his mind expands and ripens the broader humours of farce and the simpler horrors of tragedy lose their attraction and give place to the richer chaster and more delicate humour of high comedy and the deeper mysteries of tragic passion as advancing years cool the blood and decreasing activity makes the pleasures of a quiet life more attractive than those of a stirring one it is probable that the writer's taste will incline to the calmer and more soothing kind of pathos in which the feeling is too profound and tender for what is called comedy and yet the final impression too peaceful for what is called tragedy tastes so changing would no doubt induce changes both in the choice of subjects and in the treatment of them and looking through your list of shakespeare's plays in the order of their dates as determined upon independent grounds the succession is much what we might without inventing any extraordinary spiritual trials in his private life to account for the changes have expected take your four periods and you will find that the differences in choice and treatment suit very naturally with the natural changes in a man's mind 
as he grows older and that the whole series will divide very well into four groups between twenty-four and thirty shakespeare had a young man's tastes both in the light and the heavy line a taste for merriment and absurdity and ingenious conceits and slang and bawdry in the light line and for love in the sighing like furnace and bowl and dagger stage in the serious after thirty he lost his relish for these puerilities aimed at a higher order of wit and humour and comedy and a higher moral standard altogether while for the true elements of human tragedy he turned to history five or six years of such work led him upwards into a still higher region in comedy though the vein was as rich as ever and as full of enjoyment yet the pathetic element springing from the tender and serious feeling with which he had come to regard all human things became more and more predominant and so prevailed over the other in the general effect that his later works which end happily are hardly to be called comedies i suppose nobody ever thought of measure for measure as a comedy though everybody in it except lucio is happily disposed of and the effect of his sentence is rather comic than otherwise all's well is allied to tragedy rather than comedy by the pity and serious interest with which we follow the fortunes of the heroine and twelfth night in spite of the number and perfection of the comic scenes and the wonderful liveliness and rapidity and variety of incident and action is nevertheless to me one of the most pathetic plays i know and would draw tears far sooner than romeo and juliet so shakespeare may be said to have taken leave of comedy proper in the merry wives and to have grown out of it before he was forty years old in the meantime his exercises in tragedy proper had led him into the region of the great passions which disclose the heights and depths of humanity a region which was destined to become and remain his own these passions for the benefit of the theatre the glory of burbage the amusement and instruction of the play-going public and partly it may be for the satisfaction and relief of his own genius he brought by means of such stories as he could find suitable for showing them in action upon the stage and to this we owe hamlet macbeth othello lear and the rest which occupied the unhappy third period i should like to have a period of unhappiness like that no doubt the fourth group follows naturally enough he was forty-four years old he had made money enough he had retired from business he had passed the period when the mind takes pleasure in violent agitations and he employed himself upon such subjects as suited or treated the subjects which he found so as to make them suit the autumnal days witness the winter's tale and the tempest classing the plays according to their general character i find that they fall naturally into these broad divisions and that they have a kind of correspondence with the divisions which are observable in the life of man but if you want to separate these natural divisions into subordinate groups according to the particular feature which distinguishes each it seems to me that you must have as many groups as there are plays the distinguishing feature of each would depend upon many things besides the author's state of mind it would depend upon the story which he had to tell and the choice of the story would depend upon the requirements of the theatre the taste of the public the popularity of the different actors the strength of the company a new part might be wanted for burbage or kemp the two boys that acted hermia and helena and rosalind and celia the tall and the short one or the two men who were so like that they might be mistaken for each other might want new pieces to appear in and so on the stories would be selected from such as were to be had and had not been used up to suit the taste of the frequenters of the theatre and the characters and incidents would be according to the stories if then the broad divisions are those of nature if they are a priori probable and the succession of the plays in each period can be made out as i have shown it can be with a close approach to certainty by a combination of all the evidence from without and within how can we help asking ourselves what smaller groups the plays of each period fall into 
how can we help refusing to admit the evidence under our noses that for instance julius caesar hamlet and measure for measure are most closely allied by the unfitness of brutus hamlet claudio to bear the burden put upon them while othello and macbeth though like the first group in the unfitness of their heroes natures for the strain put on them are yet more closely linked to one another by their heroes under the influence of their quick working imaginations yielding to temptations from without and from within and so on next as to the question how far we are justified in assuming that shakespeare put his own feelings himself into his own plays some men scorn the notion ask you triumphantly which of his characters represents him assert that he himself is in none of them but sits apart serene unruffled himself by earthly passion making his puppets move surely they forget that a poet must write what he learns from experience that the types he portrays the beauties he delights in and his intellectual equipment for his task depend always on the land and the era in which he lives i believe further that all the deepest and greatest work of an artist playwright orator painter poet etc is based on personal experience on his own emotions and passions and not merely on his observations of things or feelings outside him on which his fancy and imagination work i find that fra angelico whose angel paintings breathe calm into you as you walk up to them and lift you into heaven's own serene makes you smile at his devils i find that wordsworth cannot paint passion but that michelangelo can i find that the natures of carlyle and ruskin are shown us in their works i find that milton's satan has milton's noble nature perverted is no devil etc but that dante can paint hell because he's felt it shakespeare tells me too he's felt hell and in his othello macbeth lear coriolanus timon i see the evidence his, of his having done so he tells me how he loved his friend as with woman's love and in his antonio thrice repeated his helena his viola i see his own devoted love reflected he tells me what his false swarthy mistress was and in his cleopatra i see her to some extent embodied tradition tells me of the merry meetings at the mermaid and the wit combats there and in the false deaf scenes at the boar's head etc etc i see these imaged the early plays show me what shakespeare was at the beginning of his career how comparatively poor in his grasp of nature and merely sharp and witty i see him grow in knowledge and experience of life from period to period almost play to play enriching himself with the society of gracious elizabethan ladies and courtly men fighting the deepest questions which puzzle the will getting convinced of the sternness of the moral ruler of mankind of the weakness of his own nature of the suffering that sin brings i see him laying bare his own soul as he strips the covering off other men's and i see him at last passing into at oneness with god and man into fresh delight in all the glories of the outward world and the sweet girls about him in his stratford home then content to sleep and i refuse to separate shakespeare the man from shakespeare the artist he himself his own nature and life are in all his plays to the man who has eyes and chooses to look for him and them there but still let those who reject this view note that all i have said of the succession of shakespeare's plays is independent of it only let them study the works of shakespeare chronologically as they do those of raphael turner mozart handel beethoven and let them help to put down the idiotic helplessness and confusion on the subject that still linger on here and there in england and which still make many men turn angrily on you when you try to get them out of them let them also insist that shakespeare's poems be studied with his plays as chaucer's minor poems must be with his tales neither man can be known from plays or tales alone end of chapter eight chapter nine 
of shakespeare life and work this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org shakespeare life and work by f j furnival and john monroe chapter nine shakespeare as revealed in his works the statement of my old acquaintance professor craik in his edition of julius caesar eighteen fifty seven still remains true that after all the commentatorship and criticism of which the works of shakespeare have been the subject they still remain to be studied in their totality with a special reference to himself the man shakespeare as read in his works shakespeare as they are revealed not only in his genius and intellectual power but in his character disposition temper opinions taste prejudices is a book yet to be written pages eight and nine till some one has carefully picked out the extra dramatic bits from his plays and combined them with the like bits in his poems we cannot have his picture complete but we know enough to get a fair notion of him his boyhood and young manhood i have already sketched on pages fifteen through twenty five the latter was that of his own ideal as so happily pictured by my friend miss o'brien in her article on shakespeare's young men and their five classes in the westminster review for october eighteen seventy six his outward history is that of so many thousands of his countrymen born and bred in the country he comes up to london poor and gradually makes his fortune there keeps an eye always to his country home lays out his first money there makes his father a gentleman and then himself retires to be a country gentleman in stratford too leaving behind him the city the source of his fortune the scene of his triumphs he as is usual with self-made men wants to found a family and entails his landed property on his eldest daughter and her child leaving the youngest daughter but three hundred pounds marriage portion and all as to his likes and dislikes he disliked women's sham hair and face painting men's absurd dresses and frequent changes of fashion and their excessive word-play and quips he also disliked jealous wives scented effeminate men hotspurs courtier and osric etc puritans courtiers pretensions poppins justices presumptuous officials and affectations of all kinds the fickle multitude child actors clowns saying more than was set down for them ranting actors and dramatists and actor and playwright though he was liking the applause with which the well-graced actor left the stage richard the second five two he still felt that his business lowered his moral nature and left his stain on him sonnet one hundred and eleven no wonder if the general run of writers and actors was like marlowe peel and green shakespeare used the poor rather as material for fun to amuse his richer patrons with than as folk with whom he felt he doesn't show much sympathy with them not so much as chaucer i think but his representations of them are all in good part and like those of chaucer and dickens make his hearers think kindly of the men they laugh at he like the other elizabethan dramatists doesn't in his play show much home feeling he and they have hardly any of the modern feeling as to the english home twas hardly possible then paul's walks the theatres the taverns were the leading features of the london life of elizabeth's and james's time and though hints of happy home life are given here and there in shakespeare sat at good men's feasts as you like it two seven and oddly enough in the roman plays just as in sir thomas more's household in philip stubbs's life of his sweet wife who read the bible so hard and was always asking him to explain texts yet it was not till the puritan time that we get the lucy hutchinson the lady russell the foundation of the english home to which the cavalier spirit when purified was to add lightness and grace 
the hardness of early english home life is seen in the paston letters in the italian relation of england in lady jane grey's bringing up etc see the forwards to my baby's book etc in connection with this want of home life there seems to me in shakespeare some want of sympathy with child nature admirable as his sketches of children's characters are it is rather their parents feelings for them than the children themselves that he seems to care for shakespeare was too like most tudor englishmen too fond of kings and queens but in his time they were mistaken for their country the modern comtist also judging shakespeare as a victorian not an elizabethan finds that he had no high purpose in his life set up no high ideals in his plays that he ridiculed the poor to please the rich etc etc these objections seem to me out of time and place shakespeare's love for the country is one of his most striking characteristics he glories in its might and its prowess his knowledge of and delight in its flowers and plants its birds and beasts horses and dogs its clouds and sunshine its pastoral life and fairy lore its sports its men and maidens he puts into all his plays a thorough landsman he never speaks of the sea with pleasure loving nature even more than chaucer he is no student no book reader in the sense that chaucer was that even ben jonson was no reflections of other men's work shine through his every second line as in much of chaucer he studies men and women as he does nature at first hand not second and reads mainly i expect for material for his work in the intervals of his busy active life baptista mantuanus ovid plautus of the classics perchance all in translations certainly plutarch's lives in north's english version from amio's french one chaucer george gascoigne hollinshed's chronicle lily's euphues painter's palace of pleasure and other collections of novels green's prose tales montaigne's essays are the main books we trace in his works the english bible he seems to have known well see bishop charles wordsworth's book on this of all the arts he loved music next to poetry what lovely tender passages he has written on it then painting then statuary full-blooded impulsive he must have been and full of life he liked his cakes and ale and took enjoyingly the pleasures sensuous and sexual that the fates provided it is absurd to try and make him out in this regard a milton or a wordsworth the unneeded double entente the broad jokes in his early plays his venus etc show that he had the allowable enjoyment of his time in an amusing splash of dirt but it is all wholesome coarseness and he has far less of it than his dramatic contemporaries have but with this full-blooded strong intense nature with an overflowing store of humour geniality and wit shakespeare combined the utmost sensitiveness the tenderest humblest devoted woman-like love for his friend what can be more beautiful weak though it may seem to some than his affection for his will of the sonnets these are the poems that explain to us his contemporaries name for him gentle shakespeare gentle will these the work that show us whence sprang his strong hold on the rough blustering ben jonson and drew from ben those expressions of affection which notwithstanding their butts are his own truest title to a place in our hearts i love the man and do honour his memory on this side idolatry as much as any he was indeed honest and of an open and free nature had an excellent fantasy brave notions and gentle expressions discoveries page seven forty seven column one and triumph my britain thou hast one to show to whom all scenes of europe homage owe he was not for an age but for all time and all the muses still were in their prime when like apollo he came forth to warm our ears or like a mercury to charm nature herself was proud of his designs and joyed to wear the dressings of his lines 
yet must i not give nature all thy art my gentle shakespeare must enjoy a part for though the poet's matter nature be his art doth give the fashion look how the father's face lives in his issue even so the race of shakespeare's mind and manners brightly shines in his well torned and true filed lines sweet swan of avon what a sight it were to see thee in our water yet appear and make those flights upon the banks of thames that so did take eliza and our james but stay i see thee in the hemisphere advanced and made a constellation there shine forth thou star of poets and with rage or influence chide or cheer the drooping stage which since thy flight from hence hath mourned like night and despairs day but for thy volume's light from ben jonson's poem in the folio of sixteen twenty three to the memory of my beloved master william shakespeare and what he hath left us ben jonson's works page six ninety three column one fuller says of shakespeare many were the wit combats betwixt him and ben jonson which two i beheld like a spanish great galleon and an english man of war master jonson like the former was built far higher in learning solid but slow in his performances shakespeare with the english man of war lesser in bulk but lighter in sailing could turn with all tides tack about and take advantage of all winds by the quickness of his wit and invention were these page one twenty six signature triple a edited followed in dice page seventy aubrey had heard that shakespeare was a handsome well-shaped man very good company and of a very ready and pleasant smooth wit his kindly reference to his dead rival marlowe as in as you like it i have noticed in the introduction to that play and chettle's testimony to his early worth pages ninety three to four and one seventy seven and who can read his plays without feeling that in all that's frank and generous and beautiful all that's noble and to be reverenced and loved in their characters in them there is a part of shakespeare himself grant that in his bad characters there is somewhat of him too that he had yielded to temptation passion felt possibilities of crime but yet how greatly the good outweighs the ill how surely we feel that the ideal shakespeare created he strove to reach and that all that was true and right came to him as to its home in religion he was no doubt an orthodox christian of his day as a dramatist a poet shakespeare like chaucer started late and ripened late though earlier than the older master chaucer's first poem the pity must have been written when he was nearly twenty-eight his prologue when he was forty-eight shakespeare's first poem is venus and adonis the first heir of his invention when he was twenty-nine his first play love's labour's lost when he was twenty-four or twenty-five his othello when he was forty chaucer began in sadness and worked through it into the sunshine and humour of his merry tales but passed at last into complaints against fortune poverty and ill hap due to his bad luck in the world shakespeare started with fun and farce and passing through his early tragedy and histories to his brilliant sunny comedies plunged into the gloom and terrors of the tragedies of his third period but emerged to end in sunshine and in peace what strikes me most in shakespeare is his magnificent power and ease true poet as chaucer is and much as i love him my work for him shows it true poet as marlowe is let miss lee speak his praise it seems to me that shakespeare can take them both up in his right hand and all the other english poets in his left and walk off with them without feeling their weight this strength this ease of doing all he wants and having power in reserve this ability to swing you right away on whatever tide of passion pity terror joy humour wit he chooses to raise i find in no one else in like degree when i asked browning what struck him most in shakespeare he said the royal ease with which he walks up the steps and takes his seat on his throne while we poor fellows have to struggle hard to get up a step or two then comes shakespeare's characterization proceeding from that quick eye that saw the eagle's shaking wings etc in the venus 
from that sensibility which was affected by every object in nature every emotion in man like a photographer's plate is by every ray of light that sympathy that enabled shakespeare to feel with and for every change in the physical world every mood in the spiritual that intensity with which he could throw his whole strong tender self into his characters that insight that imagination penetrative which showed him what was at the heart of every man and thing with which he dealt that power of realization which enabled him to embody his conceptions his studies from life as themselves really living beings then comes the wonderful variety the many-sidedness of the man with all natures he is kin from caliban to titania miranda from bottom to theseus prospero from paroles to hotspur henry v to altershe to isabella from mrs quickly to volumnia he ranges with equal power at will true that he knows men but adores women his reverence for women even if mainly ideal only is to me the most beautiful trait in his character true that he always analyzes and lays bare the weaknesses and sins of the one sex while of the other only cleopatra and cressid does he dissect as chaucer does the wife of bath when he displays her the rest of his heroines he lifts into angels yet keeps them all sweet loving women still yet how fair he is to his characters iago and edmund are his only pure villains and for both we are shown excuses in the causes for their crimes the nearest man to them richard the third has his excuse too in his birth and he loves his father and suffers in his restless bed and his conscience stricken awakening with shylock macbeth our hearts feel then comes the love of nature in all shakespeare's work but of this i have spoken above pages one sixty three four not wordsworth himself was fuller of it it was in every fibre of his being born with him in his fair lands of stratford then the presence of a spirit of active and inquiring thought through every page of his writings is too evident to require any proof he has impressed no other of his own mental qualities on all his characters this quality colors every one of them spaulding's letter page twenty then the deep wisdom and reflective power especially in the third and fourth period plays so often shown in short pregnant sentences that weigh and glisten like gold then the rich and lovely fancy of the early poems and plays carried on through though subdued and chastened to the last then the delightful humour and fun shakespeare's evident enjoyment of it the boy's heart in him to the end as autolycus shows then his brilliant wit his aptness of epithet and mastery of language then the manliness and healthiness of his work notwithstanding its occasional coarseness of his time his sound judgment and strong common sense his knowledge of human nature his conviction that breakers of law natural and moral must and do suffer for their sins his interweaving of fancy and farce pathos and comedy of tragedy and humour but where shall i stop who shall number all shakespeare's attributes all lovers of him know dozens more than i have mentioned in this poor summary and all of them are but the agents of that imagination which made him the greatest poet of the world note his special originality in comedy hardly any of his chief folk in it are from other men's sketches in the construction of his drama shakespeare's weakness seems to me to spring from his strength that was characterization give him a story that afforded him scope for development of character and he didn't care much for a plot he didn't attend enough to the maxim that a play must act itself see on what loose threads of dramatic continuity plays like the dream king john henry v cymbeline winter's tale etc are strung as professor spaulding has pointed out in his able letter pages sixty two sixty six shakespeare belonged to the old school of dramatists as regards plots any old well-known story would suit him for he knew he could make the dry bones live but the hold of his works on the stage as acting plays has loosened from their want of better plots it is odd too in how many of his plays the climax is reached before the fifth act 
this is due to his impetuousness and to the same cause as owing his frequent inconsistency in details see introduction to hamlet page fourteen note one to the leading idea of each play notion so strongly insisted on by many german critics and their english followers i do not take in the sense that shakespeare entertained it consciously before he wrote a play he never sat down to write a play as a parson writes a sermon on the evils of avarice nor did he in my belief according to the doctrine of some critics sit still till old james burbage or his son richard or cuthbert came to him and said now shakespeare we want a tragedy this day fortnight something stirring you know suppose you take hamlet in which the hero is always doing nothing and making excuses for it splendid subject for a drama for action that you cook it up and mind you bring it home to time although doubtless he had to do some work in a hurry the merry wives perhaps i believe on the one hand that shakespeare soon became king and teacher of his company his own fellows must have known the difference between him and other men and looked up to him with pride and that he produced them comedy when he liked it and tragedy when he liked it without asking them for orders on the other hand i can see that shakespeare according to the mood he was in either heard a fresh story or recollected an old one which suited his mood and gave him a chance for developing character then he threw himself into the circumstances and people of the story made such changes in them as he thought fit in accordance with his idea of his plot and each of his characters and then developed the whole if one character dominated the whole play as in othello etc then the play had a leading idea if one character didn't dominate it as in the merchant then the play hadn't any leading idea except the one leading every play that of exhibiting human emotion and character shakespeare cared for life and didn't bother himself about subject object idea teleology etc altogether a manly man as chaucer says this shakespeare strong tender humorful sensitive impressionable the truest friend the foe of none but narrow minds and base and as we track his work from the lightness and fun of its rise through the fairy fancy the youthful passion the rich imaginings the ardent patriotism the brilliant sunshine of his first and second times through the tender affection of his sonnets the whirlwind of passions in his tragedies and then to the lovely sunset of his latest plays what can we do but bless his name and be thankful that he came to be a delight a lift in strength to us and our children's children to all time a bond that shall last for ever between all english-speaking english-reading men the members of that great teutonic brotherhood which shall yet long lead the world in the fight for freedom and for truth end of chapter nine Shakespeare, Life and Work by F. J. Furnival and Others. Chapter 10. Continuation of Shakespeare's Biography. We have now gone through the series of Shakespeare's works, have seen him begin with those that suited youth, skits on the Londoners' fashions and follies, showing his Stratford clowns on the London stage, dealing with love and its vagaries, starting into fancy, incorporating all his country lore and Puck and his companions first stepping onto the ground of Italian story and the two gentlemen of Verona, then bursting into a fervor of passion in Romeo and Juliet and his early poems, passing thence to history, to speak his mind to his countrymen on the disputes that rent England asunder in his time, then again falling back with renewed power on Italian story, and first taking his due lead before all other men in The Merchant of Venice, then sinking almost his history in the humorful comedies of Falstaff, and the brilliant plays of the second period that succeeded them. Then, troubled in heart himself, as we see in his sonnets, disappointed in his affection for his friend, who was his all, cast off by his dark mistress, passing the hell of time of which he speaks to his friend when they were reconciled again, and during this time, no doubt, giving to the world those tragedies in which he laid the burden of life on souls too weak to bear it, 
in which he let noble men be drawn to their ruin by temptations from without, by suggestions from within, in which he showed ingratitude, eating the hearts of father and of child, in which he let lust lead its noble victims to their death, in which he showed all old world glory and honor but a sham, in which at last he made Timon curse all mankind, and then we, we saw him no longer wielding the scourge of vengeance, but acting as the minister of reconciliation, passing from his time of terror to one of peace, and in Prospero, Posthumus, Imogen, Hermione, perhaps Queen Catherine, if Henry the Eighth was by him at all, forgiving injuries for which of old he would have exacted death. And in this temper we find him, after leaving the scenes of his trials and triumphs in London, enjoying as a boy again the sweet sights and sounds of his native home. How came Shakespeare into London? As a stranger to be honored, welcomed, and kissed by girls with angels' faces? Or poor and despised to pick up his first pence by holding men's horses at the theater doors, as one tradition says he did? The playhouse with which tradi tradition connects him was called the theater, and was built by a player and joiner, James Burbage, in 1577, in the fields outside the city walls, on the west of Bishopsgate Street, near the site of the present Standard Theatre in Shoreditch. In 1598, it was pulled down, and in 1599 rebuilt as the Globe, on Bankside Southwark. Whether employed at the theatre or the curtain close by, first noticed in 1577, or any of the other such like places besides, of which Northbrook speaks in 1577-78, or the theatres of which Harrison said in 1573, quote, It is an evident token of a wicked time when players were so rich that they can build such houses. End quote. It is clear from Robert Green, Green's posthumous Groatsworth of Wit in 1592 that Shakespeare was then known and well known as both actor and author, though we have no direct evidence of his being a member of Burbage's or the Lord Chamberlain's company till Christmas 1593. In the accounts of the treasurer of the chamber, containing this evidence, Shakespeare's name occurs after that of Kemp, the comedian, and before that of Richard Burbage, the great tragedian. The Grotesworth of wit has nothing very gentle to say of Shakespeare. What Shakespeare had written by 1592 to move the wrath of the dying and deserted green, we have discussed in chapter 4 above, where we commenced our account of the poet's life work. And having once entered on the subject of the succession of Shakespeare's plays, and the means by which it was made out, we could not well leave it till we'd worked it through. It took us from 1592 to 1613, and gave us Shakespeare's mental and spiritual life during that time. Now we've to put together the few facts of his and his family's outward life that still survive to us. I have divided Shakespeare's life, like his plays, into four periods. Number one, from his birth in 1564 to his leaving Stratford for London in perhaps 1587, the home period. Number two, from 1587 to 1599, when he was taken as partner in the profits of the globe, the period of struggle to success. A, 1587 to 1592, unrecorded. B, 1592 to 1599, recorded. Three, from 1599 to 1609, or whenever else he left London, the period of triumph or assured success. Four, from his return to Stratford, 1609, to his death, 1616, the period of renewed family life or peace. Number 2a, the plays I suppose to have been written by 1592 are Love Labor's Lost, The Comedy of Errors, Midsummer Night's Dream, The Two Gentlemen of Verona, Romeo and Juliet, a few passages perhaps in Titus Andronicus, and the Temple Garden scene in First Henry VI. These are the only records of his life during which the first part of his period of struggle. Now for the second part. Number 2b. In 1593 began, no doubt, Shakespeare's visit to his publisher Richard Field in St. Paul's Churchyard, when Venus and Adonis was entered in the stationer's registers and published. It was the acting of Romeo and Juliet and the issue, issue of the famous Venus and Lucrece that first brought Shakespeare fame and a tradition reported by Rowe as coming from Sir William Davenant states that Lord Southampton, to whom these two poems were dedicated, quote, at one time gave him, Shakespeare, a thousand pounds to go through with a purchase which he heard he had a mind to, end quote. But though the gift is likely enough, 
its amount has no doubt been exaggerated, seeing what a thousand pounds meant then. On the night of December 28th, 1594, one of a week's entertainments at Gray's Inn, Shakespeare and Bacon were no doubt present in Gray's Inn Hall together at the performance of the former's errors. Quote, After such sports, a comedy of errors, like to Plautus his Menechmus, was played by the players, so that night was begun and continued to the end in nothing but confusion and errors, whereupon it was ever afterwards called the Night of Errors. End quote. Gesta Graeorum, page 22 edition 1688 in dice nichols's progresses of queen elizabeth 3 262 spedding's letters and life of bacon 1 326 quote from a paper now before me which formerly belonged to edward allen the player our poet appears to have lived in southwark near the bear garden in 1596 says malone in his inquiry into the authenticity of certain papers and etc page 215 this paper having disappeared, one of the modern Shakespeare forgers, Mr. J. P. Collier, provided another of like kind in its place among the Dulwich College papers and printed it, but its sham was soon detected. On August 11, 1596, as I have noticed in the introduction to King John, page 13, Shakespeare's only son, Hamnet, baptized February 2, 1585, died and was buried at Stratford, Quote, 1596, August 11th, Hamnet, Phileas, William Shakespeare, end quote. That his son's death must have been a great blow to Shakespeare, as well as a father as a man wishing to found a family, we cannot doubt. That he had the ambition of being recognized as a gentleman in his own town and county is clear. He was like Walter Scott and so many other Britishers in this, following the hereditary instinct, poor though it is, of his Anglo-Saxon forefathers, that what constitutes a free man is the possession of land. Landed, free. Landless, thrall. And though his father, on January 26, 1596, had by a deed, in which he is described as John Shakespeare Yeoman, sold part of the ground belonging to his Hen Henley Street, or birthplace property, to George Badger for two pounds, we find in the Herald's College a draft grant of arms, to this John Shakespeare as a gentleman, dated the 20th October 1596, which notwithstanding the doubt formally thrown on it, the Herald and Genealogist, Part 6, pages 503 through 505, edited by Dice, Shakespeare, 1866, page 21, inclines to think was executed. We know that then, as now, men rising or having risen in the world could and did buy arms for themselves, with often forged pedigrees attached to them. Harrison says in 1577-87, pages 128 through 129 of my edition, quote, Gentlemen whose ancestors are not known to come in with William, Duke of Normandy, for of the Saxon races yet remaining, we now make none account, much less of the British issue, do take their beginning in England after this manner in our times. Whosoever studieth the laws of the realm, whoso abideth in the university giving his mind to his book, or professeth physic, and the liberal sciences, or beside his service in the room of a captain in the wars, or good counsel given at home, whereby his commonwealth is benefited, can live without manual labor, and thereto is able and will bear the port, charge, and countenance of a gentleman. He shall, for money, have a coat and arms bestowed upon him by heralds, who in the charter of the same do of custom pretend antiquity, and service, and many gay things, and thereunto, being made so good chief, be called master, which is the title that men give to esquires and gentlemen, and reputed for a gentleman ever after, which is so much the less to be disallowed of, for that the prince doth lose nothing by it, the gentleman being so much subject to taxes and public payments, as is the yeoman or husbandsman, which he likewise doth bear the gladlier for the saving of his reputation. Being called also to the wars, for with the government of the commonwealth he meddleth little, Whatsoever it cost him, he will both array and arm himself accordingly, and shew the more manly courage, and all the tokens of the person which he representeth. No man hath hurt by it but himself, who peradventure will go in wider buskins than his legs will bear, or, as our proverb saith, now and then, bear a little sail than his boat is able to sustain. End quote. Sir Thomas Smith borrowed this passage. Now the money for the grant of arms to John Shakespeare, then known at Stratford as a yeoman, can hardly have come from him. 
without doubt his rising london sun supplied it and when the second grant was applied for and made in fifteen ninety nine the heralds divick and camden wouldn't quarter with shakespeare's arms those of the warwickshire gentlefolk the ardens of park hall park hall curdworth ermine a fess chegui or and azure but gave instead the arms of the more distant ardernes of alvinley and cheshire giels three crosslets fitchy and a chief or with a martlet for difference who were farther away from stratford and not likely to have notice of the matter or make any fuss about it moreover there is no existing record of the arden quartering ever having been assumed by shakespeare or his family on his monument are the shakespeare arms alone and they alone are impaled on his daughter susanna's monument with those of hall when he grew older had his position and married his younger daughter judith to a wine dealer's son he no doubt gave up the ambitious fancy of his earlier days in or before easter term of the thirty-ninth of elizabeth fifteen ninety seven shakespeare bought of william underhill for sixty pounds new place a house and grounds at the corner of the guild chapel lane and chapel street leading to the grammar school and church the house was built by sir hugh clopton about fourteen ninety bought by a stratford attorney william bott in fifteen sixty three and sold by him to william underhill in fifteen sixty seven in the note of the fine levied on the sale to shakespeare underhill is described as generosus a gentleman but shakespeare is not so called and as in fines the description of the property was almost always doubled we find here as in the double garden and orchard on the sale of the birthplace property that there were two barns and two gardens included shakespeare repaired new place long after his death a new house was built probably on its foundations and of these a few scraps can still be seen owing to mr hallowell's care he got up a subscription to buy the place early in fifteen ninety eight shakespeare wanted to lay out more money in the neighbourhood of stratford and was nibbling at the tithes of which he afterwards bought a moiety or half part in sixteen o five abraham sturley writing on january twenty fourth fifteen ninety seven ninety eight from stratford to a friend in Lon london evidently richard quiney father of shakespeare's future wine-dealing son-in-law says quote, it seemeth by him your father that our countryman mr shakespeare is willing to disperse some money upon some odd yard land or other at shottery or near about us he thinketh it a very fit pattern to move him to deal in the manner of our tithes by the instructions you can give him thereof and by the friends he can make therefore we think it a fair mark for him to shoot at and not unpossible to hit it obtained would advance him indeed and would do us much good hallowell octavo one seventy two folio one forty a subsidy roll dated october first fifteen ninety eight shows that a namesake no relation of our poet was assessed thirteen shillings fourpence on property in the parish of st helen's bishopsgate london quote, affidavit william shakespeare five pounds thirteen shillings fourpence end quote. during a scarcity of grain at stratford quote, a note of corn and malt there was taken dated february fourth fifteen ninety seven ninety eight and among the dwellers in chapel street ward is entered as a holder of grain quote, william shakespeare ten quarters end quote. in this year too is the following entry in the chamberlain's account quote, paid to mr shakespeare for one load of stone tenpence end quote. as the repairs of new place were probably going on the poet and not his father was probably the seller of the stone in a dateless and unsigned letter to my loving son richard quiney at the bell in carter lane delivered these in london evidently written by adrian quiney of stratford and perhaps in fifteen ninety eight is the following sentence quote, if you bargain with william shakespeare or receive money therefore bring your money home that you may End quote. next comes the only letter written to shakespeare that has survived to us it is from his friend the above-named richard quiney asking for the loan of thirty pounds quote, loving countrymen i am bold of you as of a friend craving your help with thirty pounds upon mr bushels and my security or mr mittens with me mr roswell is not come to london as yet and i have a special cause you shall friend me much in helping me out of all the debts i owe in london i thank god and much quiet my mind which would not be indebted i am now towards the court in hope for, of answer for the dispatch of my business 
you shall neither lose credit nor money by me the lord willing and now but persuade yourself so as i hope and you shall not need to fear but with all hearty thankfulness i will hold my time and content your friend and if we bargain farther you shall be the paymaster yourself my time bids me hasten to an end and so i commit this to your care and hope of your help i fear i shall not be back this night from the court haste the lord be with you and with us all amen from the bell in carter lane the twenty fifth october fifteen ninety eight yours in all kindness richard quiney to my loving good friend and countryman mr william shakespeare delivered this end quote. On November 4th, 1598, the before-named Abraham Sturley writes from Stratford, quote, to his most loving brother, Mr. Richard Quiney, at the Bell in Carter Lane at London, your letter of the 25th of October imported that our countryman, Mr. William Shakespeare, would procure us money, which I will like of, as I shall hear when and where and how, and I pray let not go that occasion, if it may sort to any indifferent conditions also that if money might be had for thirty or forty pounds a lease and etc might be procured in fifteen ninety eight came mere's praise of shakespeare and a list of his poems and plays already noted on page sixty four note two and in the same year shakespeare acted in ben jonson's famous comedy of every man in his humour in fifteen ninety eight also the theatre was built by james burbage where his and his sons's or shakespeare's company played was pulled down and rebuilt as the globe on bankside southwark in fifteen ninety nine and shakespeare being a quote unquote, deserving man was taken as one of the partners in the profits of that they call the house see introduction to henry v page ten note one that is the chief actor's share not including that of the burbages as owners of the lease of the theatre from sir matthew brand he got him quote, a fellowship and a cry of players end quote. hamlet Act three, scene two, page one twenty six, though not quote, half a share. End quote. I take this admission as a partner into the profits of the new globe as the start of a new period in Shakespeare's life. It marks definitely his success in London better than his purchase of new place at Stratford does. Number three, the third period of Shakespeare's life, though I call it the period of assured success, opens darkly like the dark third period of his plays, that of his greatest tragedies in january sixteen o one sixteen hundred o one essex rebellion breaks out and for his share in it lord southampton shakespeare's patron is imprisoned in the tower where he stays till james the first accession in sixteen o three see page thirty six an introduction to julius caesar on september eighth sixteen o one shakespeare's father john shakespeare was buried at stratford on may day sixteen o two shakespeare buys of william and john combe for three hundred and twenty pounds a hundred and seven acres of arable land in the parish of old stratford and as he was not then at stratford the conveyance was delivered to his brother gilbert on september twenty eighth sixteen o two walter gatley surrendered to shakespeare a cottage with its appurtenances in walker street alias dead lane stratford near new place and by a fine levied in michaelmas term sixteen o two we learn that shakespeare bought of hercules underhill for sixty pounds a messwidge with two barns two orchards and two gardens in stratford the doubling was no doubt due to the fancy addition in the note of the fine in a most interesting play the return from parnassus which is dated sixteen o two from its mentioning the queen's day hazlitt's dodsley nine one sixty one occurs the following testimony to shakespeare's powers ib one ninety four quote kemp few of the university pen plays well they smell too much of that writer Ovid, and that writer Metamorphosis, and talk too much of Prosperina and Jupiter. Why, here's our fellow Shakespeare, puts them all down. Ay, and Ben Jonson, too. Oh, that Ben Jonson is a pestilent fellow. He brought up Horace, giving the poets a pill. But our fellow Shakespeare hath given him a purge, that made him beray his credit. Burbage. It's a shrewd fellow indeed. End quote. Inglesby's Century of Praise, 1874, page 39. On March 24, 1602 03, Queen Elizabeth died. Shakespeare had written on her in Midsummer Night's Dream those delightful lines on the quote, fair vestal throned in the West, the imperial votaress, Act 2, Scene 2, page 40. She had quote, gra graced his desert 
and to his lays opened her royal care ear, end quote. As Chettle says in his England's Morning Garment, 1603, New Shakespeare Society's Illusion Books, page 98. She had been, quote, so taken by his plays, as Ben Jonson said in his lines to the memory of Shakespeare. She had so liked Falstaff that she had ordered his creator to show him in love. See Introduction to the Merry Wives, page 9. And yet, as Chettle complains, quote, the silver-tongued Melisert, Shakespeare, did not drop from his honeyed muse one sable tear, end quote. His company no doubt expected favors from James I through one of their members, Lawrence Fletcher, who had acted before James in Scotland with the English actors who were there between October 1599 and December 1601, and who was granted the freedom of the city of Aberdeen on October 22, 1601, as, quote, comedian to his majesty. Accordingly, ten days after James had reached London, he, by warrant, dated May 17, 1603, licensed Fletcher's or Shakespeare's company, quote, These are servants, Lawrence Fletcher, William Shakespeare, Richard Burbage, Augustine Phillips, John Hemmings, Henry Condell, William Sly, Robert Arman, Richard Cowley, and the rest of their associates, freely to use and exercise the art and faculty of playing comedies, tragedies, histories, interludes, morals, pastorals, stage plays, and such other like, as well for the recreation of our loving subjects, as for our solace and pleasure, when we shall think good to see them during our pleasure, and the said comedies, tragedies, histories, interludes, morals, pastorals, stage plays, and such like, to show and exercise publicly to their best commodity, when the infection of the plague shall decrease, as well within their now usual house called the Globe, within our county of Surrey, and also within any town halls or moot halls or other convenient places within the liberties and freedom of any other city, university, town, or borough whatsoever within our said realms and dominions. End quote. Shakespeare's company was thus changed from the Lord Chamberlain's servants to the king's players, but it is quite clear from the warrant and the Burbage's memorial of 1635, see Introduction to Henry V, pages 10 through 12, that when the warrant was issued, the company did not play at the Blackfriars Theatre, as that had been then for some time, quote, leased out to one Evans that first set up the boys, commonly called the Queen's Majesty's Children of the Chapel, end quote. It is also quite clear that when, evidently after 1603, the Burbages bought back, quote, the lease remaining from Evans with our money, end quote, Shakespeare was still an actor. For the Burbages say, they placed in the Blackfriars, quote, men players, which were Hemmings, Condal, Shakespeare, and etc., end quote. I see no reason to doubt that Shakespeare remained an actor as long as he stayed in London. It is possible that his sonnet 111 might have been written as late as 1607-08, the later the better, I think, as showing a reason why he'd like to turn his back on London. The plague of which James I warrant speaks is mentioned by Stowe on pages 1004 15, 1425 of his Annals, edition 1605. It stopped the king from riding from the tower through the city, as was customary before coronations. The citizens were ordered not to come to Westminster. Wednesday, August 5th, and every succeeding Wednesday were appointed to be kept holy for the offering of prayers, quote, while the heavy hand of God by the plague of pestilence continued among us, end quote. And between December 23rd, 1602, and December 22, 1603, there died of the plague 30,578 souls. After the latter date, Stowe does not mention the plague. It, is pro it probably stopped gradually, must certainly have been over by March. As for the procession of King James, his Queen Anne, and son Henry, on March 15, 1603-04, to the city of London, the king's players, as part of the household, were each given four yards and a half of red cloth, and the first name in the list of nine players is William Shakespeare, from the accompt of Sir George Hound, knight, master of the great wardrobe, to James I. Athenaeum, April 30th, 1864, New Shakespeare Society, translation, 1877 through 9, page 11. And on April 9th, 1604, the King's Council wrote a letter to the Lord Mayor of London and the magistrates of Middlesex and Surrey, directing them to allow the king's company, or Shakespeare's, and the queen's, and princes, quote, 
publicity to exercise their plays in their several usual houses and etc. End quote. Was Shakespeare revising Hamlet, the second or genuine quarto which was published in 1604? Writing Measure for Measure, the tone of the play would suit a plague struck city, see introduction to Measure for Measure, page 10, and planning Othello during his enforced leisure. On July 24, 1604, Shakespeare bought for 440 pounds the remaining 32 years term of the moiety, or half of a 92 years lease granted in 1544, of the great and small tithes of Stratford, Old Stratford, Bishopton, and Welcome. No doubt the same property that he'd been after in January 1597-98, and the conveyance is from, quote, Ralph Husband, Esquire, to William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon, gentlemen, end quote. It must have been a good purchase, as it brought in 60 pounds a year, that is, paid 5% on the whole of the purchase money during the 32 years, and brought back besides, in yearly installments, 38 pounds, which could be reinvested as they came in, 1,260 pounds for the 440 pounds. Augustine Phillips of Shakespeare's Company, see Introduction to Richard II, page 8, the Burbage's Memorial Introduction to Henry V, and James I Warrant, page 188 above, by his will, dated May 1605, leaves, quote, William Shakespeare a 30 shilling piece in gold, end quote. Gunpowder plot, plot, November 5th, 1605. In 1607, Shakespeare's eldest daughter, Susanna, being then 24, married. On June 7th, Dr. John Hall, a physician at Stratford of large practice, to the English notes of whose cures of patients, including his own wife and daughter, himself, the poet Drayton, and etc., I have alluded in the introduction to Pericles, when stating my belief that Dr. Hall is to some extent embodied in Saramon of that play. Had he but cured Shakespeare in 1616 instead of letting him die, we should have had an interesting account of the success. Possibly some successor of Ireland and our Victorian Shakespeare forgers will produce an earlier cure of Shakespeare from the thousand notes of cases of which Dr. Hall's translator speaks in his postscript. On December 31st, Shakespeare's youngest brother, Edmund, player, was buried at St. Saviour's, Southwark, close to the Globe Theatre, and twenty shillings were paid for a forenoon knell of the great bell. Shakespeare's first granddaughter, Elizabeth Hall, the only child of her parents, was baptized on February 21, 1607-08, and on 1608, September 9th, Mary Shakespeare, widow, our poet's mother, was buried at Stratford. On October 16th, Shakespeare stands godfather to a boy, William Walker, son of Henry Walker of Stratford, chosen alderman January 3rd, 1605-06, to whom he afterwards left by his will twenty shillings in gold. In 1608 died Thomas Whittington, shepherd to Richard Hathaway, and by his will left, quote, unto the poor of Stratford forty shillings, that is in the hand of Anne Shakespeare, wife unto Mr. William Shakespeare, and is due debt unto me, being paid to mine executor, by the said William Shakespeare or his assigned. In August 1608, Shakespeare brought an action against John Addenbrooke for a debt. After several months' delay, a verdict was given in Shakespeare's favor for six pounds and one pound four shillings costs. But as the defendant couldn't be found, Shakespeare sued Addenbrooke's bail, Thomas Hornby, for the money. The latest date noted in the record is June 7, 1609. Number four. In or about 1609, after the period of his great tragedies, Grandfather Shakespeare is supposed to have left London for his new life at Stratford, his fresh delight in all its flowers and scenes, its sweet girls and country sports. There is nothing definite to fix the change to any one year. But as Shakespeare's sonnets and Pericles were both published, evidently without his leave, in 1609, as a new tone, a new scent as of violets or sweetbriar, breathes from his plays in and after 1609, as the later ones are loose in dramatic construction, as if written away from the theatre, as Shakespeare must, before he made his will, have sold or released to his partners all his interest in the Globe and Blackfriars profits, and in his plays we conclude that his leaving town dates from 1609 or thereabouts, though the first Stratford tidings seem against the notion. In September 1609, Thomas Green, the town clerk of Stratford, says that a G. Brown might stay longer in his Green's house, quote, the rather because I perceived I might stay another year at New Place, end quote. 
Green may have been living there with his cousin Shakespeare. If not, Shakespeare cannot have settled at New Place till later. By June 21, 1611, Thomas Green is probably in his own house, as an order was made that the town is, quote, to repair the churchyard wall at Mr. Green's dwelling place, end quote, Hallowell's History of New Place. In a list of donations, quote, collected towards the charge of prosecuting the bill in Parliament for the better repair of the highways, and amending diverse defects in the statutes already made, end quote, dated Wednesday, September 11, 1611, the name of Mr. William Shakespeare is found in the margin with no sum to it. This manuscript, says Mr. Hallowell in his folio Life, page 202, evidently relates to Stratford. The draft of a bill to be filed before Lord Ellesmere by Richard Lane of Austin in the county of Warwick, Esquire, Thomas Green of Stratford upon Avon in the said county of Warwick, Esquire, and William Shakespeare of Stratford upon Avon aforesaid in the said county of Warwick, gentlemen, undated but seemingly drawn up in 1612, shows Shakespeare in a lawsuit about his share in the tithes which he had brought in 1605. Some of the lessees of the tithes had refused to pay their share of the reserved rent of 27 pounds 13 shillings fourpence, and had thus driven Shakespeare and a few others to pay the defaulter's share as well as their own, in order to prevent the lease from being forfeited. The draft bill states Shakespeare's income from the tithes of corn and grain, wool and lamb, prithy tithes, oblations, and alterages as being sixty pounds a year. His brother Richard was buried at Stratford on February 4, 1612-13. On the 10th of March in that year, Shakespeare bought for £140 from Henry Walker, citizen and minstrel of London, a house and a piece of ground near the Black Friars Theatre, quote, abutting upon a street leading down to Puddle Wharf on the east part, right against the King's Majesty's wardrobe, end quote. But as Shakespeare only paid £80 of the purchase money, he next day mortgaged the property to the vendor, Henry Walker, for the odd £60, and let the house, which he mentions in his will, to John Robinson, the, te the then tenant of it. On June 29, 1613, the Globe Theatre on Bankside, Blackfriars, was burnt down during a performance of Henry VIII, as I have noted in the introduction to that play, and we can fancy Shakespeare's feelings on hearing of the destruction of the old house, for so many years the scene of his triumphs. He must have been glad to see its rebuilding at once begun. In a paper dated six September 5, 1614, Shakespeare is mentioned among the, quote, ancient freeholders in the fields of Old Stratford and Welcome, viz. Mr. Shakespeare, Thomas Parker, Mr. Lane, Sir Francis Smith, Mace, Arthur Caudry, and Mr. Wright, Vicar of Bishopton. Thus, Mr. Shakespeare, four-yard land, no common nor ground beyond Gospel Bush, nor ground in Sandfield, nor none in Slow Hill Field beyond Bishopton, nor none in the enclosures beyond Bishopton, end quote and by an agreement dated October 8, 1614, between Shakespeare and William Replingham, a joint owner with him of the tithes before mentioned, Replingham covenanted with Shakespeare to repay him all such loss as he should incur in respect of the decreasing of the yearly value of the tithes held by Replingham and Shakespeare. By reason of any enclosure or decay of tillage intended in the tithable fields by the said Replingham, to the enclosure of the Welcome Common and Hills, whence the best view of Stratford is to be got, the corporation was strongly opposed, as so many writers of Tudor time were, like to in, were to like enclosures because they cared for their poorer neighbors, and the corporation clerk or lawyer, Shakespeare's kinsman, Thomas Green, was in London on this business when he made the following memorandum, quote, 1614, Jovis, 17 number, my cousin Shakespeare coming yesterday to town, I went to see him how he did, he told me that they assured him they meant to enclose no further than to Gospel Bush, and so up straight, leaving out part of the dingles to the field, to the gate in Clopton Hedge, and take in Salisbury's peace, and that they mean in April to survey the land, and then to give satisfaction, and not before, and he and Mr. Hall say they think there will be nothing done at all. Folio Life, page 222. End quote. About a fortnight after the above date, says Dice, Green, having left Shakespeare in London, returned to Stratford, where he continued his notes. Quote, 23 December, A. Hall. 
letters written, one to Mr. Mainwaring, another to Mr. Shakespeare, with almost all the company's hands to either. I also write myself to my cousin Shakespeare the copies of all our acts, and then also a knot of the inconveniences would happen by the enclosure. The letter to Arthur Mainwaring, Lord Ellesmere's domestic auditor, is still preserved, but the more interesting one has perished. A page of Thomas Green's diary survives, in which are the three following entries relating to Shakespeare's business and the enclosures. Number 1, 1614. 15. Quote, 10th January, 1614, Mr. Mainwaring and his agreement for me with my cousin Shakespeare. Number 2, 1614, 15. Quote, 9th January, 1614, Mr. Replingham, 28th October, article with Mr. Shakespeare, and then I was put in by Thursday. Number 3, 1615, quote, 1st September, Mr. Shakespeare told Mr. J. Green, that I was not able to bear the enclosing of welcome, end quote. Folio, Life, page 223. Quote, In the 17th report of the Historical Manuscripts Commission, 1907, says Monroe, is the account, page 23, of the discovery in the Earl of Rutland's manuscripts of the entry of a payment to Shakespeare and Richard Burbage for an impresso for the Earl. Shakespeare received 44 shillings in gold for his share, and Burbage a like sum for painting and making the impresso, which appears to have been a device and motto borne by the Earl in a tournament. The tilting, which took place on March 24, 1612-13, is described by Sir Henry Wat Watton, Reliquae Wattononiae, 1685, pages 405-6, to in a letter to Sir Edmund Bacon, March 31, 1613, where the names of twenty tilters are given, and among them Rutland, and where the devices are noted of William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and his brother, Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery. Rutland's device is, unfortunately, not described. The Shakespeare mentioned here has always been considered to be our poet William, but Mrs. Stopes's opinion is that the person indicated may have been John Shakespeare, the bitmaker, and not the poet. See her article, Athenaeum, May 16, 1908. In 1614, died John Combe, bailiff or factor to the Earl of Warwick, and by his will left, quote, to Mr. William Shakespeare, five pounds, end quote. In the same will is mentioned, quote, Parson's clothes, alias Shakespeare's clothes, end quote. This year, too, the Stratford Corporation, according to their custom, when a strange preacher preached before them, sent a present of wine to one, a Puritan, no doubt, stopping at Shakespeare's house. Chamberlain's account charges, quote, item, for one quart of sack and one quart of claret wine given to a preacher at the new place, 20D, end quote. On January 25, 1615-16, the fair copy of Shakespeare's will was ready, but he put off executing it till March 25th, when he had some alterations made in it, after the marriage of his younger daughter Judith, then 31, who, like her mother, wedded, on February 10th, a man younger than herself, though only four years now, not eight. Thomas Quiney, vintner and wine merchant of Stratford, son of the Richard Quiney, who in 1598 asked Shakespeare to lend him 30 pounds, page 184 above, and who died on May 31st, 1602, while bailiff of Stratford. From the fact of Judith having made her mark to a deed, instead of signing her name, it has been supposed that she could not write, but this is not certain, as many folk well-known in history, who could write, have still put their marks to deeds. Susanna Hall could write fairly. Shakespeare's Blackfriars house was part of a large property belonging to the Bacon family, and when, when this was cut up and sold, Bacon's widow Anne retained the title deeds of it, instead of handing them over to the largest purchaser to hold for the use of himself and his fellow buyers. So on April 26, 1615, Shakespeare associated himself with these fellow buyers, in a bill of complaint to recover the title deeds which were detained by the widow's heir, Matthew Bacon. The defendant in his answer on May 5th denies that he holds these deeds in trust and maintains that he cannot deliver them up until discharged by the court. The Lord Chancellor's decision is with the plaintiffs and orders that Matthew Bacon is to bring the deeds to court to be disposed of as shall be thought fit, and an intimation is given that further action may be taken if the plaintiffs care to do so. 
Having executed his will on March 25th, Shakespeare died at New Place on April 23rd, 1616, and was buried in the chancel of Stratford Church on the 25th. The only report as to the cause of his death is in the diary, printed in 1839, of the Reverend John Ward, who was appointed vicar of Stratford in 1662, that, quote, Shakespeare, Drayton, and Ben Jonson had a merry meeting, and it seems drank too hard, for Shakespeare died of a fever there contracted. Mr. Hallowell has in his history of New Place suggested another cause, that the pigsties and nuisances which the corporation books show to have existed in Chapel Lane, which ran the whole length of New Place, bred the fever of which Shakespeare is said to have died. Mr. Hallowell gives several extracts from the books, as, quote, 1605, the Chamberlains shall give warning to Henry Smith to pluck down his pig's coat, which is built near the chapel wall and the house of office privy there, end quote. New Place, page 29. End chapter 10. Chapter 11 of Shakespeare, Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel Malden, Houston, Texas. Shakespeare, Life and Work by F.J. Furnival and John Monroe. Chapter 11, Shakespeare's Will, Tomb and Descendants. Shakespeare's Will, by his will, Shakespeare, like so many other unjust Englishmen, in accordance with the unjust custom of their country, settled almost all his property on his eldest child, and gave the younger much less. He bequeathed his daughter Judith Quiney only, one, a hundred and fifty to a hundred pounds, as a marriage portion, with ten percent interest on it till it was paid, and fifty pounds on her releasing her right in his Rowington copyhold tenement, in Dead Lane, page 186 above, to her sister Susanna Hall. Two, 150 pounds more, if she or any issue of hers should be living at the end of three years from Shakespeare's death, with interest thereon at 10 pounds per cent, in the meantime. If she should die without issue in three years, she lived till February 1638-39, surviving her three grandchildren, Shakespeare gave 100 pounds to his niece, granddaughter, Elizabeth Hall, and fifty pounds to be invested for, and the income from it paid to his sister, Joan Hart, during her life, the principal going equally among her children at her death. But if Judith Quiney survived the three years, as she did, her one hundred and fifty pounds was to be invested, the interest paid to her during her life, and the principal among her children after her death. Also, if her husband should settle on her, and her issue lands worth the 150 pounds, in the judgment of Shakespeare's executors, they were to pay the husband the said CLLI, the contraction, for 150 pounds. Then Shakespeare gives his sister, Joan Hart, 20 pounds and all his wearing apparel, and a life interest in the house in Stratford wherein she dwelt, she paying 12 pence a year to rent, rent for it. He also gave her three sons, William, Blank, and Michael, 5 pounds each. Then came the small legacies, all his plate, except his broad silver and gilt bowl, which he gave to his daughter Judith, he bequeathed to the said Elizabeth Hall, ten pounds to the Stratford poor, his sword to Mr. Thomas Combe, five pounds to Thomas Russell, Esquire, thirteen pounds, six shillings, eight pence to Francis Collins of Warwick, then for rings, twenty-six shillings, eight pence each to Hamlet Sadler, William Reynolds, quote, my fellows, John Hemmings, R Richard Burbage, and Henry Cundall, end quote, 20 shillings in gold to his godson, William Walker, and 26 shillings, eight pence to Mr. John Nash. Then came the main devise of the will. He gave his new place, his tenement in Henley Street, his Stratford, Old Stratford, Bishopton, and Welcome Tithes, his Blackfriars house near the wardrobe, let to Robinson, and all his other hereditaments, to his daughter Susanna Hall for her life, and then to her son successively in tail male, and in default of sons to his said niece, that is, granddaughter eight years old, Elizabeth Hall, in tail male, and in default of such issue to his daughter Judith Quiney in tail male, and in default of such issue to his own right heirs. 
Then, by an interline bequest, he gave his wife his second best bed with the furniture. She would be entitled to dower in his freeholds and to free bench in his coffee holds if the custom of the manor gave it. All the rest of his personality, after payment of debts, legacies, and funeral expenses, he gave to his son in law, John Hall, gentleman, and his daughter Susanna, John Hall's wife, and made them executors of his will, the said Thomas Russell and Francis Collins being overseers of it, to see that the executors did their duty. The will was witnessed by Francis Collins, Julius Shaw, John Robinson, Hamnet Sadler, Robert Watcott, and if the law was then as it is now, Collins and Sadler lost their claim to their legacies by witnessing the will. The will is on three sheets of moderate size, signed by Shakespeare, on the margin of the first sheet, at the foot of the second, and about the middle of the third. It was proved on June 22, 1616, by John Hall, who alone acted as executor, power being reserved as usual for Susanna Hall to prove when she wanted to. The note of the proof contains the words, quote, INV period EX period, end quote, which shows that Dr. Hall exhibited an inventory of Shakespeare's goods. And I long hoped that the fire of London and the rats and rain of and in the St. Paul's Cathedral rooms, where the 17th century inventories long were, might have left this Shakespeare inventory in one of the eight and twenty boxes in the probate office containing these inventories. After I saw them in an underground room in Doctors' Commons some ten or eleven years ago, I tried to get the treasury to appoint a clerk to catalog these inventories, but in vain, and so was obliged to have a turn at them myself in the spring of 1881. Mr. J. Shaloner Smith, the then superintendent of the Literary Search Department, and I, tested every one of the boxes in all its parts, giving about three hours to each box, but we could not find one inventory of Shakespeare's time. All but some two or three percent were of the date 1660 to 1700, though a few went up to 1530 and a few others down to 1724. We were forced to conclude that all the early 17th century inventories were burnt in the fire of London. The only inventory we found in any way relating to Shakespeare was that of Sir John Barnard, the second and surviving husband of Shakespeare's granddaughter Elizabeth Hall, and in it the only entries that could relate to Shakespeare's land and new place were, quote, a rent at Stratford-upon-Avon, four pounds, and old goods and lumber at stratford upon avon at four pounds end quote. when the calendar of these inventories is made lady barnard's will will no doubt turn up at the conclusion of this chapter is printed the text of shakespeare's will itself and the reduced facsimiles which follow give some idea of its appearance to the reader nowadays over shakespeare's grave in the chancel of stratford church is a dark flat tombstone with this inscription which Dowdell says was made by himself a little before his death. Quote, Good friend, for Jesus' sake forbear to dig the dust enclosed here. Blessed be the man that spares these stones, and cursed be he that moves my bones. End quote. On the left or north wall of the chancel, against the blocked up bottom of the second window from the communion table, is the monument to Shakespeare, containing the celebrated Stratford life size bust, evidently cut from a death mask and said by Dugdale, Life, Diary, page 99, to have been, quote, made by one Ger Gerard Johnson, a well-known sculptor. This bust and the Druzhout engraving in the first folio, probably from a now-lost Druzhout painting, are the only authentic representations of Shakespeare, though the oil portrait in the Stratford Memorial Library is no doubt an early copy of the lost Druzhout original, or painted from the engraving with slight variations. I don't believe that the sketch of Strat the Stratford bust in Dugdale's Warwickshire is authoritative, but see Mrs. Stokes' paper on it in the extinct monthly review. The Shandos, Felton, and other portraits, and the Kesselstadt death mask, fine though it is, have no real evidence whatever in their favor. The bust was originally colored, but Malone stupidly had it pa all painted white. It has, however, since been repainted in the original colors, eyes light hazel, hair and beard auburn, cheeks ruddy, sleeve doublet scarlet, sleeveless gown black, neck band and wristbands white, upper part of the cushion, under the hands green, under half crimson, edge cord and tassels gilt. The left hand rests on a piece of white paper, the right holds a pen and rests on the cushion. The expression of the, the face is stolid and staring. Below the bust is the inscription following, quote, Judicio Pilium, 
genio Socratum, arte maronum, terra tegit, populus, moeret, Olympus habet. Stay, passenger, why goest thou by so fast? Read if thou canst, whom envious death hath placed within this monument, Shakespeare, with whom quick nature did, whose name doth deck th his tomb far more than cost, such all that he hath writ leaves living art but page to serve his wit. Obit Año Doi 1616, Etatis 53, DA 23, April. End quote. We must recollect that 23 April then was the same day that we call the 3rd of May now. As John J. Bond says in his handy book, 1866, page 27, quote, some writers have supposed that both Cervantes and Shakespeare died on the same day, whereas the fact is that there was ten days difference between the dates of the death of the one and the other. Michael de Cervantes Saavedra, the author of Don Quixote, died on the 23rd of April, 1616, at Madrid on Saturday, according to the new style of writing dates in use at that time in Spain, which style had been adopted there as early as the year 1582. Year Letters, CB, 1616, New Style, 23rd of April, 1616, Saturday. And William Shakespeare died on the 23rd of April, 1616, at Stratford-on-Avon on Tuesday, according to the old style of writing dates at that time in use in England, the new style not having been adopted in England at that time and not until the year 1752. Year Letters, GF, 1616, Old Style, 23rd of April, 1616, Tuesday. Saturday, 23rd of April, 1616, New Style, corresponded with Saturday, 13th of April, 1616, Old Style. Tuesday, 23rd of April, 1616, Old Style, corresponded with Tuesday, 3rd of May, 1616, New Style. Hence it is shown that Cervantes died 10 days before Shakespeare. End quote. And don't let us forget that on this Tuesday, April 23rd, Old Style, or May 3rd, New, the great Oliver Cromwell entered himself as a student at Sydney Sussex College, Cambridge. Shakespeare's wife died on August 6th, 1623, being 67 years old. His eldest daughter, Susanna Hall, died July 11th, 1649, age 66, having survived her husband, John Hall, who died November 25th, 1635, aged 60. His granddaughter, Elizabeth Hall, married first Thomas Nash on April 22, 1626, and after his death on April 4, 1647, namely June 5, 1649, a widower, John Barnard, of Abington, Northamptonshire, who was knighted in 1661. But she had no child by either husband, and she died at Abington and was buried there on February 17, 1669-70. The three tombstones of Shakespeare's wife, daughter Susanna, and her husband, Dr. John Hall, lie by his in the chancel of Stratford Church. On Mrs. Hall's is the following epitaph, which shows that the daughter had both the father's wit and tender heart. Witty above her sex, but that's not all. Wise to salvation was good Mistress Hall. Something of Shakespeare was in that, but this. Holy of him with whom she's now in bliss. Then passenger hast ne'er a tear, to weep with her that wept with all, but wept yet set herself to cheer them up with comforts cordial. Her love shall live, her mercy spread, when thou hast ne'er a tear to shed. Shakespeare's younger daughter, Judith Quiney, was buried at Stratford on February 9, 1661 62, having survived her three sons Shakespeare, baptized November 23, 1616, buried May 8, 1617. Richard, baptized February 9th, 1617-18, buried February 26th, 1638-39. Thomas, baptized January 23rd, 1619-20, buried January 28th, 1638-39. No entry of the burial of her husband, Thomas Quiney, is in the Stratford Register. Shakespeare's sister, Joan Hart, was buried at Stratford on November 4th, 1646. To Joan's grandson, Thomas Hart, Lady Barnard, who with her mother and first husband had barred the entail under Shakespeare's will, left the Henley Street or birthplace houses, and these houses were sold in 1847 by descendants of the Harts to trustees for the nation. 
new place was sold after Sir John Barnard's death to Sir Edward Walker. His only child, Barbara, married Sir John Clopton, and she brought New Place back into the family of its old possessors. About 1720, Sir Hugh Clopton pulled down New Place and built a new house, probably more or less on the old foundations. His son-in-law and executor, Henry Talbot, sold the property to the Reverend Francis Gastrell, vicar of Frodsham, Cheshire. And this confounded man not only cut down the 17 in 1756 the so-called Shakespeare's mulberry tree in the garden, because folks wanting to see it bothered him, but also in 1759 pulled down Sir Hugh Clopton's fresh new place. On the property coming into the market in 1862, Mr. J. O. Hallowell Phillips got up a subscription and bought it, afterwards added to it the site of the theater built on part of the old garden and other grounds adjacent, laid bare the foundations of the house, put the whole place into nice order, and in 1876 handed it over to the Corporation of Stratford for the use of the public, subject to visitors paying a small fee, as at the birthplace. The gratitude of every lover of Shakespeare is due to the late Mr. Hallowell Phillips, however little they may think of his critical power, not only for his exertions to secure a new place for the nation, but also for his long searches into the records of Shakespeare's life, and for never having forged a document or an emendation, though unluckily, unluckily he reprinted other folks' forgeries and at first declared them genuine. As he said, such mistakes as he's made were at least honest ones. In conclusion, let me say that the London achieved greatness of this Shakespeare is not to be understood without some knowledge of the little country town where he first looked out on the world. Go to Stratford-on-Avon and see the town where Shakespeare was born and bred and died the country over which he wandered and played when a boy, whose beauties and whose lore as a man he put into his plays. Go either in spring, in April, quote, when the greatest poet was born in nature's sweetest time, end quote, and let Mr. Wise, Shakespeare, his birthplace and its neighborhood, page 44, 58, and etc., tell you how everything is full of beauty that you'll see. Or go in full summer, as I did one Saturday afternoon in July 1874. See the little low room where tradition says Shakespeare was born, though his father did not buy the house till eleven years after his birth. Look at the foundation of New Place. Walk on the site of Shakespeare's house, in the garden whose soil he must often have trod, thinking of his boyhood and hasty marriage of, of London, with its trials and triumphs, and the wonders he had created for its delight. Follow his body past the school where he learnt, to its grave in the Avonside church ringed with elms. See the worn slab that covers his bones, with wives and daughters beside. Look up at the bust, which figures the case of the brain and heart that have so enriched the world, which shows you more truly than anything else what Shakespeare was life in the, like in the flesh. Try to see in those hazel eyes, those death-drawn lips, those ruddy cheeks, the light, the merriment, the tenderness, the wisdom, and love that once were theirs. Walk by the full and quiet Avon side, where the swan sails gently, by which the cattle feed. Ask yourself what word sums up your feelings on these scenes, and answer with me, peace. Next morning walk up the welcome road, across the old common lands, whose enclosing Shakespeare said quote, he, quote, was not able to bear, end quote. When up Rowley Bank, turn round, see the town nestle under its circling hills, shut in on the left by its green wall of trees. The corn is golden beside you. Meon Hill meets the sky in your front. Its shoulder slants sharply to the spire of the church, where Shakespeare's dust lies. Away on the right is Broadway, lit with the sun. Below it, the ridge of Rumor Hill, yellow for harvest. On the right passes leftwards into a dark belt of trees to the church, their hollows filled with blue haze. In this nest is Shakespeare's town. After gazing your fill on the fair scene before you, walk to the boat place, paddle out for the best view of the elm-framed church, then by its river-bordered side to the stream below, get a beautiful view of the tower through a vista of trees beyond the low waterfall, then pass by cattle, half knee-deep in the shallows, sluggishly whisking their tails, happily chewing the cud, go under wire-break bank, whose trees droop down to the river, whose wood pigeons greet you with coos past many groups of gray willows, with showers of wild roses between. Feathery reeds rise beside you, birds twitter about, the sky is blue overhead, your boat glides smoothly downstream. 
you feel the sweet content with which Shakespeare must have looked on the scene. Later, you wander to Shottery, to Anne Hathaway's cottage, where perchance in hot youth the poet made love. Then you ride through Charlotte Cote's tall elmed park, and see the deer whose ancestors he may have stolen. On to Warwick, with its castle rising grandly from Avon Bank, back to Stratford, with a glorious view from the hills, on your left in your homewards ride. Evening comes, you stroll again by the riverside, through groups of townsfolk pleasant to see, in well-to-do Sunday dress. From cross of the hill, you look at the fine view of church and town, backed by the welcome hills, through wire break and ripe corn. You walk to the bridge that brings you to the opposite level bank of the stream. Then you lie down, chatting of Shakespeare to your friend, while lovers in pairs pass lingering by, and the twilight comes. Then again you say that the peace of the place was fit for Shakespeare's end, and that the memory of its quiet beauty will never away from your mind. Yes, Stratford will help you to understand Shakespeare. Shakespeare's Will, in the Probate Registry, Somerset House, London. Vicesimo quinto de januari marti anno regni domini nostri Jacobi, nunc regis angiae, and etc. Decimo quarto et scotiae, 49. Anoche domini, 1616. T. William Shakespeare. In the name of God, amen. I, William Shakespeare, of Stratford-upon-Avon, in the country of Warwick, gentlemen, in perfect health and memory, God be praised, do make and ordain this my last will and testament in manner and form following. That is to say, first, I commend, commend my soul into the hands of God my Creator, hoping and assuredly believing, through the only merits of Jesus Christ my Savior, to be made partaker of life everlasting, and my body to the earth whereof it is made. Item. I give and bequeath unto my son and daughter Judith one hundred and fifty pounds of lawful English money, to be paid unto her in the manner and form following, that is to say, one hundred pounds in discharge of her marriage portion, within one year after my decease, with consideration after the rate of two shillings in the pound, for so long time as the same shall be unpaid unto her after my decease, and the fifty pounds residue, residue thereof upon her surrendering of, or giving of, such sufficient security, as the overseers of this my will shall like of, to surrender or grant all her estate and right that shall descend or come unto her after my decease, or that she now hath of, in, or to, one copyhold tenement, with the appurtenances, lying and being in Stratford-upon-Avon, aforesaid in the said con county of Warwick, being parcel or holden of, the manor of Rowington, unto my daughter Susanna Hall and her heirs forever. Item, I give and bequeath unto my said daughter Judith one hundred and fifty pounds more, if she or any issue of her body be living at the end of three years next ensuing the day of the date of this my will, during which time my executors are to pay her consideration from my decease according to the rate aforesaid, and if she die within the said term without issue of her body, then my will is, and I do give and bequeath one hundred pounds thereof to my niece Elizabeth Hall, and the fifty pounds to be set forth by my executors during the leaf of my sister Joan Hart, and the use and profit thereof coming shall be paid to my said sister Joan, and after her decease, the said fifty pounds shall remain amongst the children of my said sister, equally to be divided amongst them. But if my said daughter Judith be living at the end of the said three years, or any issue of her body, then my will is, and so I devise and bequeath the said hundred and fifty pounds to be set out by my executors and overseers for the best benefit of her and her issue, and the stock not to be paid unto her so long as she shall be married, and covert baron by my executors and overseers. But my will is that she shall have the consideration yearly paid unto her during her life and after her decease, the said stock and consideration to be paid to her children, if she have any, and if not, to her executors or assigned, she living the said term after my decease, provided that if such husband as she shall the end of the said three years be married unto, or at any after sick 
do sufficiently assure unto her and this issue of her body lands answerable to the portion by this my will given unto her and to be a judge so by my executors and overseers then my will is that the said hundred and fifty pounds shall be paid to such husband as shall make such assurance to his own use item i give and bequeath unto my said sister joan twenty pounds and all my wearing apparel to be paid and delivered within one year after my decease and i do will and devise unto her the house with the appurtenances in stratford wherein she dwelleth for her natural life under the yearly rent of twelve pence item i give and bequeath unto her three sons william hart blank hart and michael hart five pounds apiece to be paid within one year after my decease to be set out for her within one year after my decease by my executors with the advice and directions of my overseers for her best profit until her marriage and then the same with the increase thereof to be paid unto her item i give and bequeath unto her the said elizabeth hall all my plate except my broad silver and gilt bowl that i now have at the date of this my will item i give and bequeath unto the poor of stratford aforesaid ten pounds to mr thomas combe my sword to thomas russell esq five pounds and to francis collins of the borough of warwick in the county of warwick gentlemen thirteen pounds six shillings and eightpence to be paid within one year after my decease item i give and bequeath to mr richard Ty tyler the elder hamlet sadler twenty six shillings eightpence to buy him a ring to william reynolds gentlemen twenty six shillings eight pounds pence to buy him a ring to my godson william walker twenty shillings in gold to anthony nash gentleman twenty six shillings eight pence and to mr john nash twenty six shillings eight pence in gold and to my fellows john hemmings richard burbage and henry cundall twenty six shillings eight pence apiece to buy them rings item i give will bequeath and devise unto my daughter susanna hall for better enabling of her to perform this my will and towards the performance thereof all that capital messuage or tenement with the appurtenances in stratford aforesaid called the new place wherein i now dwell and two messuages or tenements with the appurtenances situate lying and being in henley street within the borough of stratford aforesaid and all my barns stables orchards gardens lands tenements and hereditaments whatsoever situate lying and being or to be had received perceived or taken within the towns hamlets villages fields and grounds of stratford upon avon old stratford bishopton and welcome or in any of them in the said county of warwick and also all that messuage or tenement with the appurtenances wherein one john robinson dwelleth situeth lying and being in the black friars in london near the wardrobe and all my other lands tenements and hereditaments whatsoever to have and to hold all and singular the said premises with their appurtenances unto the said susanna hall for and during the term of her natural life and after her decease to the first son of her body lawfully issuing and to the heirs males of the body of the said first son lawfully issuing and for default of such issue to the second son of her body lawfully issuing and to the heirs males of the body of the said second son lawfully issuing and for default of such heirs to the third son of the body of the said susanna lawfully issuing and of the heirs males of the body of the said third son lawfully issuing and for default of such issue the same so, so to be and remain it of the fourth son fifth sixth and seventh sons of her body lawfully issuing one after another and to the heirs males of the body, bodies of the said fourth fifth sixth and seventh sons lawfully issuing in such manner as it is before limited to be and remain to the first second and third sons of her body and to their heirs males and for default of such issue the said premises to be and remain to my said niece hall and the heirs males of her body lawfully issuing and for default of such issue to my daughter judith and the heirs males of her body lawfully issuing and for default of such issue to the right heirs of me the said william shakespeare for ever 
Item, I give unto my wife my second best bed with the furniture. Item, I give and bequeath to my said daughter, Judith, my broad silver gilt bowl. All the rest of my goods, chattel, leases, plate, jewels, and household stuff whatsoever, after my debts and legacies paid and my funeral expenses discharged, I give, devise, and bequeath to my son-in-law, John Hall, gentleman, and my daughter, Susanna, his wife, whom I ordain and make executors of this my last will and testament. And I do entreat and appoint the said Thomas Russell, Esquire, and Francis Collins, gentlemen, to be overseers hereof, and do revoke all former wills, and publish this to be my last will and testament, in witness whereof I have hereunto put my seal hand, the day and year first above written, by me, William Shakespeare. Witness to the publishing hereof, Francis Collins, Julius Shaw, John Robinson, Hamnet Sadler, Robert Whatcock. Probat fatum corum magistro, Guillermo Will Bird, legum doctore commission, and etc. 22nd die mensis uni, anno domini 1616, juramento Joannis Hall, unius executorum, and etc. qui, and etc. de bene, and etc. jurat reservat potestate, and etc., Susanna Hall, alteri executorum, and etc., cum venerit petitur, and etc., ind period, ex period. End of chapter 11. End of Shakespeare, Life and Work, by F.J. Furnival and John Monroe. Chapter 12 of Shakespeare, Life and Work. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Shakespeare, Life and Work by F. J. Furnival and John Monroe. Chapter 12, English Drama Before Shakespeare. It was happy for Elizabethan drama that it was not entirely the direct descendant of classical models, the limitations which choruses the acceptance of classical form and the implicit observance of dramatic unities would have entailed would have been a severe hindrance to that development towards freedom in the composition of plays which is to be seen in the works of the elizabethans and particularly of shakespeare in the earlier middle ages knowledge of the classical drama seems to have become almost universally extinct the orgiastic excesses of rome in the days of its debasement alienated the christian mind from all public spectacles and theatrical displays and though later on there are rare evidences here and there that antiquity was not quite forgotten in this respect the professed unsecular attitude of the leaders of the church and the possession of literacy only by those thus predisposed against the drama precluded any possibility whatever of a general revival of theatrical shows as ecclesiastical authority grew in power during the first four centuries its influence began to be felt on legislation and the result was that greater restrictions were placed on plays and on players yet though the church authorities practically triumphed in the end there are signs that their flocks still till a late date loved and frequented the spectacular apparently the universal mimetic instinct was difficult to crush and though father after father thundered his denunciations against the theatre and the circus the shows still went on till the seventh or eighth century when the roman theatre fell into decay the senesi thus cast adrift took part in the more or less public pantomimic shows just as much denounced as the theatre and finally not a little debased by the coarser tastes of their teutonic masters helped to swell the army of nomadic entertainers which figure so prominently in mediaeval life but while the attitude of the mediaeval church was not such that it could favour or help in dramatic productions it was developing in its own ritualistic displays the beginnings of a new theatrical cycle and thus as in greece where the drama evolved from the ritualistic mummeries of dionysus and in india 
the popular religion was to be greatly responsible for the revival of dramatic art and interest the services of the church had always been more or less mimetic particularly at easter and christmas afforded an opportunity for bringing home to the unlettered by means of effigies and living people in costume the story of the birth in the manger the adoration of the shepherds etc pollard points out that the beginning of the easter play was the solemn burial of the crucifix in the sepulchre on good friday and its disinterment on easter day with a pompous ritual it is easy to see how this principle of representation of biblical story to the illiterate to whom the ponderous latinity of the church was unintelligible had necessarily to develop and command expression in the vernacular firstly because of the interest it evoked in the people who loved shows of any kind and secondly because it helped them denied as the bible itself was to them to realize the force and setting of the scriptural stories some such attempts as this were made in monkish poetry as in the cursor mundi of the fourteenth century a colossal poem of nearly twenty four thousand lines which reviews the course of the world through its seven ages a plan more or less followed by the subsequent townly plays and was written in english as the author tells for the love of englishmen and that the common folk of england might understand the beginning and end of the world such books as these however appealed only to a class who possessed leisure and skill to read outside of this comparatively small circle remained the untutored masses of the people to these scenic representations specially appealed and for their sakes principally the church indulged in the early scriptural play which developed from the devotional enactment of the story covered by the liturgy from the earliest times the ceremony of mass was more or less mimetic and not this ceremony only but many others in the services of the church possessed what chambers has called the potentiality of dramatic development the first step in this development was the supplementing of tunes in the liturgy and the subsequent addition of texts or tropes for the supplements some of these tropes assumed a dialogue form most important was the quam quertus at first only an introit trope at easter but later a dialogued chant for the acting of the resurrection of christ and the visiting of the sepulchre on good friday the cross was placed before the altar and adored by the abbot and monks it was wrapped in a cerecloth carried to a sepulchre made for the occasion either at the altar or elsewhere and there deposited while the choir sung anthems on easter day the corresponding voiding of the sepulchre took place the additions to the original tropes were at first made only from the old stock of easter anthems but later proses and metrical hymns were added dramatic advance was made through the visit of the marys to the sepulchre they lifted the pall discovered the empty tomb and displayed the sermons in this place the text of the quem quertus was expanded by the addition of the victima pascali second quarter of the eleventh century then two singers accompanied the marys these were peter and john who displayed the grave clothes in its simplest form the quem quertus consists only of the dialogue between the marys an angel and the choir in the next form the apostles are added in the last the figure of the risen christ himself is shown earliest form twelfth century the later incident fourteenth century of the marys purchasing spices from an unguentarius may be due to the influence of the vernacular stage all this liturgical drama was capable of elaborate scenic effect the performers might wear most splendid vestments and the rest of the properties were part of the furniture of the church none of the action ever became actually detached from the service besides the quem quertus's easter there was established by the twelfth century the peregrini in which was enacted the journey to emmaus and the supper sometimes the disciples were joined by the magdalene in others the marys greeted the risen christ though this was probably after his introduction into the quem quertus all these plays are concerned solely with the resurrection the mere representation of the passion itself began in the planctus of the marys and st john round the cross which exists both in latin and the vernacular the earliest type is of the twelfth century 
christ sometimes joins in the dialogue and from this point was developed the drama of the passion which progressed mainly outside the walls of the church as important to the christian as easter was christmas when the christ was born the christmas trope was based on the older easter dialogue instead of the quem quertus in sepulchro o christa coli we have the quem quertus in precipa pastris de Cite. the officium pastorum or shepherd's office seems to have developed from the quem quertus in prosepa as the easter drama from the quem quertus in sepulchro a prosepa or crib was made behind the altar and in it was placed the image of the virgin after te deum five canons as the shepherds approached the west door of the choir while a boy robed like an angel sang of the good tidings the shepherds approached the crib and quem quertus was begun the dialogue was expanded by hymns the officium pastorum was known in england by the twelfth century a third drama belonging to the epiphany was the stella or tres regis chambers says that the kernel of the whole performance is a dramatized offertorium it was a custom for christian kings to offer gold and frankincense and myrrh at the altar on epiphany day and i take the play to have served as a substitute for this ceremony where no king actually regnant was present in the stella three kings entered the door of the choir singing a prosella they showed their gifts behind the star and advanced to the altar a boy announced the birth of christ and they retired singing to the sacristy dramatic advance was made when the visit to jerusalem was enacted instead of being sung in the nevers version herod himself appeared in the leon version the massacre of the innocents and the lamentations of rachel were developed at freisig and fleury further additions were made in the flight into egypt and the deposing of herod while the pastora stella and rachel coalesced into one the textual development of the stella was similar to that of the quem quertus the most important play of all was the christmas play of the prophetess requiring more performers than any of the previous plays being more epical in its composition and originating not in a chant but in a lectio read for a christmas lesson the pseudo augustinian sermo contra eudeus paganus et arianus de Sembolo, probably of the sixth century and ascribed to the bishop of hippo this sermon was highly rhetorical and its dramatic form led perhaps to its distribution between several voices in an eleventh century version of limoges it is in dramatic dialogue the rouen version adds many prophets which led to the introduction of the story of balaam and of shadrach meshach and abednego the prophetia was probably acted at christmas though the day differed in different places it will be seen that the liturgical drama properly already covered a considerable portion of the scriptural story and that though the influence of the secular stage and the feast of fools seems to be shown in later versions the ecclesiastical drama was a spontaneous growth within the church itself centering round easter and christmas it seems natural to suppose that with these excellent models before them desirous to teach the people and cognizant of their love of shows the clerics would tend to extend the drama beyond the subjects already treated and this is what appears to have happened the early plays of which we have record seem to have been composed through the influence of the liturgical drama early as the records of mysteries as plays founded on biblical story were termed go back we have no record of them in england before the conquest about the year eleven ten a certain norman geoffrey was brought over to conduct the abbey school of st albans at first however he settled at dunstable where according to matthew paris he composed the miracle play of st catherine and borrowed copes for apparelling his players probably choristers from the sacristy of st albans the play is lost a fire broke out the night after its representation and the borrowed copes were burnt geoffrey doubtless wrote in his orthodox latin though snatches of norman french may have been interspersed as in the latter productions of hilarius this hilarius a scolaris begans who was possibly an englishman and who was a pupil of abelard has left us three plays of the early part of the twelfth century one on st nicholas and another on the sustatio lazarus 
both in latin with french stanzas and a third on daniel all in latin composed in collaboration with two other writers in this transition time other plays the sponsus of limoges and the german play of the anointing of the feet of christ contain refrains in the vernacular the introduction of such refrains as these was probably the beginning of the composition of whole plays in the popular speech such plays however must long have remained in clerical hands even in the arrangement of the actors and longer still in the composition of the text as early as eleven eighty or thereabout fitzstephen tells us that religious plays were common in london speaking of rome and london and comparing them he says for theatrical shows for scenic plays london has more holy spectacles representations of the miracles performed by the sacred confessors or of the sufferings through which is declared the constancy of the martyrs it is hardly possible that these plays could have been written in anything but the anglo-norman tongue mysteries as we have seen were first of all acted inside the body of the church the evolution of such plays was complete by the middle of the thirteenth century a period of transition had set in by then in which the liturgical drama though still occupied with sacred subjects was coming under secular influences and becoming more human in its appeal this secularization as it is called was due greatly to the prosperity of the guilds participation of laymen in the plays and the shifting of the stage from the church itself to the green the guild hall and the market-place the process of linking up the plays associated with christmas and easter had set in the beginning of this movement was the growth or budding out of the plays themselves so as to take in associated parts of the scriptural story in this transitional period the christmas play came to be an extended version of the prophetia reaching back to the drama of the fall and at the end absorbing the stella the coalescence of the prophetia and the stella was a great step towards the cyclic drama of the future it linked up prophecy and fulfilment it showed the divine guidance in scriptural history the fall the promise of redemption and the beginning of its accomplishment the transitional norman french ordo representationis ado of the twelfth or thirteenth century is an extension of the prophets of beginning with the fall proceeding with cain and abel and breaking off abruptly after nebuchadnezzar the accretions to the even more important easter cycle are just as remarkable after the resurrection which began in the quemqueritus was shown the famous harrowing of hell though the liturgical drama proper cannot be said to have represented the passion it approached the subject in the dialogue to planctus maria and side by side with the quemqueritus there seems to have grown a passion play which from having greater importance finally absorbed it the benedict baron manuscript does however treat of the passion its series beginning with the call of peter and andrew and ending with the begging of the body by joseph of arimathea the genesis of this succession is shown in the planctus maria the extension of the cycle to doomsday was not a difficult matter already those parts of the sponsus wise and foolish virgins and the antichrist play which dealt with the final days were available in the christmas and easter cycles then was contained the framework of the complete scriptural drama beginning at creation and ending at the last judgment properly speaking the two cycles could no longer be separated the old and new testament stories were correlative the expulsion of adam from eden and his consignment to hell the sayings of the prophets and their similar passage to the house of darkness had their true significance in the story only when the triumphant christ broke down hell gates and released adam and the fathers so the linking up of the cycles proceeded intermediary incidents were inserted and the scriptural drama of the world's history was practically complete with this extension of the cycles the church interior became an inadequate stage and the performance left the church chambers thinks that the play had spread from the choir to the nave while the people watched from the side aisles action within the church left sometimes an influence on the arrangement of the settees or loca in the anglo-norman play of the resurrection enacted in the open air the arrangement of the thirteen settees was such as fitted the great nave of a church 
this evident reminiscence of the church interior could not have been very general or have existed very long particularly when the plays became associated with the corpus christi procession in more progressive centres where the plays lost quickly their liturgical character the removal of the drama to places outside the church must have begun early the association with the service was almost forgotten and the pious mind might well have felt outraged if the antics of demons had been acted within the sacred walls of the edifice the popularity of the institution and its progressive character tended to transfer it to a situation where it might have more scope but it is characteristic of the drama as ten brink has pointed out that its various developments proceeded while the more conservative form still went on the extension and expansion of the plays had still more important effects than the relegation of the drama to secular spots one day was too short in which to enact the whole cycle and the number of performers necessary became too great for the players to be supplied solely from the ecclesiastical bodies to meet these new difficulties the device was adopted of playing parts of the cycles on separate days or in successive years and laymen were introduced to assist the clerics the devotional guilds acted in collaboration with the clergy with whom they were affiliated but the secular guilds also participated to an increasing degree in the religious plays the introduction of vernacular into the dialogue and the gradual extinction of latin are due to the introduction of the lay element in this introduction of the common speech lay the chance of elizabethan drama for the plays ceased then to be cosmopolitan became national and could develop on national lines the miracles paved the way for renaissance drama the inclemency of the christmas weather was not favourable to the performance of plays at that time and there was a general tendency to shift the performance more towards the summer when the days are long whitsuntide became a favourite date but still more popular was corpus christi the thursday after trinity sunday when the whole population lay and clerical associated in festivities under the open sky and when the leading feature was a great procession in which the host was escorted by civic and ecclesiastical dignitaries and displayed at various stations throughout town the guilds took a prominent part in the procession and with this procession the plays became associated being performed on pageants on wheels at the stations whereat stoppage was made scaffolds apparently were often erected to enable the spectators to see the secularization of the religious drama brought new influences to bear on it and an element of comedy was early introduced in the ravings of herod and pilate and the antics of the demons who belaboured cain and dragged their victims to hell the life of the unconverted magdalen with its worldly joys and the incident of balaam's ass were dwelt on more while in the second shepherd's play of the townley collection occurs our earliest english comedy the sheep stealing of mac in the demon antics may be seen the influence of the folk drama and of the feast of fools again with its masked and black-faced demon figures condemned by the church and with these developments a section of the church became uneasy concerning the mimetic activities of its sons the decree of innocent the third subsequently included the gregarian decretals and apparently concerning only secular festivities such as the feast of fools was held by some to forbid clerics to act in churches or mummings and is so interpreted in the handling sin of robert of brune thirteen o three this means that while it would be sin for the clergy to participate in the plays on ways or greaves they might act the birth and resurrection of christ in the churches whatever solution the clergy themselves arrived at the ways and greaves performances went on in twelve forty four gross test attempted the suppression of the miracula but while the more austere dissenters continued to inveigh against the plays the church authorities themselves reluctant perhaps to permit so powerful an institution to pass from their hands continued to compromise and permit their indulgence the ordinary type of english miracle was one section of a cycle each portion of which was assigned to a separate craft guild and enacted on a pageant wheeled to stations in the city streets 
at each of which it was played this was due to association with the corpus christi procession other plays like the ludus conventria and the cornish plays were meant for a stationary stage very often the guilds were given plays appropriate to their profession noah was played in different places by the shipwrights watermen fishers and mariners the magi was played by the goldsmiths and gold beaters the flight into egypt by the horseshoers the turning of the water into wine by the mintners the temple disputation by the scriveners the last supper by the bakers and the harrowing of hell by the cooks the plays were generally conducted under the auspices of the corporation who often kept the official text settled disputes and generally supervised and who even sometimes owned the pageant properties some of the corporation functions were discharged by deputies it was generally an obligation for craftsmen to assist the plays practically either by attendance or acting and financially by the payment of pageant pence even the gentlemen assisted in places and there are evidences that the clergy at times cooperated with the guilds and that churches were repaired and the public funds assisted from the proceeds the performers were paid for their labors the poorer guilds often combined to produce one pageant and in some cases the support of the miracle play proved an intolerable burden to the poorer craftsmen the poverty or increasing wealth of individual guilds the admission of new guilds and the suppression of old had a great effect on the text of the plays none of the manuscripts possess a homogeneous text a continual process of expansion and contraction curtailing and enlarging went on the arrival of a new guild meant splitting an old play into two or the insertion of a new incident in the cycle the poverty of a guild might mean its cooperation with others in a single play or the absorption of its play by another different poets with different ideas and treatment composed and revised individual parts of the same cycle and the resultant manuscripts show every kind of contrasting metre and effect it was in the north of england besides the east midlands that the miracle drama flourished most and that through the prosperity of the guilds thence come four cycles the york plays the townley plays and the so-called ludus conventria in manuscripts of the fifteenth century and the chester plays the late sixteenth or early seventeenth but all of the plays are actually older the framework of them all is still the same old liturgical elements the prophet reaching backward to the creation and forward to the stella the officium pastorum giving the shepherd's play and the birth in the manger the planctus maria giving the passion the quem quertus giving the resurrection and the peregrini following afterwards the harrowing of hell helps to link up the first and last parts of the story the prophets with the resurrection and redemption and the last judgment follows at the end the intervening parts in the cycles are filled up sometimes with similarity between different cycles at other times with great differences by a tradition of the townley family the townley plays are said to have belonged to the abbey of widkirk near wakefield identified by professor skeet with woodkirk some of the plays are marked as acted by the wakefield guilds many leaves are lost from the manuscript and two of the plays at the end are out of their proper places the alliterated portions are thought to be interpolations in the text and five plays correspond to other older ones in the york cycle and were probably borrowed from it the language used is pointed and definite with little elaboration rustic humour and freedom occur throughout there is some horseplay and rudeness contrasted finely with perfect gentleness the characters are often drawn direct from life with simple realism and must specially have appealed to rustic people the cycle contains thirty-two plays but many are lost the most valuable text perhaps is that of york thirteen forty to fifty containing forty-eight plays the ordo paginarum drawn up by roger burton the town clerk in fourteen fifteen is printed in latin by miss smith and in a translation by pollard thirty one to five the plays adhere closely to the biblical text and there is little borrowing from apocryphal sources the prosperity and number of the guilds is reflected in the expansion of the creation and fall into six plays and the incidents connected with the birth of christ into a greater number the greater refinement of the city is shown in the composition 
there is more moderation and less rough caricature and though some plays show less pathos than those in the townley manuscript the passion itself is well handled in that respect there is less contrast but some fine character drawing is to be found based on observation and while the authors felt less free in writing for their more cultured audiences the plays show fewer evidences of old forms richard the second witnessed the corpus christi plays at york in thirteen ninety seven the chester plays exist in five manuscripts said to be probably based on a text of the fifteenth century and referred to the middle of the fourteenth for their origin there are twenty-four plays in the cycle distinguished by their drier didactical tone their insertion of apocryphal themes and greater seriousness the composition is throughout more harmonious and uniform than in any other cycle the verse being in regular eight-line stanzas with few exceptions and difficulty having been experienced with the rhymes a movement which afterwards led to the evolution of a new genre is to be seen in the evident desire to expound rather than portray the biblical narrative and in consequence the eschatological scenes are more elaborated allegory is introduced the york and townley cycles have influenced the composition of the plays from chester miracle plays spread to dublin unlike the preceding corpus christi cycles the chester plays were acted at whitsuntide the ludus conventria collection is contained in a cotton manuscript of the fifteenth century in the british museum it is improbable that the plays are correctly identified with the coventry cycle of the grey friars they are evidently composed for itinerant actors not for settled monks and the dialect is rather northeast midland than warwick the collection is irregular and evidently drawn up from different sources the didactic tendencies noted in the chester plays are carried further in the text are evidences of the lyrical style of chaucer's school apocryphal and legendary sources are even more drawn upon and allegory is still more introduced the general tone is exceedingly serious and true humour is rare the antics of the devil play a larger part in these plays than in any earlier ones the cornish plays were acted in the local dialect in the fourteenth century and continued till a comparatively late date in the circular rounds which may still be distinguished the plays extend to the ascension and include the creation resurrection and passion they contain an elaborate treatment of the history of the holy rood they were cycles at new romney norwich and beverley and many other cities throughout england even the small villages had their plays sometimes isolated parts of a cycle the greatest activity and interest in these dramas seem to have been evinced on all sides till the puritan prejudice arose which caused their end the roman church accommodated itself to the plays the early dissenters opposed them and the extreme protestants inheriting their traditions sought to suppress the dramas the york cycle was deprived of the pageants of the coronation of the virgin etc in fifteen forty eight it was amended in fifteen sixty eight and played on whit tuesday in fifteen sixty nine in fifteen seventy two the paternoster play was revised and played in fifteen seventy nine the text was handed to the archbishop and dean for further revision and was impounded at chester the mayors in fifteen seventy two and fifteen seventy five were arraigned before the privy council for permitting plays though with a revised text in sixteen hundred the mayor refused permission for the performance the coventry cycle was stopped in fifteen eighty and by the end of the sixteenth century all the great cycles had ended though plays still went on in extreme parts of the country in cornwall and at kendal plays by then had generally degenerated comedy and rant had developed professional assistance was lent by the minstrels who accompanied the songs and the metrical announcement dances and rough play had come more into use by the fifteenth century new literary forms began to influence the miracle and the type of the morality arose of which the object was not to portray the scriptural text but to expound it the object of the moralities was ethical persuasion to show virtue in her own shape how lovely and the soul of man as the battleground of contending influences the psychomachia of prudentius with its battle in the human soul of personified virtues and vices had already established a model 
and the influence on the drama of the conventional literary mode of allegory was a certain development for such morality themes as the inevitable coming of death and the reconciliation of the heavenly virtues sources already existed in the famed medieval dance of death and the scriptural text psalm eighty five neither of these however was eminently fitted for dramatization other literary modes were much more suitable for their treatment and finally they became generally subordinate to a third and naturally more dramatic theme that of the conflict of vices and virtues properly speaking however four main plots can be distinguished in the earlier moralities or moral plays and these as enumerated by ramsay are a the debate of the heavenly graces b the coming of death c the conflict of vices and virtues and d the debate of the soul and the body of the last a long-established and favourite english motif no exemplar remains of these plots a occurs only twice each time in combination in coventry eleven with a miracle theme and in the castle of perseverance with two other morality plots the second b occurs four times three times in combination and once alone in every man the third c enters twice into combination and provides alone the plot of seven moral plays the earlier moral plays however before fourteen fifty with the sternness of their ethical purpose selected mainly forms a b and d themes which lent themselves to more sombre or didactic treatment after that date the more dramatic plot c is adopted and used in seven out of eight plays though the conflict of vices and virtues was evidently founded on the psychomachia of prudentius the former superseded the latter in one important particular the allegorical figures of prudentius vices and virtues have for the end of their combat simply the supremacy of one over another in the morality plot the central figure of humanity is introduced and it is for him that the figures war and in their relations with him the plot is carried on the introduction of humanity gives some backbone and purpose to the play but it could not have been introduced all at once and one naturally looks for a transitional form this dr ramsay detects in the lost paternoster plays such a play we learn from an often quoted description was played at york once on a time a play setting forth the goodness of the lord's prayer was played in the city of york in which play all manner of vices and sins were held up to scorn and the virtues were held up to praise more valuable is the account given by leech in the furnival miscellany from the beverly minute book fourteen sixty nine the first pageant here was that of vicious and the following seven those of the deadly sins the last seven pageants are just says ramsay what would arise from an attempt to stage the psychomachia where the roses used as weapons by luxuria correspond to those used by charity and patience in the castle of perseverance and where the important pageant of vicious may be identified with humanity the additional element in the moralities in this way the beverly paternoster play may be taken to be intermediate between the weak episodic form of prudentius and the dramatic form of the moralities that fusion had taken place seems to be shown in the early castle of perseverance where the elements of humanity and the vices and virtues are not combined so organically as in the later mankind while hicks corner later still shows traces of the original form lacking the central figure the lift that the application of the conflict plot gave to dramatic composition was immense for conflict is the very stuff of which drama is made and while combatants striving for certain ends necessarily gain individuality the plot of the action naturally improves in construction the power of the drama could be considerably increased moreover by combinations of the different plots enumerated above the system lent itself too to the introduction of contemporary figures identified mostly with prevailing vices in wisdom a shrewd boy is introduced with six false jurors under allegorical names three gallants and three matrons and there are minstrels some connection however slight with contemporary affairs is generally maintained in the allegories 
new guys and nowadays have their special significance to the fifteenth century spectators of mankind once conflict had taken hold of the drama it never again left it and has been its essence ever since the conflict plot was capable of many variations and combinations four forms of it are distinguished in its first and simplest form paternoster it represented vices and virtues in single combat in its second hicks corner the conflict was doubled the vices being victorious in the first half and expressing their exultation before their defeat in the second thus in hicks corner occur the four stages one exposition two first conflict three triumph of evil four second conflict with the triumph of good these stages expressed in the third form where the plot is doubled in relation to the hero are one humanity's innocence two his temptation three life in sin four repentance the fourth form again doubles the plot adding to the above five temptation six life in sin seven repentance the third form of plot occurs in wisdom mankind and mary magdalene the fourth in the castle of perseverance with other plots in nature and the four elements mundus et infans is a modification of it in english compositions the coming of death plot was never used alone the dutch everyman shows us the end of a repentant sinner who is undramatically aware of death's approach and able to prepare for it the english plays super add a second plot in the pride of life the debate of the soul and the body and in the castle of perseverance the debate of the heavenly graces in order to preserve the dramatic ending and save the hero the manner in which these various plots are combined different stages in each of them being in correspondence and therefore coalescing easily is capable of being expressed progressively but strangely enough one of the most complex plots is that of the earliest play the castle of perseverance the earlier moral plays still use the popular rhythm of the old mysteries but differentiation of emotions by means of contrasted lines was impossible when differences of lines were through looseness in composition so difficult to distinguish it became therefore usual to reinforce these by differences of rhyme scheme but in pride of life death of herod castle of perseverance and possibly in certain passages of mundus distinction of line was used light lines indicating ordinary passages and heavy lines marking dignity and formality six main rhyme schemes occur in the earlier moral plays the castle of perseverance consists mostly of thirteen line stanzas with nine line variations and the first examples of the tail rhyme stanza the thirteen liner occurs in the death of herod and the nine line form with other irregular stanzas and mundus the alternate quatrain of the pride of life appears in the virtue scene of mankind and in other plays and its double the octave in the debate of the graces coventry eleven the tail rhyme stanza became the chosen metre of the vice scenes while quatrain octave or rhyme royal first introduced in nature fourteen eighty six to fifteen hundred were used for the virtue scenes in this metrical development dr ramsay detects two elements of progress for refinement and simplification there was a tendency to abandon the rude technique of the miracle and conform to recognized models and still more important the tendency towards rejection of ponderous stanza forms for metres which lent themselves more to dialogue and towards escaping from the hindrance of rhyme about the middle of the fifteenth century a profound change commenced to take place in the character of the moral play as the transition from the early liturgical play to the miracle had been effected by the new conditions in which it was placed so the transition from the moral play to the interlude depended upon changes outside of it difference in the audience and the stage the first moral plays were constructed on the principle of the decaying miracles comparatively speaking unlimited time and any number of performers were at the writer's disposal but as the composition of the plays passed from the hands of clerics to those of courtly and secular poets as the stage was removed from ways and greaves to the great hall of bishop and king and as the presentation passed into the hands of a small body of actors who worked for money 
a process of compression and secularization set in the castle of perseverance itself was already performed by itinerant actors but the stage stood in the open air the company possessed their own stage property for their play they used five scaffolds situated round a circular ditch or rope on stakes in the middle of which stood a castle sufficiently low for the spectators to see the scaffolds which might be on the opposite side of it from them fortunately the actual picture of the stage is preserved in the manuscript we may note in passing that the essential element of fire used in the miracles in connection with hell is represented in this case by the pipes of gunpowder which belial is to have in his hands and ears pollard describes mankind as performed before an in-yard audience macro plays twenty two it was certainly acted in the open usually before a house and for money nowadays when the devil tidivillis clamors for admittance informs the expectant audience that unless they contribute red royals they may not see his abominable presence and new guise goes first to essay at the good man of this house these tendencies towards secularization and compression resulted in what is known as the interlude various explanations of the name have been suggested to some it was meant to signify a play between parts of a banquet chambers thinks it signified a play between two or more performers in any case its nature is clear born in the days when the new light of humanism was spreading over europe and when the vogue of allegory was falling into decay it departed more and more from its parent the morality the invention of printing liberated the minstrel class to participate in dramatic composition and performance and the new drama inherited the minstrel legacy of farce its inheritance from the morality was abstractions but already in the morality itself as we noted above the development of social satire had originated the tendency towards individual types which the interlude coming under new dramatic influences was to accomplish the first morality with an intentionally secular aim was that of magnificence circa fifteen sixteen it was the first play moreover whose author john skelton was a man of letters skelton employed the drama as a vehicle for attack and satire his hero typified henry the eighth and his play was concerned with wolsey and the courtiers who surrounded the king with one party of whom skelton identified himself magnificence stands midway between the old order and the new it is as dr ramsay says a curious blending of originality and conservatism on every side plot and cast character drawing treatment of the vice and handling of the meter the following list of moral plays and interludes is from a list in dr ramsay's magnificence page one hundred and twenty nine and from other particulars supplied therein date fourteen hundred to forty fourteen seventy to ninety play castle of perseverance mary magdalen three estates part one part two length about thirty three hundred thirty six fifty twenty one forty four forty six twenty eight twenty two ninety seven twenty three thirty one speaking parts eighty five about fifty about forty a the cyclic stage under the influence of the miracles outdoor plays date c fourteen ten fourteen ninety five to fifteen thirty fourteen eighty six to fifteen hundred c fifteen sixteen fifteen fifteen teen to twenty play pride of life every man nature part one part two magnificence four elements length about nine hundred five o two nine twenty one twenty eight sixty fourteen thirty nine fourteen twenty one twenty five sixty seven two thousand speaking parts about twelve about twenty twenty one eighteen eight b for indoors and based on a showing the influence of new conditions and generally compromising dates b fourteen eighty eight b fourteen eighty three fifteen o nine to twelve fifteen hundred to twenty two play wisdom mankind hicks corner mundus et infans length eleven sixty eight about one thousand nine o seven ten twenty six nine seventy nine speaking parts six seven six five date fifteen twenty one to thirty three c fifteen thirty c fifteen forty play love weather four peas length fifteen thirteen twelve fifty five twelve thirty six speaking parts four ten four 
c further compression due to new conditions date c fifteen thirty three b fifteen thirty three b fifteen thirty three play partner and friar wit and folly johan johan length six forty seven thirty nine six eighty speaking parts four three three d still further compression the list divides the plays into four classes a those founded on the older miracles of great length with many actors and designed for open-air performance counting the late three estates as two the average number of lines in the class is two thousand six hundred forty three the average number of speaking parts thirty one point two five in b evidences of compression are distinguishable but the authors still basing their work on a tend to resist the development and compromise the speaking parts however drop considerably and the plays are for indoor performance in b the average of speaking parts is thirteen point one six and of lines is one thousand five hundred forty one in c the evidence of new conditions is manifest some of the plays were for travelling companies who acted in the roads etc but compression was just as necessary on that account at this stage the average of speaking parts is six and of lines is one thousand one hundred and seventy nine in d the final compressed form the full development is shown the lines have dropped from a maximum of three thousand eight hundred to a minimum of six hundred and forty the speaking parts from fifty to three the average of speaking parts in d is three point three and of lines is six hundred and eighty six the average of speaking parts have therefore dropped from thirty one point two five in a to three point three in d and of lines from two thousand six hundred and forty three in a to six hundred and eighty six in d dr ramsay actually divides the compression of characters into three stages one comprising the first five plays in the list which show no restriction in the number of actors available two comprising the next seven where the devices of doubling rolls and using mutes is employed and three hayward's plays where the new type did not necessitate such shifts these divisions are marked by dotted lines brandall had already detected the doubling of rolls device in nature and pollard in mankind when ramsay worked out the remaining plays of group two he thus tabulates his results wisdom speaking number of characters six actors men four boys one wisdom silent number of characters twenty nine men none boys six mankind number of characters seven actors men three boys three nature number of characters twenty one men five boys one hicks corner number of characters six men four boys none mundus number of characters five men two boys none magnificence number of characters eighteen men four boys one four elements number of characters eight men four boys one this doubling of roles was an essential thing where the actors were limited in number but it was an awkward device used to avoid the restrictions of a development which was inevitable and as the length of the plays diminished through new conditions and the number of speaking parts accordingly decreased the necessity for it disappeared entirely in haywood's interludes the number of actors equaled that of the speaking parts it was not in the moral plays as ten brink observes but in the later interludes that the dramatist won freedom in haywood's four peas and pardoner and friar all the characters were familiar figures to the sixteenth century people and here at last the old allegorical forms and the set plots of the moralities have passed away meanwhile the great renaissance movement had formulated itself in italy and was spreading over europe quest was instituted in all likely places from rome to constantinople and the long-buried stories of pagan literature were unearthed in manuscripts of all kinds the lectures of such masters as manuel chrysoloras philelpho and politian had inspired all men with an invincible enthusiasm for humanism 
classical plays were acted and classical models aristophanes sophocles and euripides besides seneca terence and plautus were available for the new playwrights about thirteen fourteen misato composed the first senecan tragedy of serenus and the enthusiasm with which his production was received awoke the emulation of others for whom the senecan type became the model before thirteen thirty one petrarch a leading spirit in the revival composed the first renaissance comedy the philologia which was suppressed plays continued to be composed on the model of terence until there arose the school of pseudo-classical comedy which found a great echo in germany and exercised great influence in france the classical revival had its first tangible recognition in england in colleges and schools wolsey himself encouraged it in a way the menechmi and fornia were acted in his house by the boys of st paul's in fifteen twenty seven and fifteen twenty eight john whitwise master of st paul's in those days was himself the writer of a latin play on dido the translation of the classics particularly of seneca had proceeded apace in england and it was possible for the vernacular interludes to come under the classical influence the first of the pseudo-classical comedies was udall's ralph royster doister an adaptation of the miles gloriosus of plautus written about fifteen fifty one and performed in fifteen fifty three the beginning of french comedy in the eugene of jodel in fifteen fifty two is thus practically coincident with what may be regarded as the inception of shakespearean comedy gamma girton's needle ascribed to w stevenson and to still was performed at christ college cambridge and is closer to mediaeval farce than ralph royster doister the earliest of the senecan tragedies in england is sackville's gorboduc or ferrix and porrix fifteen sixty one the senecan model was adopted by other poets after sackville but it was from the first distasteful to the romantic taste of englishmen who were being educated to look to the drama for lyrical beauty and romance and though the academic debates characteristic of early senecan plays were discarded when the later tragedy of blood school arose the type was superseded and merely lingered on in a few examples like titus andronicus the early dramatists who preceded shakespeare kidd peel and marlowe were for a time dominated by the senecan type but it was practically discarded after the closing of the theatres through the plague in fifteen eighty six by this time the more romantic type had set in which paved the way for shakespeare this chapter has already taken up too much room and fuller discussion is impossible i would refer all readers to e k chambers mediaeval stage two volumes nineteen o three to carl mancius's history of theatrical art volume three shakespearean period trans louise von kossel nineteen o four to the editions of the miracle plays and moralities prepared for the early english text society and particularly to Ramsay Skelton's Magnificence, 1908, to Ten Brinks, English Literature, Two Volumes, Trans, W. Clark Robinson, 1893, to Pollard's English Miracle Plays, etc., 1898, and to Edmund Gosse's Modern English Literature, 1905. End of chapter 12. End of Shakespeare, Life and Work by F. J. Furnival and John Monroe.